The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins Read by Richard Dawkins and Lala Ward In Memoriam, Douglas Adams, 1952-2001 to Isn't it enough to see that a garden is beautiful, without having to believe that there are fairies at the bottom of it, too? Preface as a child, my wife hated her school and wished she could leave. Years later, when she was in her twenties, she disclosed this unhappy fact to her parents, and her mother was aghast. But darling, why didn't you come to us and tell us? Lala's reply is my text for today. But I didn't know I could. I didn't know I could. I suspect, well, I'm sure, that there are lots of people out there who have been brought up in some religion or other, are unhappy in it, don't believe it, or are worried about the evils that are done in its name. People who feel vague yearnings to leave their parents' religion and wish they could, but just don't realize that leaving is an option. If you are one of them, this book is for you. It is intended to raise consciousness, raise consciousness to the fact that to be an atheist is a realistic aspiration, and a brave and splendid one. You can be an atheist who is happy, balanced, moral, and intellectually fulfilled. That is the first of my consciousness-raising messages. I also want to raise consciousness in three other ways, which I'll come on to. In January 2006, I presented a two-part television documentary on British television, Channel 4, called Root of All Evil. From the start, I didn't like the title. Religion is not the root of all evil for no one thing is the root of all anything. But I was delighted with the advertisement that Channel 4 put in the national newspapers. It was a picture of the Manhattan skyline with the caption, Imagine a world without religion. What was the connection? The twin towers of the World Trade Center were conspicuously present. Imagine with John Lennon a world with no religion. Imagine no suicide bombers, no 9-11, no 7-7, no crusades, no witch hunts, no gunpowder plot, no Indian partition, no Israeli-Palestinian wars, no Serb-Croat-Muslim massacres, no persecution of Jews as Christ killers, no Northern Ireland troubles, no honor killings, no shiny-suited, bouffant-haired televangelists fleecing gullible people of their money. God wants you to give till it hurts. Imagine no Taliban to blow up ancient statues, no public beheadings of blasphemers, no flogging of female skin for the crime of showing an inch of it. Incidentally, my colleague Desmond Morris informs me that John Lennon's magnificent song is sometimes performed in America with the phrase, and no religion too expurgated. One version even has the effrontery to change it to, and one religion too. Perhaps you feel that agnosticism is a reasonable position, but that atheism is just as dogmatic as religious belief. If so, I hope Chapter 2 will change your mind by persuading you that the God hypothesis is a scientific hypothesis about the universe, which should be analyzed as skeptically as any other. Perhaps you have been taught that philosophers and theologians have put forward good reasons to believe in God. If you think that, you might enjoy Chapter 3 on arguments for God's existence. The arguments turn out to be spectacularly weak. Maybe you think it is obvious that God must exist, for how else could the world have come into being? How else could there be life, in all its rich diversity, with every species looking uncannily as though it had been designed? If your thoughts run along those lines, I hope you will gain enlightenment from Chapter 4 on why there almost certainly is no God. Far from pointing to a designer, the illusion of design in the living world is explained with far greater economy and with devastating elegance by Darwinian natural selection. And while natural selection itself is limited to explaining the living world, it raises our consciousness to the likelihood of comparable explanatory cranes that may aid our understanding of the cosmos itself. The power of cranes such as natural selection is the second of my four consciousness raisers. Perhaps you think there must be a god or gods because anthropologists and historians report 
that believers dominate every human culture. If you find that convincing, please refer to Chapter 5 on The Roots of Religion, which explains why belief is so ubiquitous. Or do you think that religious belief is necessary in order for us to have justifiable morals? Don't we need God in order to be good? Please read chapters 6 and 7 to see why this is not so. Do you still have a soft spot for religion as a good thing for the world, even if you yourself have lost your faith? Chapter 8 will invite you to think about ways in which religion is not such a good thing for the world. If you feel trapped in the religion of your upbringing, it would be worth asking yourself how this came about. The answer is usually some form of childhood indoctrination. If you are religious at all, it is overwhelmingly probable that your religion is that of your parents. If you were born in Arkansas and you think Christianity is true and Islam false, knowing full well that you would think the opposite if you had been born in Afghanistan, you are the victim of childhood indoctrination. Mutatis mutandis if you were born in Afghanistan. The whole matter of religion and childhood is the subject of Chapter 9, which also includes my third consciousness raiser. Just as feminists wince when they hear he rather than he or she, or man rather than human, I want everybody to flinch whenever they hear a phrase such as Catholic child or Muslim child. Speak of a child of Catholic parents if you like, but if you hear anybody speak of a Catholic child, stop them and politely point out that children are too young to know where they stand on such issues just as they're too young to know where they stand on economics or politics. Precisely because my purpose is consciousness raising, I shall not apologize for mentioning it here in the preface as well as in Chapter 9. You can't say it too often. I'll say it again. That is not a Muslim child, but a child of Muslim parents. That child is too young to know whether it is a Muslim or not. There is no such thing as a Muslim child. There is no such thing as a Christian child. Chapters 1 and 10 top and tail the book by explaining, in their different ways, how a proper understanding of the magnificence of the real world, while never becoming a religion, can fill the inspirational role that religion has historically and inadequately usurped. The fourth consciousness raiser is atheist pride. Being an atheist is nothing to be apologetic about. On the contrary, it is something to be proud of, standing tall, to face the far horizon, for atheism nearly always indicates a healthy independence of mind, and indeed a healthy mind. There are many people who know in their heart of hearts that they are atheists, but dare not admit it to their families or even in some cases to themselves. Partly this is because the very word atheist has been assiduously built up as a terrible and frightening label. Chapter 9 quotes the comedian Julia Sweeney's tragicomic story of her parents' discovery, through reading a newspaper, that she had become an atheist. Not believing in God, they could just about take. But an atheist? An atheist? The mother's voice rose to a scream. I need to say something to American readers in particular at this point, for the religiosity of today's America is something truly remarkable. The lawyer, Wendy Kaminer, was exaggerating only slightly when she remarked that making fun of religion is as risky as burning a flag in an American Legion hall. The status of atheists in America today is on a par with that of homosexuals 50 years ago. Now, after the gay pride movement, it is possible, though still not very easy, for a homosexual to be elected to public office. A Gallup poll taken in 1999 asked Americans whether they would vote for an otherwise well-qualified person who was a woman, 95% would, Roman Catholic, 94% would, Jew, 92%, Black, 92%, Mormon, 79%, Homosexual, 79%, or Atheist, 49%. Clearly, we have a long way to go. But Atheists are a lot more numerous, especially among the educated elite, than many realize. This was so even in the 19th century when John Stuart Mill was already able to say, The world would be astonished if it knew how great a proportion of its brightest ornaments, of those most distinguished even in popular estimation for wisdom and virtue, are complete sceptics in religion. 
This must be even truer today, and indeed I present evidence for it in chapter 3. The reason so many people don't notice atheists is that many of us are reluctant to come out. My dream is that this book may help people to come out. Exactly as in the case of the gay movement, the more people come out, the easier it will be for others to join them. There may be a critical mass for the initiation of a chain reaction. American polls suggest that atheists and agnostics far outnumber religious Jews and even outnumber most other particular religious groups. Unlike Jews, however, who are notoriously one of the most effective political lobbies in the United States, and unlike evangelical Christians, who wield even greater political power, atheists and agnostics are not organized and therefore exert almost zero influence. Indeed, organizing atheists has been compared to herding cats because they tend to think independently and will not conform to authority. But a good first step would be to build up a critical mass of those willing to come out, thereby encouraging others to do so. Even if they can't be herded, cats in sufficient numbers can make a lot of noise, and they cannot be ignored. The word delusion in my title has disquieted some psychiatrists who regard it as a technical term not to be banded about. Three of them wrote to me to propose a special technical term for religious delusion, relusion. Maybe it'll catch on, but for now I'm going to stick with delusion, and I need to justify my use of it. The Penguin English Dictionary defines a delusion as a false belief or impression. Surprisingly, the illustrative quotation the dictionary gives is from Philip E. Johnson. Darwinism is the story of humanity's liberation from the delusion that its destiny is controlled by a power higher than itself. Can that be the same Philip E. Johnson who leads the creationist charge against Darwinism in America today? Indeed it is, and the quotation is, as we might expect, taken out of context. I hope the fact that I have stated as much will be noted, since the same courtesy has not been extended to me in numerous creationist quotations of my works, deliberately and misleadingly taken out of context. Whatever Johnson's own meaning, his sentence as it stands is one that I would be happy to endorse. The dictionary supplied with Microsoft Word defines a delusion as a persistent false belief held in the face of strong contradictory evidence, especially as a symptom of psychiatric disorder. The first part captures religious faith perfectly. As to whether it is a symptom of psychiatric disorder, I'm inclined to follow Robert M. Persig, author of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. When one person suffers from a delusion, it is called insanity. When many people suffer from a delusion, it is called religion. If this book works as I intend, religious readers who open it will be atheists when they put it down. What presumptuous optimism! Of course, dyed-in-the-wool faith heads are immune to argument, their resistance built up over years of childhood indoctrination using methods that took centuries to mature, whether by evolution or design. Among the more effective immunological devices is a dire warning to avoid even opening a book like this, which is surely a work of Satan. But I believe there are plenty of open-minded people out there, people whose childhood indoctrination was not too insidious, or for other reasons didn't take, or whose native intelligence is strong enough to overcome it. Such free spirits should need only a little encouragement to break free of the vice of religion altogether. At very least, I hope that nobody who reads this book will be able to say, I didn't know I could. Chapter 1 A Deeply Religious Non-Believer I don't try to imagine a personal God. It suffices to stand in awe at the structure of the world insofar as it allows our inadequate senses to appreciate it. Albert Einstein Deserved Respect The boy lay prone in the grass, his chin resting on his hands. He suddenly found himself overwhelmed by a heightened awareness of the tangled stems and roots, a forest in microcosm, a transfigured world of ants and beetles and even though he wouldn't have known the details at the time, of soil bacteria by the billions, silently and invisibly shoring up the economy of the micro-world. 
Suddenly the microforest of the turf seemed to swell and become one with the universe and with the rapt mind of the boy contemplating it. He interpreted the experience in religious terms, and it led him eventually to the priesthood. He was ordained an Anglican priest and became a chaplain at my school, a teacher of whom I was fond. It is thanks to decent liberal clergymen like him that nobody could ever claim that I had religion forced down my throat. Our sport during lessons was to sidetrack him away from Scripture and towards stirring tales of fighter command and the few. He had done war service in the RAF, and it was with familiarity and something of the affection that I still retain for the Church of England, at least by comparison with the competition, that I later read John Betjeman's poem. Our padre is an old sky pilot. Severely now they've clipped his wings, but still the flagstaff in the rectory garden points to higher things. In another time and place, that boy could have been me under the stars, dazzled by Orion, Cassiopeia and Ursa Major, tearful with the unheard music of the Milky Way, heady with the night scents of Frangipani and trumpet flowers in an African garden. Why the same emotion should have led my chaplain in one direction and me in the other is not an easy question to answer. A quasi-mystical response to nature and the universe is common among scientists and rationalists. It has no connection with supernatural belief. In his boyhood, at least, my chaplain was presumably not aware, nor was I, of the closing lines of the origin of species, the famous entangled bank passage. With birds singing on the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth. Had he been, he would certainly have identified with it, and, instead of the priesthood, might have been led to Darwin's view that all was produced by laws acting around us. Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows. There is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers, having been originally breathed into a few forms, or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. Carl Sagan in Pale Blue Dot wrote, How is it that hardly any major religion has looked at science and concluded, This is better than we thought. The universe is much bigger than our prophets said, grander, more subtle, more elegant. Instead, they say, no, 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 my God is a little God, and I want him to stay that way. A religion, old or new, that stressed the magnificence of the universe as revealed by modern science, might be able to draw forth reserves of reverence and awe hardly tapped by the conventional faiths. All Sagan's books touch the nerve endings of transcendent wonder that religion monopolized in past centuries. My own books have the same aspiration. Consequently, I hear myself often described as a deeply religious man. An American student wrote to me that she had asked her professor whether he had a view about me. Sure, he replied. He's positive. Science is incompatible with religion, but he waxes ecstatic about nature and the universe. To me, that is religion. But is religion the right word? I don't think so. The Nobel Prize winning physicist and atheist Steven Weinberg made the point as well as anybody in Dreams of a Final Theory. Some people have views of God that are so broad and flexible that it is inevitable that they will find God wherever they look for him. One hears it said that God is the ultimate or God is our better nature or God is the universe. Of course, like any other word, the word God can be given any meaning we like. If you want to say that God is energy, then you can find God in a lump of coal. Weinberg is surely right that if the word God is not to become completely useless, it should be used in the way people have generally understood it, to denote a supernatural creator that is appropriate for us to worship. Much unfortunate confusion is caused by failure to distinguish what can be called Einsteinian religion from supernatural religion. Einstein sometimes invoked the name of God, and he's not the only atheistic scientist to do so, 
inviting misunderstanding by supernaturalists eager to misunderstand and claim so illustrious a thinker as their own. The dramatic, or was it mischievous, ending of Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time, for then we should know the mind of God, is notoriously misconstrued. It has led people to believe, mistakenly of course, that Hawking is a religious man. The cell biologist Ursula Goodenough in The Sacred Depths of Nature sounds more religious than Hawking or Einstein. She loves churches, mosques and temples, and numerous passages in her book fairly beg to be taken out of context and used as ammunition for supernatural religion. She goes so far as to call herself a religious naturalist. Yet a careful reading of her book shows that she's really as staunch an atheist as I am. Naturalist is an ambiguous word. For me, it conjures my childhood hero, Hugh Lofting's Dr. Doolittle, who, by the way, had more than a touch of the philosopher-naturalist of HMS Beagle about him. In the 18th and 19th centuries, naturalist meant what it still means for most of us today, a student of the natural world. Naturalists in this sense, from Gilbert White on, have often been clergymen. Darwin himself was destined for the church as a young man, hoping that the leisurely life of a country parson would enable him to pursue his passion for beetles. But philosophers use naturalist in a very different sense, as the opposite of supernaturalist. Julian Baggini explains in Atheism, a very short introduction, the meaning of an atheist's commitment to naturalism. What most atheists do believe is that although there is only one kind of stuff in the universe, and it is physical, out of this stuff come minds, beauty, emotions, moral values, in short, the full gamut of phenomena that gives richness to human life. Human thoughts and emotions emerge from exceedingly complex interconnections of physical entities within the brain. An atheist in this sense of philosophical naturalist is somebody who believes that there is nothing beyond the natural physical world, no supernatural creative intelligence lurking behind the observable universe, no soul that outlasts the body, and no miracles, except in the sense of natural phenomena that we don't yet understand. If there is something that appears to lie beyond the natural world, as it is now imperfectly understood, we hope eventually to understand it, and embrace it within the natural. As ever, when we unweave a rainbow, it will not become less wonderful. Great scientists of our time who sound religious usually turn out not to be so when you examine their beliefs more deeply. This is certainly true of Einstein and Hawking. The present astronomer royal and president of the Royal Society, Martin Rees, told me that he goes to church as an unbelieving Anglican, out of loyalty to the tribe. He has no theistic beliefs, but shares the poetic naturalism that the cosmos provokes in the other scientists I've mentioned. In the course of a recently televised conversation, I challenged my friend, the obstetrician Robert Winston, a respected pillar of British Jewry, to admit that his Judaism was of exactly this character, and that he didn't really believe in anything supernatural. He came close to admitting it, but shied at the last fence. To be fair, he was supposed to be interviewing me, not the other way around. When I pressed him, he said he found that Judaism provided a good discipline to help him structure his life and lead a good one. Perhaps it does, but that, of course, has not the smallest bearing on the truth value of any of its supernatural claims. There are many intellectual atheists who proudly call themselves Jews and observe Jewish rites, perhaps out of loyalty to an ancient tradition or to murdered relatives, but also because of a confused and confusing willingness to label as religion the pantheistic reverence which many of us share with its most distinguished exponent, Albert Einstein. They may not believe, but, to borrow Dan Dennett's phrase, they believe in belief. One of Einstein's most eagerly quoted remarks is, Science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. But Einstein also said, It was, of course, a lie what you read about my religious convictions. A lie which is being systematically repeated. I do not believe in a personal God, and I have never denied this, but have expressed it clearly. If something is in me which can be called religious, then it is the unbounded admiration for the structure of the world, so far as our science can reveal it. Does it seem that Einstein contradicted himself? 
that his words can be cherry-picked for quotes to support both sides of an argument? No. By religion, Einstein meant something entirely different from what is conventionally meant. As I continue to clarify the distinction between supernatural religion on the one hand and Einsteinian religion on the other, bear in mind that I am calling only supernatural gods delusional. Here are some more quotations from Einstein to give a flavor of Einsteinian religion. I am a deeply religious non-believer. This is a somewhat new kind of religion. I have never imputed to nature a purpose or a goal or anything that could be understood as anthropomorphic. What I see in nature is a magnificent structure that we can comprehend only very imperfectly and that must fill a thinking person with a feeling of humility. This is a genuinely religious feeling that has nothing to do with mysticism. The idea of a personal god is quite alien to me and seems even naive. In greater numbers since his death, religious apologists understand that they try to claim Einstein as one of their own. Some of his religious contemporaries saw him very differently. In 1940, Einstein wrote a famous paper justifying his statement, I do not believe in a personal God. This and similar statements provoked a storm of letters from the religiously orthodox, many of them alluding to Einstein's Jewish origins. The extracts that follow are taken from Max Jammer's book, Einstein and Religion, which is also my main source of quotations from Einstein himself on religious matters. The Roman Catholic Bishop of Kansas City said, It is sad to see a man who comes from the race of the Old Testament and its teaching deny the great tradition of that race. Other Catholic clergymen chimed in. There is no other God but a personal God. Einstein does not know what he's talking about. He's all wrong. Some men think that because they have achieved a high degree of learning in some field, they're qualified to express opinions in all. The notion that religion is a proper field in which one might claim expertise is one that should not go unquestioned. That clergyman presumably would not have deferred to the expertise of a claimed fairyologist on the exact shape and colour of fairy wings. Both he and the bishop thought that Einstein, being theologically untrained, had misunderstood the nature of God. On the contrary, Einstein understood very well exactly what he was denying. An American Roman Catholic lawyer, working on behalf of an ecumenical coalition, wrote to Einstein, We deeply regret that you made your statement in which you ridicule the idea of a personal God. In the past ten years, nothing has been so calculated to make people think that Hitler had some reason to expel the Jews from Germany as your statement. Conceding your right to free speech, I still say that your statement constitutes you as one of the greatest sources of discord in America. A New York rabbi said, Einstein is unquestionably a great scientist, but his religious views are diametrically opposed to Judaism. But, but, why not and? The president of a historical society in New Jersey wrote a letter that so damningly exposes the weakness of the religious mind, it is worth reading twice. We respect your learning, Dr. Einstein, but there is one thing you do not seem to have learned, that God is a spirit and cannot be found through the telescope or microscope, no more than human thought or emotion can be found by analysing the brain. As everyone knows, religion is based on faith not knowledge. Every thinking person, perhaps, is assailed at times with religious doubt. My own faith has wavered many a time. But I never told anyone of my spiritual aberrations for two reasons. One, I feared that I might by mere suggestion disturb and damage the life and hopes of some fellow being. Two, because I agree with the writer who said, there is a mean streak in anyone who will destroy another's faith. I hope, Dr. Einstein, that you were misquoted and that you will yet say something more pleasing to the vast number of the American people who delight to do you honour. What a devastatingly revealing letter. Every sentence drips with intellectual and moral cowardice. Less abject, but more shocking was the letter from the founder of the Calvary Tabernacle Association in Oklahoma. 
Professor Einstein, I believe that every Christian in America will answer you, We will not give up our belief in our God and His Son, Jesus Christ, but we invite you, if you do not believe in the God of the people of this nation, to go back where you came from. I have done everything in my power to be a blessing to Israel, and then you come along, and with one statement from your blasphemous tongue, do more to hurt the cause of your people than all the efforts of the Christians who love Israel can do to stamp out anti-Semitism in our land. Professor Einstein, every Christian in America will immediately reply to you, take your crazy, fallacious theory of evolution and go back to Germany where you came from, or stop trying to break down the faith of a people who gave you a welcome when you were forced to flee your native land. The one thing all his theistic critics got right was that Einstein was not one of them. He was repeatedly indignant at the suggestion that he was a theist. So was he a deist, like Voltaire and Diderot, or a pantheist, like Spinoza, whose philosophy he admired. I believe in Spinoza's God, who reveals himself in the orderly harmony of what exists, not in a God who concerns himself with fates and actions of human beings. Let's remind ourselves of the terminology. A theist believes in a supernatural intelligence who, in addition to his main work of creating the universe in the first place, is still around to oversee and influence the subsequent fate of his initial creation. In many theistic belief systems, the deity is intimately involved in human affairs. He answers prayers, forgives or punishes sins, intervenes in the world by performing miracles, frets about good and bad deeds, and knows when we do them, or even think of doing them. A deist, too, believes in a supernatural intelligence, but one whose activities were confined to setting up the laws that govern the universe in the first place. The deist god never intervenes thereafter, and certainly has no specific interest in human affairs. Pantheists don't believe in a supernatural god at all, but use the word god as a non-supernatural synonym for nature, or for the universe, or for the lawfulness that governs its workings. Deists differ from theists in that their god does not answer prayers, is not interested in sins or confessions, does not read our thoughts, and does not intervene with capricious miracles. Deists differ from pantheists in that the deist god is some kind of cosmic intelligence, rather than the pantheist's metaphoric or poetic synonym for the laws of the universe. Pantheism is sexed-up atheism. Deism is watered-down theism. There is every reason to think that famous Einsteinisms like God is subtle but he is not malicious, or he does not play dice, or did God have a choice in creating the universe, are pantheistic, not deistic, and certainly not theistic. God does not play dice should be translated as randomness does not lie at the heart of all things. Did God have a choice in creating the universe means could the universe have begun in any other way. Einstein was using God in a purely metaphorical, poetic sense. So is Stephen Hawking, and so are most of those physicists who occasionally slip into the language of religious metaphor. Paul Davies's The Mind of God seems to hover somewhere between Einsteinian pantheism and an obscure form of deism, for which he was rewarded with the Templeton Prize, a very large sum of money given annually by the Templeton Foundation usually to a scientist who is prepared to say something nice about religion. Let me sum up Einsteinian religion in one more quotation from Einstein himself. To sense that behind anything that can be experienced, there is a something that our mind cannot grasp, and whose beauty and sublimity reaches us only indirectly and as a feeble reflection. This is religiousness. In this sense, I am religious. In this sense, I, too, am religious, with the reservation that cannot grasp does not have to mean forever ungraspable. But I prefer not to call myself religious because it is misleading. It is destructively misleading because, for the vast majority of people, religion implies supernatural. Carl Sagan put it well. If by God one means the set of physical laws that govern the universe, then clearly there is such a God. This God is emotionally unsatisfying. It does not make much sense to pray to the law of gravity. Amusingly, Sagan's last point was foreshadowed 
by the Reverend Dr. Fulton J. Sheen, a professor at the Catholic University of America, as part of a fierce attack upon Einstein's 1940 disavowal of a personal God. Sheen sarcastically asked whether anyone would be prepared to lay down his life for the Milky Way. He seemed to think he was making a point against Einstein, rather than for him, for he added, There is only one fault with his cosmical religion. He put an extra letter in the word. The letter S. There is nothing comical about Einstein's beliefs. Nevertheless, I wish that physicists would refrain from using the word God in their special metaphorical sense. The metaphorical or pantheistic God of the physicists is light years away from the interventionist, miracle-reeking, thought-reading, sin-punishing, prayer-answering God of the Bible, of priests, mullahs, and rabbis, and of ordinary language. Deliberately to confuse the two is, in my opinion, an act of intellectual high treason. Undeserved Respect My title, The God Delusion, does not refer to the God of Einstein and the other enlightened scientists of the previous section. That is why I needed to get Einsteinian religion out of the way to begin with. It has a proven capacity to confuse. In the rest of this book, I am talking only about supernatural gods, of which the most familiar, to the majority of my readers, will be Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament. I shall come to him in a moment. But before leaving this preliminary chapter, I need to deal with one more matter that would otherwise bedevil the whole book. This time it is a matter of etiquette. It is possible that religious readers will be offended by what I have to say and will find in these pages insufficient respect for their own particular beliefs, if not the beliefs that others treasure. It would be a shame if such offence prevented them from reading on, so I want to sort it out here at the outset. A widespread assumption, which nearly everybody in our society accepts, the non-religious included, is that religious faith is especially vulnerable to offence and should be protected by an abnormally thick wall of respect, in a different class from the respect that any human being should pay to any other. Douglas Adams put it so well in an impromptu speech made in Cambridge shortly before his death that I never tire of sharing his words. Religion has certain ideas at the heart of it which we call sacred or holy or whatever. What it means is, here is an idea or a notion that you're not allowed to say anything bad about. You're just not. Why not? Because you're not. If somebody votes for a party that you don't agree with, you're free to argue about it as much as you like. Everybody will have an argument, but nobody feels aggrieved by it. If somebody thinks taxes should go up or down, you're free to have an argument about it. But on the other hand, if somebody says, I mustn't move a light switch on a Saturday, you say, I respect that. Why should it be that it's perfectly legitimate to support the Labour Party or the Conservative Party, Republicans or Democrats, this model of economics versus that, Macintosh instead of Windows, but to have an opinion about how the universe began, about who created the universe? No, that's holy. We are used to not challenging religious ideas, but it's very interesting how much of a furore Richard creates when he does it. Everybody gets absolutely frantic about it, because you're not allowed to say these things. Yet when you look at it rationally, there's no reason why those ideas shouldn't be as open to debate as any other, except that we have agreed somehow between us that they shouldn't be. Here's a particular example of our society's overweening respect for religion, one that really matters. By far the easiest grounds for gaining conscientious objector status in wartime are religious. You can be a brilliant moral philosopher with a prize-winning doctoral thesis expounding the evils of war and still be given a hard time by a draft board evaluating your claim to be a conscientious objector. Yet, if you can say that one or both of your parents is a Quaker, you sail through like a breeze, no matter how inarticulate and illiterate you may be on the theory of pacifism or indeed Quakerism itself. At the opposite end of the spectrum from pacifism, we have a pusillanimous reluctance to use religious names for warring factions. In Northern Ireland, Catholics and Protestants are euphemized to nationalists and loyalists, respectively. The very word religions is bowdlerized to communities, as in intercommunity warfare. Iraq, as a consequence of the Anglo-American invasion of 2003, 
degenerated into sectarian civil war between Sunni and Shia Muslims. Clearly a religious conflict. Yet in the Independent of the 20th of May 2006, the front page headline and first leading article both described it as ethnic cleansing. Ethnic in this context is yet another euphemism. What we are seeing in Iraq is religious cleansing. The original usage of ethnic cleansing in the former Yugoslavia is also arguably a euphemism for religious cleansing involving Orthodox Serbs, Catholic Croats and Muslim Bosnians. I have previously drawn attention to the privileging of religion in public discussion of ethics in the media and in government. Whenever a controversy arises over sexual or reproductive morals, you can bet that religious leaders from several different faith groups will be prominently represented on influential committees or on panel discussions on radio or television. I'm not suggesting that we should go out of our way to censor the views of these people, but why does our society beat a path to their door as though they had some expertise comparable to that of, say, a moral philosopher, a family lawyer, or a doctor. Here's another weird example of the privileging of religion. On the 21st of February, 2006, the United States Supreme Court ruled that a church in New Mexico should be exempt from the law, which everybody else has to obey, against the taking of hallucinogenic drugs. Faithful members of the Centro Espirita Beneficiente Uniayo do Vegetal believed that they can understand God only by drinking Hoasca tea, which contains the illegal hallucinogenic drug dimethyltryptamine. Note that it is sufficient that they believe that the drug enhances their understanding. They do not have to produce evidence. Conversely, there is plenty of evidence that cannabis eases the nausea and discomfort of cancer sufferers undergoing chemotherapy. Yet the Supreme Court ruled in 2005 that all patients who use cannabis for medicinal purposes are vulnerable to federal prosecution, even in the minority of states where such specialist use is legalized. Religion, as ever, is the trump card. Imagine members of an art appreciation society pleading in court that they believe they need a hallucinogenic drug in order to enhance their understanding of impressionist or surrealist paintings. Yet when a church claims an equivalent need, it is backed by the highest court in the land. Such is the power of religion as a talisman. Seventeen years ago, I was one of 36 writers and artists commissioned by the magazine New Statesman to write in support of the distinguished author Salman Rushdie, then under sentence of death for writing a novel. Incensed by the sympathy for Muslim hurt and offence expressed by Christian leaders and even some secular opinion formers, I drew the following parallel. If the advocates of apartheid had their wits about them, they would claim, for all I know truthfully, that allowing mixed races is against their religion. A good part of the opposition would respectfully tiptoe away. And it's no use claiming that this is an unfair parallel because apartheid has no rational justification. The whole point of religious faith, its strength and chief glory, is that it does not depend on rational justification. The rest of us are expected to defend our prejudices, but ask a religious person to justify their faith, and you infringe religious liberty. Little did I know that something pretty similar would come to pass in the 21st century. The Los Angeles Times, 10th of April 2006, reported that numerous Christian groups on campuses around the United States were suing their universities for enforcing anti-discrimination rules, including prohibitions against harassing or abusing homosexuals. As a typical example, in 2004, James Nixon, a 12-year-old boy in Ohio, won the right in court to wear a T-shirt to school bearing the words, Homosexuality is a sin. Islam is a lie, abortion is murder, some issues are just black and white. The school told him not to wear the t-shirt, and the boy's parents sued the school. The parents might have had a conscionable case if they based it on the First Amendment's guarantee of freedom of speech, but they didn't, indeed they couldn't, because free speech is deemed not to include hate speech. But hate only has to prove it is religious and it no longer counts as hate. So, instead of freedom of speech, the Nixon's lawyers appealed to the constitutional right to freedom of religion. 
their victorious lawsuit was supported by the Alliance Defense Fund of Arizona, whose business it is to press the legal battle for religious freedom. The Reverend Rick Scarborough, supporting the wave of similar Christian lawsuits brought to establish religion as a legal justification for discrimination against homosexuals and other groups, has named it the civil rights struggle of the 21st century. Christians are going to have to take a stand for the right to be Christian. Once again, if such people took their stand on the right to free speech, one might reluctantly sympathize, but that isn't what it's about. The legal case in favor of discrimination against homosexuals is being mounted as a countersuit against alleged religious discrimination. And the law seems to respect this. You can't get away with saying, if you try to stop me from insulting homosexuals, it violates my freedom of prejudice, but you can get away with saying, it violates my freedom of religion. What, when you think about it, is the difference? Yet again, religion trumps all. I'll end the chapter with a particular case study which tellingly illuminates society's exaggerated respect for religion over and above ordinary human respect. The case flared up in February 2006, a ludicrous episode which veered wildly between the extremes of comedy and tragedy. The previous September, the Danish newspaper Jyllands Posten published 12 cartoons depicting the prophet Muhammad. Over the next three months, Indignation was carefully and systematically nurtured throughout the Islamic world by a small group of Muslims living in Denmark, led by two imams who had been granted sanctuary there. In late 2005, these malevolent exiles traveled from Denmark to Egypt, bearing a dossier which was copied and circulated from there to the whole Islamic world, including, importantly, Indonesia. The dossier contained falsehoods about alleged maltreatment of Muslims in Denmark, and the tendentious lie that Yilans Posten was a government-run newspaper. It also contained the twelve cartoons which, crucially, the imams had supplemented with three additional images, whose origin was mysterious but which certainly had no connection with Denmark. Unlike the original twelve, these three add-ons were genuinely offensive, or would have been if they had, as the zealous propagandists alleged, depicted Muhammad. A particularly damaging one of these three was not a cartoon at all, but a faxed photograph of a bearded man wearing a fake pig's snout held on with elastic. It has subsequently turned out that this was an Associated Press photograph of a Frenchman entered for a pig squealing contest at a country fair in France. The photograph had no connection whatsoever with the Prophet Muhammad, no connection with Islam, and no connection with Denmark. But the Muslim activists on their mischief-stirring hike to Cairo, implied all three connections, with predictable results. The carefully cultivated hurt and offence was brought to an explosive head five months after the twelve cartoons were originally published. Demonstrators in Pakistan and Indonesia burned Danish flags, where did they get them from? And hysterical demands were made for the Danish government to apologise. Apologise for what? They didn't draw the cartoons or publish them. Danes just live in a country with a free press, something that people in many Islamic countries might have a hard time understanding. Newspapers in Norway, Germany, France, and even the United States, but conspicuously not Britain, reprinted the cartoons in gestures of solidarity with Jyllands Posten, which added fuel to the flames. Embassies and consulates were trashed. Danish goods were boycotted, Danish citizens, and indeed Westerners generally, were physically threatened. Christian churches in Pakistan, with no Danish or European connections at all, were burned. Nine people were killed when Libyan rioters attacked and burned the Italian consulate in Benghazi. As Germaine Greer wrote, what these people really love and do best is pandemonium. A bounty of one million dollars was placed on the head of the Danish cartoonist, by a Pakistani imam, who was apparently unaware that there were twelve different Danish cartoonists, and almost certainly unaware that the three most offensive pictures had never appeared in Denmark at all. And by the way, where was that million going to come from? In Nigeria, Muslim protesters against the Danish cartoons burned down several Christian churches and used machetes to attack and kill black Nigerian Christians in the streets. One Christian was put inside a rubber tire 
doused with petrol, and set alight. Demonstrators were photographed in Britain bearing banners saying, Slay those who insult Islam, butcher those who mock Islam, Europe you will pay, demolition is on its way, and apparently without irony, behead those who say Islam is a violent religion. In the aftermath of all this, the journalist Andrew Muller interviewed Britain's leading moderate Muslim Sir Iqbal Sakrani. Moderate he may be by today's Islamic standards, but in Andrew Muller's account he still stands by the remark he made when Salman Rushdie was condemned to death for writing a novel. Death is perhaps too easy for him. A remark that sets him in ignominious contrast to his courageous predecessor as Britain's most influential Muslim, the late Dr. Zaki Badawi, who offered Salman Rushdie sanctuary in his own home. Sakrani told Muller how concerned he was about the Danish cartoons. Muller was concerned too, but for a different reason. I am concerned that the ridiculous disproportionate reaction to some unfunny sketches in an obscure Scandinavian newspaper may confirm that Islam and the West are fundamentally irreconcilable. Sakrani, on the other hand, praised British newspapers for not reprinting the cartoons, to which Muller voiced the suspicion of most of the nation that the restraint of British newspapers derived less from sensitivity to Muslim discontent than it did from a desire not to have their windows broken. Sakrani explained that the person of the Prophet, peace be upon him, is revered so profoundly in the Muslim world with a love and affection that cannot be explained in words. It goes beyond your parents, your loved ones, your children. That is part of the faith. There is also an Islamic teaching that one does not depict the Prophet. This rather assumes, as Muller observed, that the values of Islam trump anyone else's, which is what any follower of Islam does assume, just as any follower of any religion believes that theirs is the sole way, truth, and light. If people wish to love a seventh-century preacher more than their own families, that's up to them, but nobody else is obliged to take it seriously. Except that if you don't take it seriously, and accord it proper respect, you are physically threatened on a scale that no other religion has aspired to since the Middle Ages. One can't help wondering why such violence is necessary, given that, as Muller notes, if any of you clowns are right about anything, the cartoonists are going to hell anyway. Won't that do? In the meantime, if you want to get excited about affronts to Muslims, read the Amnesty International reports on Syria and Saudi Arabia. Many people have noted the contrast between the hysterical hurt professed by Muslims and the readiness with which Arab media publish stereotypical anti-Jewish cartoons. At a demonstration in Pakistan against the Danish cartoons, a woman in a black burqa was photographed carrying a banner reading, God bless Hitler. In response to all this frenzied pandemonium, decent liberal newspapers deplored the violence and made token noises about free speech. But at the same time, they expressed respect and sympathy the deep offence and hurt that Muslims had suffered. The hurt and suffering consisted, remember, not in any person enduring violence or real pain of any kind. Nothing more than a few daubs of printing ink in a newspaper that nobody outside Denmark would ever have heard of but for a deliberate campaign of incitement to mayhem. I am not in favour of offending or hurting anyone just for the sake of it but I am intrigued and mystified by the disproportionate privileging of religion in our otherwise secular societies. All politicians must get used to disrespectful cartoons of their faces, and nobody riots in their defence. What is so special about religion that we grant it such uniquely privileged respect? As H. L. Mencken said, We must respect the other fellow's religion, but only in the sense, and to the extent, that we respect his theory that his wife is beautiful and his children smart. It is in the light of this unparalleled presumption of respect for religion that I make my own disclaimer for this book. I shall not go out of my way to offend, but nor shall I don kid gloves to handle religion any more gently than I would handle anything else. Chapter 2 The God Hypothesis the religion of one age is the literary entertainment of the next. Ralph Waldo Emerson
The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Those of us schooled from infancy in his ways can become desensitized to their horror. A naive, blessed with the perspective of innocence, has a clearer perception. Winston Churchill's son Randolph somehow contrived to remain ignorant of Scripture until Evelyn Waugh and a brother officer, in a vain attempt to keep Churchill quiet when they were posted together during the war, bet him he couldn't read the entire Bible in a fortnight. Unhappily, it has not had the result we hoped. He's never read any of it before and is hideously excited, keeps reading quotations aloud. I say, I bet you didn't know this came in the Bible, or merely slapping his side and chortling, God isn't God a shit. Thomas Jefferson, better read, was of a similar opinion. The Christian God is a being of terrific character, cruel, vindictive, capricious and unjust. It is unfair to attack such an easy target. The God hypothesis should not stand or fall with its most unlovely instantiation, Yahweh, nor his insipidly opposite Christian face, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. To be fair, this milksop persona owes more to his Victorian followers than to Jesus himself. Could anything be more mawkishly nauseating than Mrs. C.F. Alexander's Christian children all must be mild, obedient, good as he? I am not attacking the particular qualities of Yahweh, or Jesus, or Allah, or any other specific god such as Baal, Zeus, or Wotan. Instead, I shall define the god hypothesis more defensively. There exists a superhuman, supernatural intelligence who deliberately designed and created the universe and everything in it, including us. This book will advocate an alternative view. Any creative intelligence of sufficient complexity to design anything comes into existence only as the end product of an extended process of gradual evolution. Creative intelligences being evolved necessarily arrive late in the universe and therefore cannot be responsible for designing it. God, in the sense defined, is a delusion, and as later chapters will show, a pernicious delusion. Not surprisingly, since it is founded on local traditions of private revelation rather than evidence, the God hypothesis comes in many versions. Historians of religion recognize a progression from primitive tribal animisms through polytheisms such as those of the Greeks, Romans and Norsemen to monotheisms such as Judaism and its derivatives, Christianity and Islam. Polytheism It is not clear why the change from polytheism to monotheism should be assumed to be a self-evidently progressive improvement. But it widely is, an assumption that provoked Ibn Warak, author of Why I Am Not a Muslim, wittily to conjecture that monotheism is in its turn doomed to subtract one more god and become atheism. The Catholic Encyclopedia dismisses polytheism and atheism in the same insouciant breath. Formal dogmatic atheism is self-refuting and has never de facto won the reasoned assent of any considerable number of men. Nor can polytheism, however easily it may take hold of the popular imagination, ever satisfy the mind of a philosopher. Monotheistic chauvinism was until recently written into the charity law of both England and Scotland, discriminating against polytheistic religions in granting tax-exempt status, while allowing an easy ride to charities whose object was to promote monotheistic religion, sparing them the rigorous vetting quite properly required of secular charities. It was my ambition to persuade a member of Britain's respected Hindu community to come forward and bring a civil action to test this snobbish discrimination against polytheism. Far better, of course, would be to abandon the promotion of religion altogether as grounds for charitable status. The benefits of this to society would be great, especially in the United States where the sums of tax-free money sucked in by churches and polishing the heels of already well-heeled televangelists reach levels that could fairly be described as obscene. The aptly named Oral Roberts once told his television audience that God would kill him unless they gave him eight million dollars. 
almost unbelievably, it worked, tax-free. Roberts himself is still going strong, as is Oral Roberts University of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Its buildings, valued at $250 million, were directly commissioned by God himself in these words. Raise up your students to hear my voice, to go where my light is dim, where my voice is heard small, and my healing power is not known, even to the uttermost bounds of the earth. Their work will exceed yours, and in this I am well pleased. On reflection, my imagined Hindu litigator would have been as likely to play the if you can't beat them, join them card. His polytheism isn't really polytheism, but monotheism in disguise. There is only one God, Lord Brahma the creator, Lord Vishnu the preserver, Lord Shiva the destroyer, the goddesses Saraswati, Laxmi, and Parvati, wives of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, Lord Ganesh the elephant god, and hundreds of others, all are just different manifestations or incarnations of the one God. Christians should warm to such sophistry. Rivers of medieval ink, not to mention blood, have been squandered over the mystery of the Trinity, and in suppressing deviations such as the Arian heresy. Arius of Alexandria, in the 4th century AD, denied that Jesus was consubstantial, i.e. of the same substance or essence, with God. What on earth could that possibly mean, you're probably asking? Substance? What substance? What exactly do you mean by essence? Very little seems the only reasonable reply. Yet the controversy split Christendom down the middle for a century, and the Emperor Constantine ordered that all copies of Aris's book should be burned. Splitting Christendom by splitting hairs, such has ever been the way of theology. Do we have one God in three parts or three gods in one? The Catholic Encyclopedia clears up the matter for us in a masterpiece of theological close reasoning. In the unity of the Godhead, there are three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, these three persons being truly distinct one from another. Thus, in the words of the Athanasian Creed, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods, but one God. As if that were not clear enough, the encyclopedia quotes the third-century theologian, St. Gregory the Miracle Worker. There is therefore nothing created, nothing subject to another in the Trinity, nor is there anything that has been added as though it once had not existed, but had entered afterwards. Therefore the Father has never been without the Son, nor the Son without the Spirit, and this same Trinity is immutable and unalterable forever. Whatever miracles may have earned St. Gregory his nickname, they were not miracles of honest lucidity. His words convey the characteristically obscurantist flavor of theology, which, unlike science or most other branches of human scholarship, has not moved on in eighteen centuries. Thomas Jefferson, as so often, got it right when he said, Ridicule is the only weapon which can be used against unintelligible propositions. Ideas must be distinct before reason can act upon them, and no man ever had a distinct idea of the Trinity. It is the mere abracadabra of the mountebanks calling themselves the priests of Jesus. The other thing I cannot help remarking upon is the overweening confidence with which the religious assert minute details for which they neither have nor could have any evidence. Perhaps it is the very fact that there is no evidence to support theological opinions either way that fosters the characteristic draconian hostility towards those of slightly different opinion especially as it happens in this very field of Trinitarianism. Jefferson heaped ridicule on the doctrine that, as he put it, there are three gods, in his critique of Calvinism. But it is especially the Roman Catholic branch of Christianity that pushes its recurrent flirtation with polytheism towards runaway inflation. The Trinity is, are, joined by Mary, Queen of Heaven, a goddess in all but name, who surely runs God himself a close second as a target of prayers. The pantheon is further swollen by an army of saints, whose intercessory power makes them, if not demigods, well worth approaching on their own specialist subjects. The Catholic Community Forum helpfully lists 5,120 saints, together with their areas of expertise, which include abdominal pains, abuse victims, anorexia, arms dealers, blacksmiths, broken bones, bomb technicians and bowel disorders, to venture no further than the bees. 
and we mustn't forget the four choirs of angelic hosts, arrayed in nine orders, seraphim, cherubim, thrones, dominions, virtues, powers, principalities, archangels, heads of all hosts, and just plain old angels, including our closest friends, the ever-watchful guardian angels. What is impressive about Catholic mythology is partly its tasteless kitsch, but mostly the airy nonchalance with which these people make up the details as they go along. It is just shamelessly invented. Pope John Paul II created more saints than all his predecessors of the past several centuries put together, and he had a special affinity with the Virgin Mary. His polytheistic hankerings were dramatically demonstrated in 1981 when he suffered an assassination attempt in Rome and attributed his survival to intervention by Our Lady of Fatima. A maternal hand guided the bullet. One cannot help wondering why she didn't guide it to miss him altogether. Others might think the team of surgeons who operated on him for six hours deserved at least a share of the credit, but perhaps their hands, too, were maternally guided. The relevant point is that it wasn't just Our Lady, who, in the Pope's opinion, guided the bullet, but specifically Our Lady of Fatima. Presumably Our Lady of Lourdes, Our Lady of Guadeloupe, Our Lady of Medjugorje, Our Lady of Akita, Our Lady of Zaitun, Our Lady of Garabandal, and Our Lady of Nock were busy on other errands at the time. How did the Greeks, the Romans, and the Vikings cope with such polytheological conundrums? Was Venus just another name for Aphrodite, or were they two distinct goddesses of love? Was Thor with his hammer a manifestation of Wotan, or a separate god? Who cares? Life is too short to bother with the distinction between one figment of the imagination and many. Having gestured towards polytheism to cover myself against a charge of neglect, I shall say no more about it. For brevity, I shall refer to all deities, whether poly or monotheistic, as simply God. I am also conscious that the Abrahamic God is, to put it mildly, aggressively male, and this too I shall accept as a convention in my use of pronouns. More sophisticated theologians proclaim the sexlessness of God, while some feminist theologians seek to redress historic injustices by designating her female. But what, after all, is the difference between a non-existent female and a non-existent male? I suppose that in the ditzily unreal intersection of theology and feminism, existence might indeed be a less salient attribute than gender. I am aware that critics of religion can be attacked for failing to credit the fertile diversity of traditions and worldviews that have been called religious. Anthropologically informed works from Sir James Fraser's Golden Bough to Pascal Boyer's Religion Explained or Scott Atran's In Gods We Trust fascinatingly document the bizarre phenomenology of superstition and ritual. Read such books and marvel at the richness of human gullibility. But that is not the way of this book. I decry supernaturalism in all its forms, and the most effective way to proceed will be to concentrate on the form most likely to be familiar to my readers, the form that impinges most threateningly on all our societies. Most of my readers will have been reared in one or another of today's three great monotheistic religions, four if you count Mormonism, all of which trace themselves back to the mythological patriarch Abraham, and it will be convenient to keep this family of traditions in mind throughout the rest of the book. This is as good a moment as any to forestall an inevitable retort to the book, one that would otherwise, as sure as night follows day, turn up in a review. The God that Dawkins doesn't believe in is a God that I don't believe in either. I don't believe in an old man in the sky with a long white beard. That old man is an irrelevant distraction, and his beard is as tedious as it is long. Indeed, the distraction is worse than irrelevant. Its very silliness is calculated to distract attention from the fact that what the speaker really believes is not a whole lot less silly. I know you don't believe in an old bearded man sitting on a cloud, so let's not waste any more time on that. I am not attacking any particular version of God or gods. I am attacking God, all gods, anything and everything supernatural, wherever and whenever they have been or will be invented. Monotheism The great unmentionable evil at the centre of our culture is monotheism. From a barbaric Bronze Age text known as the Old Testament, Three anti-human religions have evolved, 
Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. These are sky god religions. They are literally patriarchal. God is the omnipotent father, hence the loathing of women for two thousand years in those countries afflicted by the sky god and his earthly male delegates. Gore Vidal The oldest of the three Abrahamic religions and the clear ancestor of the other two is Judaism. Originally a tribal cult of a single fiercely unpleasant god, morbidly obsessed with sexual restrictions, with the smell of charred flesh, with his own superiority over rival gods, and with the exclusiveness of his chosen desert tribe. During the Roman occupation of Palestine, Christianity was founded by Paul of Tarsus as a less ruthlessly monotheistic sect of Judaism and a less exclusive one, which looked outwards from the Jews to the rest of the world. Several centuries later, Muhammad and his followers reverted to the uncompromising monotheism of the Jewish original, but not its exclusiveness, and founded Islam upon a new holy book, the Quran, adding a powerful ideology of military conquest to spread the faith. Christianity, too, was spread by the sword, wielded first by Roman hands after the Emperor Constantine raised it from eccentric cult to official religion, then by the Crusaders, and later by the conquistadors and other European invaders and colonists with missionary accompaniment. For most of my purposes, all three Abrahamic religions can be treated as indistinguishable. Unless otherwise stated, I shall have Christianity mostly in mind, but only because it is the version with which I happen to be most familiar. For my purposes, the differences matter less than the similarities, and I shall not be concerned at all with other religions such as Buddhism or Confucianism. Indeed, there is something to be said for treating these not as religions at all, but as ethical systems or philosophies of life. The simple definition of the God hypothesis with which I began has to be substantially fleshed out if it is to accommodate the Abrahamic God. He not only created the universe, he is a personal God, dwelling within it, or perhaps outside it, whatever that might mean, possessing the unpleasantly human qualities to which I have alluded. Personal qualities, whether pleasant or unpleasant, form no part of the deist God of Voltaire and Thomas Paine. Compared with the Old Testament's psychotic delinquent, the deist God of the 18th century Enlightenment is an altogether grander being, worthy of his cosmic creation, loftily unconcerned with human affairs, sublimely aloof from our private thoughts and hopes, caring nothing for our messy sins or mumbled contritions. The deist God is a physicist to end all physics, the alpha and omega of mathematicians, the apotheosis of designers, a hyper-engineer who set up the laws and constants of the universe, fine-tuned them with exquisite precision and foreknowledge, detonated what we would now call the hot Big Bang, retired, and was never heard from again. In times of stronger faith, deists have been reviled as indistinguishable from atheists. Susan Jacobi in Free Thinkers, A History of American Secularism, lists a choice selection of the epithets hurled at poor Tom Paine. Judas, reptile, hog, mad dog, souse, louse, archbeast, brute, liar, and of course, infidel. Paine died in penury, abandoned, with the honourable exception of Jefferson, by political former friends embarrassed by his anti-Christian views. Nowadays, the ground has shifted so far that deists are more likely to be contrasted with atheists and lumped with theists. They do, after all, believe in a supreme intelligence who created the universe. Secularism, the Founding Fathers, and the Religion of America it is conventional to assume that the founding fathers of the American Republic were deists. No doubt many of them were, although it has been argued that the greatest of them might have been atheists. Certainly their writings on religion in their own time leave me in no doubt that most of them would have been atheists in ours. But whatever their individual religious views in their own time, the one thing they collectively were is secularists. And this is the topic to which I turn in this section, beginning with a perhaps surprising quotation from Senator Barry Goldwater in 1981, clearly showing how staunchly that presidential candidate and hero of American conservatism upheld the secular tradition of the Republic's foundation. There is no position on which people are so immovable as their religious beliefs. 
There is no more powerful ally one can claim in a debate than Jesus Christ or God or Allah or whatever one calls this supreme being. But like any powerful weapon, the use of God's name on one's behalf should be used sparingly. The religious factions that are growing throughout our land are not using their religious clout with wisdom. They are trying to force government leaders into following their position 100%. If you disagree with these religious groups on a particular moral issue, they complain, they threaten you with a loss of money or votes or both. I'm frankly sick and tired of the political preachers across this country telling me as a citizen that if I want to be a moral person, I must believe in A, B, C and D. Just who do they think they are? And from where do they presume to claim the right to dictate their moral beliefs to me? And I am even more angry as a legislator who must endure the threats of every religious group who thinks it has some God-granted right to control my vote on every roll call in the Senate. I am warning them today. I will fight them every step of the way if they try to dictate their moral convictions to all Americans in the name of conservatism. The religious views of the Founding Fathers are of great interest to propagandists of today's American right, anxious to push their version of history. Contrary to their view, the fact that the United States was not founded as a Christian nation was early stated in the terms of a treaty with Tripoli, drafted in 1796 under George Washington and signed by John Adams in 1797. As the government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion, as it has in itself no character of enmity against the laws, religion, or tranquility of Muslimen, and as the said states never have entered into any war or act of hostility against any Mahometan nation, it is declared by the parties that no pretext arising from religious opinions shall ever produce an interruption of the harmony existing between the two countries. The opening words of this quotation would cause uproar in today's Washington ascendancy, yet Ed Buckner has convincingly demonstrated that they caused no dissent at the time among either politicians or public. The paradox has often been noted that the United States, founded in secularism, is now the most religious country in Christendom, while England, with an established church headed by its constitutional monarch, is among the least. I am continually asked why this is, and I do not know. I suppose it is possible that England has wearied of religion after an appalling history of interfaith violence, with Protestants and Catholics alternately gaining the upper hand and systematically murdering the other lot. Another suggestion stems from the observation that America is a nation of immigrants. A colleague points out to me that immigrants, uprooted from the stability and comfort of an extended family in Europe, could well have embraced a church as a kind of kin substitute on alien soil. It is an interesting idea worth researching further. There is no doubt that many Americans see their own local church as an important unit of identity, which does indeed have some of the attributes of an extended family. Yet another hypothesis is that the religiosity of America stems paradoxically from the secularism of its constitution. Precisely because America is legally secular, religion has become free enterprise. Rival churches compete for congregations, not least for the fat tithes that they bring, and the competition is waged with all the aggressive hard-sell techniques of the marketplace. What works for soap flakes works for God, and the result is something approaching religious mania among today's less educated classes. In England, by contrast, religion under the aegis of the established church has become little more than a pleasant social pastime, scarcely recognisable as religious at all. This English tradition is nicely expressed by Giles Fraser, an Anglican vicar who doubles as a philosophy tutor at Oxford, writing in The Guardian. Fraser's article is subtitled, The Establishment of the Church of England Took God Out of Religion, but there are risks in a more vigorous approach to faith. There was a time when the country vicar was a staple of the English dramatis personae. This tea-drinking, gentle eccentric, with his polished shoes and kindly manners, represented a type of religion that didn't make non-religious people uncomfortable. He wouldn't break into an existential sweat or press you against a wall to ask if you were saved, still less launch crusades from the pulpit or plant roadside bombs in the name of some higher power. 
Shades of Betchman's Our Padre, quoted at the beginning of chapter one. Fraser goes on to say that the nice country vicar, in effect, inoculated vast swathes of the English against Christianity. He ends his article by lamenting a more recent trend in the Church of England to take religion seriously again, and his last sentence is a warning. The worry is that we may release the genie of English religious fanaticism from the establishment box in which it has been dormant for centuries. The genie of religious fanaticism is rampant in present-day America, and the founding fathers would have been horrified. Whether or not it is right to embrace the paradox and blame the secular constitution that they devised, the founders most certainly were secularists who believed in keeping religion out of politics, and that is enough to place them firmly on the side of those who object, for example, to ostentatious displays of the Ten Commandments in government-owned public places. But it is tantalizing to speculate that at least some of the founders might have gone beyond deism. Might they have been agnostics or even out-and-out -out atheists? The following statement of Jefferson is indistinguishable from what we would now call agnosticism. To talk of immaterial existences is to talk of nothings. To say that the human soul, angels, God are immaterial is to say they are nothings or that there is no God, no angels, no soul. I cannot reason otherwise without plunging into the fathomless abyss of dreams and phantasms. I am satisfied and sufficiently occupied with the things which are, without tormenting or troubling myself about those which may indeed be, but of which I have no evidence. Christopher Hitchens, in his biography, Thomas Jefferson, Author of America, thinks it likely that Jefferson was an atheist even in his own time when it was much harder. As to whether he was an atheist, we must reserve judgment if only because of the prudence he was compelled to observe during his political life. But as he had written to his nephew, Peter Carr, as early as 1787, one must not be frightened from this inquiry by any fear of its consequences. If it ends in a belief that there is no God, you will find incitements to virtue in the comfort and pleasantness you feel in this exercise, and the love of others which it will procure you. I find the following advice of Jefferson, again in his letter to Peter Carr, moving. Shake off all the fears of servile prejudices under which weak minds are servilely crouched. Fix reason firmly in her seat, and call on her tribunal for every fact, every opinion. Question with boldness even the existence of a God, because if there be one, he must more approve of the homage of reason than that of blindfolded fear. Remarks of Jefferson such as Christianity is the most perverted system that ever shone on man are compatible with deism but also with atheism. So is James Madison's robust anti-clericalism. During almost fifteen centuries has the legal establishment of Christianity been on trial? What has been its fruits? More or less in all places, pride and indolence in the clergy, ignorance and civility in the laity, in both superstition, bigotry and persecution. The same could be said of Benjamin Franklin's Lighthouses are more useful than churches. And of John Adams's This would be the best of all possible worlds if there were no religion in it. Adams delivered himself of some splendid tirades against Christianity in particular. As I understand the Christian religion, it was and is a revelation. But how has it happened that millions of fables, tales, legends have been blended with both Jewish and Christian revelation that have made them the most bloody religion that ever existed? And in another letter, this time to Jefferson, I almost shudder at the thought of alluding to the most fatal example of the abuses of grief which the history of mankind has preserved, the cross. Consider what calamities that engine of grief has produced. Whether Jefferson and his colleagues were theists, deists, agnostics or atheists, they were also passionate secularists who believed that the religious opinions of a president or lack of them were entirely his own business. All the founding fathers, whatever their private religious beliefs, would have been aghast to read the journalist Robert Sherman's report of George Bush Sr.'s answer when Sherman asked him, whether he recognized the equal citizenship and patriotism of Americans who are atheists. No, I don't know that atheists should be considered as citizens, nor should they be considered patriots. 
This is one nation under God. Assuming Sherman's account to be accurate, unfortunately he didn't use a tape recorder and no other newspaper ran the story at the time, try the experiment of replacing atheists with Jews or Muslims or blacks. That gives the measure of the prejudice and discrimination that American atheists have to endure today. Natalie Angier's Confessions of a Lonely Atheist is a sad and moving description in the New York Times of her feelings of isolation as an atheist in today's America. But the isolation of American atheists is an illusion assiduously cultivated by prejudice. Atheists in America are more numerous than most people realize. As I said in the preface, American atheists far outnumber religious Jews, yet the Jewish lobby is notoriously one of the most formidably influential in Washington. What might American atheists achieve if they organized themselves properly? David Mills, in his admirable book, Atheist Universe, tells a story which you would dismiss as an unrealistic caricature of police bigotry if it were fiction. A Christian faith healer ran a Miracle Crusade, which came to Mills's hometown once a year. Among other things, the faith healer encouraged diabetics to throw away their insulin and cancer patients to give up their chemotherapy and pray for a miracle instead. Reasonably enough, Mills decided to organize a peaceful demonstration to warn people. But he made the mistake of going to the police to tell them of his intention and ask for police protection against possible attacks from supporters of the faith healer. The first police officer to whom he spoke asked, Is you going to protest for him or gin him? Meaning for or against the faith healer. When Mills replied against him, the policeman said that he himself planned to attend the rally and intended to spit personally in Mills's face as he marched past Mills's demonstration. Mills decided to try his luck with a second police officer. This one said that if any of the faith healer's supporters violently confronted Mills, the officer would arrest Mills because he was trying to interfere with God's work. Mills went home and tried telephoning the police station in the hope of finding more sympathy at a senior level. He was finally connected to a sergeant who said, To hell with you, buddy. No policeman wants to protect a goddamned atheist. I hope somebody bloodies you up good. Apparently adverbs were in short supply in this police station, along with the milk of human kindness and a sense of duty. Mills relates that he spoke to about seven or eight policemen that day. None of them was helpful, and most of them directly threatened Mills with violence. Anecdotes of such prejudice against atheists abound, but Margaret Downey of the Free Thought Society of Greater Philadelphia maintains systematic records of such cases. Her database of incidents categorized under community, schools, workplace, media, family, and government includes examples of harassment, loss of jobs, shunning by family, and even murder. Downey's documented evidence of the hatred and misunderstanding of atheists makes it easy to believe that it is indeed virtually impossible for an honest atheist to win a public election in America. There are 435 members of the House of Representatives and 100 members of the Senate. Assuming that the majority of these 535 individuals are an educated sample of the population, it is statistically all but inevitable that a substantial number of them must be atheists. They must have lied or concealed their true feelings in order to get elected. Who can blame them, given the electorate they had to convince? It is universally accepted that an admission of atheism would be instant political suicide for any presidential candidate. These facts about today's political climate in the United States and what they imply would have horrified Jefferson, Washington, Madison, Adams and all their friends. Whether they were atheists, agnostics, deists or Christians, they would have recoiled in horror from the theocrats of early 21st century Washington. They would have been drawn instead to the secularist founding fathers of post-colonial India, especially the religious Gandhi. I am a Hindu. I am a Muslim. I am a Jew. I am a Christian. I am a Buddhist. And the atheist Nehru. The spectacle of what is called religion, or at any rate organized religion, in India and elsewhere, has filled me with horror and I have frequently condemned it and wished to make a clean sweep of it. Almost always it seemed to stand for blind belief and reaction, 
dogma and bigotry, superstition, exploitation, and the preservation of vested interests. Nehru's definition of the secular India of Gandhi's dream or that it had been realized instead of the partitioning of their country amid an interfaith bloodbath, might almost have been ghosted by Jefferson himself. We talk about a secular India. Some people think that it means something opposed to religion. That obviously is not correct. What it means is that it is a state which honors all faiths equally and gives them equal opportunities. India has a long history of religious tolerance. In a country like India, which has many faiths and religions, no real nationalism can be built up except on the basis of secularity. The deist God is certainly an improvement over the monster of the Bible. Unfortunately, it is scarcely more likely that he exists, or ever did. In any of its forms, the God hypothesis is unnecessary. The God hypothesis is also very close to being ruled out by the laws of probability. I shall come to that in chapter 4 after dealing with the alleged proofs of the existence of God in chapter 3. Meanwhile, I turn to agnosticism and the erroneous notion that the existence or non-existence of God is an untouchable question forever beyond the reach of science. The Poverty of Agnosticism The robust, muscular Christian haranguing us from the pulpit of my old school chapel admitted a sneaking regard for atheists. They at least had the courage of their misguided convictions. What this preacher couldn't stand was agnostics, namby-pamby, mushy-pap, weak tea, weedy, pallid fence-sitters. He was partly right, but for wholly the wrong reason. In the same vein, according to Quentin de la Bedoyere, the Catholic historian Hugh Ross Williamson, respected the committed religious believer and also the committed atheist. He reserved his contempt for the wishy-washy, boneless mediocrities who flapped around in the middle. There is nothing wrong with being agnostic in cases where we lack evidence one way or the other. It is the reasonable position. Carl Sagan was proud to be agnostic when asked whether there was life elsewhere in the universe. When he refused to commit himself, his interlocutor pressed him for a gut feeling, and he immortally replied, But I try not to think with my gut. Really, it's okay to reserve judgment until the evidence is in. The question of extraterrestrial life is open. Good arguments can be mounted both ways, and we lack the evidence to do more than shade the probabilities one way or the other. Agnosticism of a kind is an appropriate stance on many scientific questions, such as what caused the end Permian extinction, the greatest mass extinction in fossil history. It could have been a meteorite strike, like the one that, with greater likelihood on present evidence, caused the later extinction of the dinosaurs. But it could have been any of various other possible causes or a combination. Agnosticism about the causes of both these mass extinctions is reasonable. How about the question of God? Should we be agnostic about him, too? Many have said definitely yes, often with an air of conviction that verges on protesting too much. Are they right? I'll begin by distinguishing two kinds of agnosticism. TAP, or temporary agnosticism in practice, is the legitimate fence-sitting where there really is a definite answer one way or the other, but we so far lack the evidence to reach it, or don't understand the evidence or haven't time to read the evidence, etc. TAP would be a reasonable stance towards the Permian extinction. There is a truth out there, and one day we hope to know it, though for the moment we don't. But there is also a deeply inescapable kind of fence-sitting, which I shall call PAP, Permanent Agnosticism in Principle. The fact that the acronym spells a word, PAP, used by that old-school preacher is almost accidental. The PAP style of agnosticism is appropriate for questions that can never be answered, no matter how much evidence we gather, because the very idea of evidence is not applicable. The question exists on a different plane, or in a different dimension, beyond the zones where evidence can reach. An example might be that philosophical chestnut, the question whether you see red as I do. Maybe your red is my green, or something completely different from any color that I can imagine. Philosophers cite this question as one that can never be answered, no matter what new evidence might one day become available. And some scientists and other intellectuals are convinced, too eagerly in my view, that the question of God's existence belongs in the forever inaccessible PAP category. From this, 
as we shall see, they often make the illogical deduction that the hypothesis of God's existence and the hypothesis of his non-existence have exactly equal probability of being right. The view that I shall defend is very different. Agnosticism about the existence of God belongs firmly in the temporary, or TAP, category. Either he exists or he doesn't. It is a scientific question. One day we may know the answer, and meanwhile we can say something pretty strong about the probability. In the history of ideas, there are examples of questions being answered that had been earlier judged forever out of science's reach. In 1835, the celebrated French philosopher Auguste Comte wrote of the stars, We shall never be able to study by any method their chemical composition or their mineralogical structure. Yet even before Comte had set down these words, Fraunhofer had begun using his spectroscope to analyze the chemical composition of the sun. Now spectroscopists daily confound Kant's agnosticism with their long-distance analyses of the precise chemical composition of even distant stars. Whatever the exact status of Kant's astronomical agnosticism, this cautionary tale suggests, at very least, that we should hesitate before proclaiming the eternal verity of agnosticism too loudly. Nevertheless, when it comes to God, a great many philosophers and scientists are glad to do so, beginning with the inventor of the word itself, T. H. Huxley. Huxley explained his coining while rising to a personal attack that it had provoked. The principal of King's College London, the Reverend Dr. Wace, had poured scorn on Huxley's cowardly agnosticism. He may prefer to call himself an agnostic, but his real name is an older one. He is an infidel, that is to say, an unbeliever. The word infidel perhaps carries an unpleasant significance. Perhaps it is right that it should. It is, and it ought to be, an unpleasant thing for a man to have to say plainly that he does not believe in Jesus Christ. Huxley was not the man to let that sort of provocation pass him by, and his reply in 1889 was as robustly scathing as we should expect, although never departing from scrupulous good manners, as Darwin's bulldog, his teeth were sharpened by urbane Victorian irony. Eventually, having dealt Dr. Wace his just comeuppance and buried the remains, Huxley returned to the word agnostic and explained how he first came by it. Others, he noted, were quite sure that they had attained a certain gnosis, had more or less successfully solved the problem of existence, while I was quite sure I had not, and had a pretty strong conviction that the problem was insoluble. And with Hume and Kant on my side, I could not think myself presumptuous in holding fast by that opinion. So I took thought and invented what I conceived to be the appropriate title of agnostic. Later in his speech, Huxley went on to explain that agnostics have no creed, not even a negative one. Agnosticism, in fact, is not a creed, but a method, the essence of which lies in the rigorous application of a single principle. Positively, the principle may be expressed, In matters of the intellect, follow your reason as far as it will take you, without regard to any other consideration. And negatively, In matters of the intellect, do not pretend that conclusions are certain which are not demonstrated or demonstrable. That I take to be the agnostic faith, which if a man keep whole and undefiled, he shall not be ashamed to look the universe in the face, whatever the future may have in store for him. To a scientist these are noble words, and one doesn't criticize T. H. Huxley lightly. But Huxley, in his concentration upon the absolute impossibility of proving or disproving God, seems to have been ignoring the shading of probability. The fact that we can neither prove nor disprove the existence of something does not put existence and non-existence on an even footing. I don't think Huxley would disagree, and I suspect that when he appeared to do so, he was bending over backwards to concede a point in the interests of securing another one. We've all done this at one time or another. Contrary to Huxley, I shall suggest that the existence of God is a scientific hypothesis like any other. Even if hard to test in practice, it belongs in the same TAP or temporary agnosticism box as the controversies over the Permian and Cretaceous extinctions. God's existence or non-existence is a scientific fact about the universe, discoverable in principle if not in practice. If he existed and chose to reveal it, 
God himself could clinch the argument noisily and unequivocally in his favour. And even if God's existence is never proved or disproved with certainty one way or the other, available evidence and reasoning may yield an estimate of probability far from 50%. Let us then take the idea of a spectrum of probabilities seriously and place human judgments about the existence of God along it between two extremes of opposite certainty. The spectrum is continuous, but it can be represented by the following seven milestones along the way. 1. Strong Theist 100% probability of God. In the words of C.G. Jung, I do not believe, I know. 2. Very high probability, but short of 100%. De facto theist. I cannot know for certain, but I strongly believe in God and live my life on the assumption that he is there. 3. Higher than 50%, but not very high. Technically agnostic, but leaning towards theism. I am very uncertain, but I am inclined to believe in God. 4. Exactly 50%. Completely impartial agnostic. God's existence and non-existence are exactly equiprobable. 5. Lower than 50%, but not very low. Technically agnostic, but leaning towards atheism. I don't know whether God exists, but I'm inclined to be sceptical. 6. Very low probability, but short of zero. De facto atheist. I cannot know for certain, but I think God is very improbable, and I live my life on the assumption that he is not there. And 7. Strong atheist. I know there is no God, with the same conviction as Jung, knows there is one. I'd be surprised to meet many people in Category 7, but I include it for symmetry with Category 1, which is well populated. It is in the nature of faith that one is capable, like Jung, of holding a belief without adequate reason to do so. Jung also believed that particular books on his shelf spontaneously exploded with a loud bang. Atheists do not have faith, and reason alone could not propel one to total conviction that anything definitely does not exist. Hence, Category 7 is in practice rather emptier than its opposite number, Category 1, which has many devoted inhabitants. I count myself in Category 6, but leaning towards 7. I am agnostic only to the extent that I am agnostic about fairies at the bottom of the garden. The spectrum of probabilities works well for TAP, temporary agnosticism, in practice. It is superficially tempting to place PAP, permanent agnosticism in principle, in the middle of the spectrum with a 50% probability of God's existence. But this is not correct. PAP agnostics aver that we cannot say anything one way or the other on the question of whether or not God exists. The question for PAP agnostics is in principle unanswerable, and they should strictly refuse to place themselves anywhere on the spectrum of probabilities. The fact that I cannot know whether your red is the same as my green doesn't make the probability 50%. The proposition on offer is too meaningless to be dignified with a probability. Nevertheless, it is a common error, which we shall meet again, to leap from the premise that the question of God's existence is in principle unanswerable to the conclusion that his existence and his non-existence are equiprobable. Another way to express that error is in terms of the burden of proof, and in this form it is pleasingly demonstrated by Bertrand Russell's parable of the celestial teapot. Many orthodox people speak as though it were the business of sceptics to disprove received dogmas, rather than of dogmatists to prove them. This is, of course, a mistake. If I were to suggest that between the Earth and Mars there is a china teapot revolving about the sun in an elliptical orbit, nobody would be able to disprove my assertion, provided I were careful to add that the teapot is too small to be revealed even by our most powerful telescopes. But if I were to go on to say that, since my assertion cannot be disproved, it is intolerable presumption on the part of human reason to doubt it, I should rightly be thought to be talking nonsense. If, however, the existence of such a teapot were affirmed in ancient books, taught as the sacred truth every Sunday, and instilled into the minds of children at school, hesitation to believe in its existence would become a mark of eccentricity and entitle the doubter to the attentions of the psychiatrist in an enlightened age or of the inquisitor in an earlier time. 
We would not waste time saying so because nobody, so far as I know, worships teapots. But if pressed, we would not hesitate to declare our strong belief that there is positively no orbiting teapot. Yet strictly we should all be teapot agnostics. We cannot prove for sure that there is no celestial teapot. In practice, we move away from teapot agnosticism towards a teapotism. A friend who was brought up a Jew and still observes the Sabbath and other Jewish customs out of loyalty to his heritage describes himself as a tooth fairy agnostic. He regards God as no more probable than the tooth fairy. You can't disprove either hypothesis, and both are equally improbable. He is an atheist to exactly the same large extent that he is an afariest, and agnostic about both to the same small extent. Russell's teapot, of course, stands for an infinite number of things whose existence is conceivable and cannot be disproved. That great American lawyer Clarence Darrow said, I don't believe in God as I don't believe in Mother Goose. The journalist Andrew Muller is of the opinion that pledging yourself to any particular religion is no more or less weird than choosing to believe that the world is rhombus-shaped and born through the cosmos in the pincers of two enormous green lobsters called Esmeralda and Keith. A philosophical favourite is the invisible, intangible, inaudible unicorn, disproof of which is attempted yearly by the children at Camp Quest. Camp Quest takes the American institution of the summer camp in an entirely admirable direction. Unlike other summer camps that follow a religious or scouting ethos, Camp Quest, founded by Edwin and Helen Kagan in Kentucky, is run by secular humanists, and the children are encouraged to think skeptically for themselves while having a very good time with all the usual outdoor activities. A popular deity on the Internet at present, and as undisprovable as Yahweh or any other, is the flying spaghetti monster who, many claim, has touched them with his noodly appendage. I am delighted to see that the gospel of the flying spaghetti monster has now been published as a book, to great acclaim. I haven't read it myself, but who needs to read a gospel when you just know it's true? By the way, it had to happen. A great schism has already occurred, resulting in the reform church of the flying spaghetti monster. The point of all these way out examples is that they are undisprovable yet nobody thinks the hypothesis of their existence is on an even footing with the hypothesis of their non-existence. Russell's point is that the burden of proof rests with the believers, not the non-believers. Mine is the related point that the odds in favour of the teapot, spaghetti monster, Esmeralda and Keith, unicorn, etc., are not equal to the odds against. The fact that orbiting teapots and tooth fairies are undisprovable is not felt by any reasonable person to be the kind of fact that settles any interesting argument. None of us feels an obligation to disprove any of the millions of far-fetched things that a fertile or facetious imagination might dream up. I have found it an amusing strategy, when asked whether I am an atheist, to point out that the questioner is also an atheist, when considering Zeus, Apollo, Amun-Ra, Mithras, Baal, Thor, Wotan, the Golden Calf, and the Flying Spaghetti Monster. I just go one god further. All of us feel entitled to express extreme scepticism to the point of outright disbelief, except that in the case of unicorns, tooth fairies, and the gods of Greece, Rome, Egypt, and the Vikings, there is, nowadays, no need to bother. In the case of the Abrahamic god, however, there is a need to bother because a substantial proportion of the people with whom we share the planet do believe strongly in his existence. Russell's teapot demonstrates that the ubiquity of belief in God, as compared with belief in celestial teapots, does not shift the burden of proof in logic, although it may seem to shift it as a matter of practical politics. That you cannot prove God's non-existence is accepted and trivial, if only in the sense that we can never absolutely prove the non-existence of anything. What matters is not whether God is disprovable, he isn't, but whether his existence is probable. That is another matter. Some undisprovable things are sensibly judged far less probable than other undisprovable things. There's no reason to regard God as immune from consideration along the spectrum of probabilities. And there is certainly no reason to suppose that just because God can be neither proved nor disproved, his probability of existence is 50%. On the contrary, as we shall see. 
Noma. Just as Thomas Huxley bent over backwards to pay lip service to completely impartial agnosticism, right in the middle of my seven-stage spectrum, theists do the same thing from the other direction, and for an equivalent reason. The theologian Alistair McGrath makes it the central point of his book, Dawkins is God, Genes, Memes, and the Origin of Life. Indeed, after his admirably fair summary of my scientific works, it seems to be the only point in rebuttal that he has to offer, the undeniable but ignominiously weak point that you cannot disprove the existence of God. On page after page, as I read McGrath, I found myself scribbling teapot in the margin. Again invoking T. H. Huxley, McGrath says, Fed up with both theists and atheists making hopelessly dogmatic statements on the basis of inadequate empirical evidence, Huxley declared that the God question could not be settled on the basis of the scientific method. McGrath goes on to quote Stephen Jay Gould in similar vein. To say it for all my colleagues and for the umpteenth millionth time, from college bull sessions to learned treatises, science simply cannot, by its legitimate methods, adjudicate the issue of God's possible superintendence of nature. We neither affirm nor deny it. We simply can't comment on it as scientists. Despite the confident, almost bullying tone of Gould's assertion, what actually is the justification for it? Why shouldn't we comment on God as scientists? And why isn't Russell's teapot or the flying spaghetti monster equally immune from scientific skepticism? As I shall argue in a moment, a universe with a creative superintendent would be a very different kind of universe from one without. Why is that not a scientific matter? Gould carried the art of bending over backwards to positively supine lengths in one of his less admired books, Rocks of Ages. There he coined the acronym NOMA for the phrase non-overlapping magisteria. The net or magisterium of science covers the empirical realm. What is the universe made of? Fact. And why does it work this way? Theory. The magisterium of religion extends over questions of ultimate meaning and moral value. These two magisteria do not overlap, nor do they encompass all inquiry. Consider, for example, the magisterium of art and the meaning of beauty. To cite the old clichés, science gets the age of rocks and religion the rock of ages. Science studies how the heavens go, religion how to go to heaven. This sounds terrific, right up until you give it a moment's thought. What are these ultimate questions in whose presence religion is an honoured guest and science must respectfully slink away? Martin Rees, the distinguished Cambridge astronomer whom I've already mentioned, begins his book Our Cosmic Habitat by posing two candidate ultimate questions and giving a noma-friendly answer. The preeminent mystery is why anything exists at all. What breathes life into the equations and actualized them in a real cosmos? Such questions lie beyond science, however. They are the province of philosophers and theologians. I would prefer to say that if indeed they lie beyond science, they most certainly lie beyond the province of theologians as well. I doubt that philosophers would thank Martin Rees for lumping theologians in with them. I am tempted to go further and wonder in what possible sense theologians can be said to have a province. I am still amused when I recall the remark of a former warden head of my Oxford college. A young theologian had applied for a junior research fellowship, and his doctoral thesis on Christian theology provoked the warden to say, I have grave doubts as to whether it's a subject at all. What expertise can theologians bring to deep cosmological questions that scientists cannot? In another book, I recounted the words of an Oxford astronomer who, when I asked him one of those same deep questions, said, Ah, now we move beyond the realm of science. This is where I have to hand over to our good friend, the chaplain. I was not quick-witted enough to utter the response that I later wrote, But why the chaplain? Why not the gardener or the chef? Why are scientists so cravenly respectful towards the ambitions of theologians, over questions that theologians are certainly no more qualified to answer than scientists themselves. It is a tedious cliché, and unlike many clichés it isn't even true, that science concerns itself with how questions, 
but only theology is equipped to answer why questions. What on earth is a why question? Not every English sentence beginning with the word why is a legitimate question. Why are unicorns hollow? Some questions simply do not deserve an answer. What is the color of abstraction? What is the smell of hope? The fact that a question can be phrased in a grammatically correct English sentence doesn't make it meaningful or entitle it to our serious attention. Nor, even if the question is a real one, does the fact that science cannot answer it imply that religion can. Perhaps there are some genuinely profound and meaningful questions that are forever beyond the reach of science. Maybe quantum theory is already knocking on the door of the unfathomable. But if science cannot answer some ultimate question, what makes anybody think that religion can? I suspect that neither the Cambridge nor the Oxford astronomer really believe that theologians have any expertise that enables them to answer questions that are too deep for science. I suspect that both astronomers were, yet again, bending over backwards to be polite. Theologians have nothing worthwhile to say about anything else. Let's throw them a sop and let them worry away at a couple of questions that nobody can answer and maybe never will. Unlike my astronomer friends, I don't think we should even throw them a sop. I have yet to see any good reason to suppose that theology, as opposed to biblical history, literature, etc., is a subject at all. Similarly, we can all agree that science's entitlement to advise us on moral values is problematic, to say the least. But does Gould really want to cede to religion the right to tell us what is good and what is bad? The fact that it has nothing else to contribute to human wisdom is no reason to hand religion a free license to tell us what to do. Which religion, anyway? The one in which we happen to have been brought up? To which chapter, then, of which book of the Bible should we turn? For they are far from unanimous, and some of them are odious by any reasonable standards. How many literalists have read enough of the Bible to know that the death penalty is prescribed for adultery, for gathering sticks on the Sabbath, and for cheeking your parents? If we reject Deuteronomy and Leviticus, as all enlightened moderns do, by what criteria do we then decide which of religion's moral values to accept? Or should we pick and choose among all the world's religions until we find one whose moral teaching suits us? If so, again, we must ask, by what criterion do we choose? And if we have independent criteria for choosing among religious moralities, why not cut out the middleman and go straight for the moral choice without the religion? Chapter 7 returns to such questions. I simply do not believe that Gould could possibly have meant much of what he wrote in Rocks of Ages. As I say, we have all been guilty of bending over backwards to be nice to an unworthy but powerful opponent, and I can only think that this is what Gould was doing. It is conceivable that he really did intend his unequivocally strong statement that science has nothing whatever to say about the question of God's existence. We neither affirm nor deny it, we simply can't comment on it as scientists. This sounds like agnosticism of the permanent and irrevocable kind, full-blown PAP. It implies that science cannot even make probability judgments on the question. This remarkably widespread fallacy, many repeat it like a mantra, but few of them, I suspect, have thought it through, embodies what I refer to as the poverty of agnosticism. Gould, by the way, was not an impartial agnostic, but strongly inclined towards de facto atheism. On what basis did he make that judgment, if there is nothing to be said about whether God exists? The God hypothesis suggests that the reality we inhabit also contains a supernatural agent who designed the universe and, at least in many versions of the hypothesis, maintains it and even intervenes in it with miracles, which are temporary violations of his own otherwise grandly immutable laws. Richard Swinburne, one of Britain's leading theologians, is surprisingly clear on the matter in his book, Is There a God? What the theist claims about God is that he does have a power to create, conserve, or annihilate anything, big or small. And he can also make objects move or do anything else. He can make the planets move in the way that Kepler discovered that they move, or make gunpowder explode when we set a match to it. Or he can make planets move in quite different ways, and chemical substances explode or not explode under quite different conditions from those which now govern their behavior. God is not limited by the laws of nature. 
He makes them, and he can change or suspend them, if he chooses. Just too easy, isn't it? Whatever else this is, it is very far from Noma. And whatever else they may say, those scientists who subscribe to the separate Magisteria school of thought should concede that a universe with a supernaturally intelligent creator is a very different kind of universe from one without. The difference between the two hypothetical universes could hardly be more fundamental in principle, even if it is not easy to test in practice. And it undermines the complacently seductive dictum that science must be completely silent about religion's central existence claim. The presence or absence of a creative superintelligence is unequivocally a scientific question, even if it is not in practice, or not yet, a decided one. So also is the truth or falsehood of every one of the miracle stories that religions rely upon to impress multitudes of the faithful. Did Jesus have a human father, or was his mother a virgin at the time of his birth? Whether or not there is enough surviving evidence to decide it, this is still a strictly scientific question, with a definite answer in principle, yes or no. Did Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead? Did he himself come alive again three days after being crucified? There is an answer to every such question, whether or not we can discover it in practice, and it is a strictly scientific answer. The methods we should use to settle the matter, in the unlikely event that relevant evidence ever became available, would be purely and entirely scientific methods. To dramatize the point, imagine by some remarkable set of circumstances that forensic archaeologists unearthed DNA evidence to show that Jesus really did lack a biological father. Can you imagine religious apologists shrugging their shoulders and saying anything remotely like the following? Who cares? Scientific evidence is completely irrelevant to theological questions. Wrong magisterium. We're concerned only with ultimate questions and with moral values. Neither DNA nor any other scientific evidence could ever have any bearing on the matter one way or the other. The very idea is a joke. You can bet your boots that the scientific evidence, if any were to turn up, would be seized upon and trumpeted to the skies. Noma is popular only because there is no evidence to favour the God hypothesis. The moment there was the smallest suggestion of any evidence in favour of religious belief, religious apologists would lose no time in throwing Noma out of the window. Sophisticated theologians aside, and even they are happy to tell miracle stories to the unsophisticated in order to swell congregations, I suspect that alleged miracles provide the strongest reason many believers have for their faith, and miracles, by definition, violate the principles of science. The Roman Catholic Church on the one hand seems sometimes to aspire to Noma, but on the other hand lays down the performance of miracles as an essential qualification for elevation to sainthood. The late king of the Belgians is a candidate for sainthood because of his stand on abortion. Earnest investigations are now going on to discover whether any miraculous cures can be attributed to prayers offered up to him since his death. I am not joking, that is the case and it is typical of saint stories. I imagine the whole business is an embarrassment to more sophisticated circles within the church. Why any circles worthy of the name of sophisticated remain within the church is a mystery at least as deep as those that theologians enjoy. When faced with miracle stories, Gould would presumably retort along the following lines. The whole point of Noma is that it is a two-way bargain. The moment religion steps on science's turf and starts to meddle in the real world with miracles, it ceases to be religion in the sense Gould is defending, and his amicabilis concordia is broken. Note, however, that the miracle-free religion defended by Gould would not be recognized by most practicing theists in the pew or on the prayer mat. It would indeed be a grave disappointment to them. To adapt Alice's comment on her sister's book before she fell into Wonderland, what is the use of a God who does no miracles and answers no prayers? Remember Ambrose Bierce's witty definition of the verb to pray? To ask that the laws of the universe be annulled in behalf of a single petitioner, confessedly unworthy. There are athletes who believe God helps them win, against opponents who would seem on the face of it no less worthy of his favoritism. There are motorists who believe God saves them a parking space. 
thereby presumably depriving somebody else. This style of theism is embarrassingly popular and is unlikely to be impressed by anything as, superficially, reasonable as Noma. Nevertheless, let us follow Gould and pare our religion down to some sort of non-interventionist minimum. No miracles, no personal communication between God and us in either direction, no monkeying with the laws of physics, no trespassing on the scientific grass. At most, a little deistic input to the initial conditions of the universe so that, in the fullness of time, stars, elements, chemistry and planets develop and life evolves. Surely that is an adequate separation. Surely Noma can survive this more modest and unassuming religion. Well, you might think so. But I suggest that even a non-interventionist Noma god, though less violent and clumsy than an Abrahamic god, is still, when you look at him fair and square, a scientific hypothesis. I return to the point. A universe in which we are alone except for other slowly evolved intelligences is a very different universe from one with an original guiding agent whose intelligent design is responsible for its very existence. I accept that it may not be so easy in practice to distinguish one kind of universe from the other. Nevertheless, there is something utterly special about the hypothesis of ultimate design and equally special about the only known alternative, gradual evolution in the broad sense. They are close to being irreconcilably different. Like nothing else, evolution really does provide an explanation for the existence of entities whose improbability would otherwise, for practical purposes, rule them out. And the conclusion to the argument, as I shall show in Chapter 4, is close to being terminally fatal to the God hypothesis. The Great Prayer Experiment An amusing, if rather pathetic, case study in miracles is the Great Prayer Experiment. Does praying for patients help them recover? Prayers are commonly offered for sick people, both privately and in formal places of worship. Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton, was the first to analyse scientifically whether praying for people is efficacious. He noted that every Sunday in churches throughout Britain, entire congregations prayed publicly for the health of the royal family. Shouldn't they, therefore, be unusually fit, compared with the rest of us, who are prayed for only by our nearest and dearest? Galton looked into it and found no statistical difference. His intention may, in any case, have been satirical, as also when he prayed over randomised plots of land to see if the plants would grow any faster. They didn't. More recently, the physicist Russell Stannard, one of Britain's three well-known religious scientists, as we shall see, has thrown his weight behind an initiative funded by, of course, the Templeton Foundation, to test experimentally the proposition that praying for sick patients improves their health. Such experiments, if done properly, have to be double-blind, and this standard was strictly observed. The patients were assigned, strictly at random, to an experimental group, receive prayers, or a control group, receive no prayers. Neither the patients, nor their doctors or caregivers, nor the experimenters were allowed to know which patients were being prayed for and which patients were controls. Those who did the experimental praying had to know the names of the individuals for whom they were praying, otherwise in what sense would they be praying for them rather than for somebody else? But care was taken to tell them only the first name and initial letter of the surname. Apparently, that would be enough to enable God to pinpoint the right hospital bed. The very idea of doing such experiments is open to a generous measure of ridicule, and the project duly received it. As far as I know, Bob Newhart didn't do a sketch about it, but I can distinctly hear his voice. What's that you say, Lord? You can't cure me because I'm a member of the control group? Oh, I see, my aunt's prayers aren't enough, but, Lord, Mr. Evans in the next door bed. What, what was that, Lord? Mr. Evans received a thousand prayers per day? But, Lord, Mr. Evans doesn't know a thousand people. Oh, they just referred to him as John E. But, Lord, how did you know they didn't mean John Ellsworthy? Oh, right, you used your omniscience to work out which John E. they meant. But, Lord... Valiantly shouldering aside all mockery, 
the team of researchers soldiered on, spending $2.4 million of Templeton money under the leadership of Dr. Herbert Benson, a cardiologist at the Mind Body Medical Institute near Boston. Dr. Benson was earlier quoted in a Templeton press release as believing that evidence for the efficacy of intercessory prayer in medicinal settings is mounting. Reassuringly, then, the research was in good hands, unlikely to be spoiled by sceptical vibrations. Dr. Benson and his team monitored 1,802 patients at six hospitals, all of whom received coronary bypass surgery. The patients were divided into three groups. Group 1 received prayers and didn't know it. Group 2, the control group, received no prayers and didn't know it. Group 3 received prayers and did know it. The comparison between groups 1 and 2 tests for the efficacy of intercessory prayer. Group 3 tests for possible psychosomatic effects of knowing that one is being prayed for. Prayers were delivered by the congregations of three churches, one in Minnesota, one in Massachusetts, and one in Missouri, all distant from the three hospitals. The praying individuals, as explained, were given only the first name and initial letter of the surname of each patient for whom they were to pray. It is good experimental practice to standardize as far as possible, and they were all, accordingly, told to include in their prayers the phrase, for a successful surgery with a quick, healthy recovery and no complications. The results, reported in the American Heart Journal of April 2006, were clear-cut. There was no difference between those patients who were prayed for and those who were not. What a surprise! There was a difference between those who knew they'd been prayed for and those who did not know one way or the other. But it went in the wrong direction. Those who knew they had been the beneficiaries of prayer suffered significantly more complications than those who did not. Was God doing a bit of smiting to show his disapproval of the whole balmy enterprise? It seems more probable that those patients who knew they were being prayed for suffered additional stress in consequence. Performance anxiety, as the experimenters put it. Dr. Charles Bethia, one of the researchers, said, It may have made them uncertain, wondering, am I so sick they had to call in their prayer team? In today's litigious society, is it too much to hope that those patients suffering heart complications, as a consequence of knowing they were receiving experimental prayers, might put together a class action lawsuit against the Templeton Foundation? It will be no surprise that this study was opposed by theologians, perhaps anxious about its capacity to bring ridicule upon religion. The Oxford theologian Richard Swinburne, writing after the study failed, objected to it on the grounds that God answers prayers only if they are offered up for good reasons. Praying for somebody rather than somebody else, simply because of the fall of the dice in the design of a double-blind experiment, does not constitute a good reason. God would see through it. That indeed was the point of my Bob Newhart satire, and Swinburne is right to make it too. But in other parts of his paper, Swinburne himself is beyond satire. Not for the first time he seeks to justify suffering in a world run by God. My suffering provides me with the opportunity to show courage and patience. It provides you with the opportunity to show sympathy and to help alleviate my suffering and it provides society with the opportunity to choose whether or not to invest a lot of money in trying to find a cure for this or that particular kind of suffering. Although a good God regrets our suffering, his greatest concern is surely that each of us shall show patience, sympathy and generosity and, thereby, form a holy character. Some people badly need to be ill for their own sake, and some people badly need to be ill to provide important choices for others. Only in that way can some people be encouraged to make serious choices about the sort of person they are to be. For other people, illness is not so valuable. This grotesque piece of reasoning, so damningly typical of the theological mind, reminds me of an occasion when I was on a television panel with Swinburne and also with our Oxford colleague, Professor Peter Atkins. Swinburne, at one point, attempted to justify the Holocaust, on the grounds that it gave the Jews a wonderful opportunity to be courageous and noble. Peter Atkins splendidly growled, May you rot in hell! Another typical piece of theological reasoning occurs further along in Swinburne's article. He rightly suggests 
but if God wanted to demonstrate his own existence, he would find better ways to do it than slightly biasing the recovery statistics of experimental versus control groups of heart patients. If God existed and wanted to convince us of it, he would fill the world with super miracles. But then Swinburne lets fall his gem. There is quite a lot of evidence anyway of God's existence, and too much might not be good for us. Too much might not be good for us. Read it again. Too much evidence might not be good for us. Richard Swinburne is the recently retired holder of one of Britain's most prestigious professorships of theology and is a fellow of the British Academy. If it's a theologian you want, they don't come much more distinguished. Perhaps you don't want a theologian. Swinburne wasn't the only theologian to disown the study after it had failed. The Reverend Raymond J. Lawrence was granted a generous tranche of op-ed space in the New York Times to explain why responsible religious leaders will breathe a sigh of relief that no evidence could be found of intercessory prayer having any effect. Would he have sung a different tune if the Benson study had succeeded in demonstrating the power of prayer? Maybe not but you can be certain that plenty of other pastors and theologians would. The Reverend Lawrence's piece is chiefly memorable for the following revelation. Recently, a colleague told me about a devout, well-educated woman who accused a doctor of malpractice in his treatment of her husband. During her husband's dying days, she charged, the doctor had failed to pray for him. Other theologians joined Noma-inspired skeptics in contending that studying prayer in this way is a waste of money because supernatural influences are by definition beyond the reach of science. But, as the Templeton Foundation correctly recognized when it financed the study, the alleged power of intercessory prayer is, at least in principle, within the reach of science. A double-blind experiment can be done and was done. It could have yielded a positive result, and if it had, can you imagine that a single religious apologist would have dismissed it on the grounds that scientific research has no bearing on religious matters? Of course not. Needless to say, the negative results of the experiment will not shake the faithful. Bob Bath, the spiritual director of the Missouri Prayer Ministry, which supplies some of the experimental prayers, said, A person of faith would say that this study is interesting, but we've been praying a long time, and we've seen prayer work, we know it works and the research on prayer and spirituality is just getting started. Yeah, right, we know from our faith that prayer works, so if evidence fails to show it, we'll just soldier on until finally we get the result we want. The Neville Chamberlain School of Evolutionists A possible ulterior motive for those scientists who insist on NOMA, the invulnerability to science of the God hypothesis, is a peculiarly American political agenda provoked by the threat of populist creationism. In parts of the United States, science is under attack from a well-organized, politically well-connected, and above all well-financed, opposition, and the teaching of evolution is in the front-line trench. Scientists could be forgiven for feeling threatened, because most research money comes ultimately from government, and elected representatives have to answer to the ignorant and prejudiced as well as to the well-informed among their constituents. In response to such threats, an evolution defense lobby has sprung up, most notably represented by the National Center for Science Education, NCSE, led by Eugenie Scott, indefatigable activist on behalf of science, who has recently produced her own book, Evolution vs. Creationism. One of NCSE's main political objectives is to court and mobilize sensible religious opinion, mainstream church men and women who have no problem with evolution and may regard it as irrelevant to, or even in some strange way supportive of, their faith. It is to this mainstream of clergy, theologians, and non-fundamentalist believers, embarrassed as they are by creationism because it brings religion into disrepute, that the evolution defense lobby tries to appeal. And one way to do this is to bend over backwards in their direction by espousing NOMA agree that science is completely non-threatening because it is disconnected from religion's claims. 
Another prominent luminary of what we might call the Neville Chamberlain School of Evolutionists is the philosopher Michael Roos. Roos has been an effective campaigner against creationism, both on paper and in court. He claims to be an atheist, but his article in Playboy takes the view that we who love science must realize that the enemy of our enemies is our friend. Too often evolutionists spend time insulting would-be allies. This is especially true of secular evolutionists. Atheists spend more time running down sympathetic Christians than they do countering creationists. When John Paul II wrote a letter endorsing Darwinism, Richard Dawkins' response was simply that the Pope was a hypocrite, that he could not be genuine about science, and that Dawkins himself simply preferred an honest fundamentalist. From a purely tactical viewpoint, I can see the superficial appeal of Roos's comparison with the fight against Hitler. Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt did not like Stalin and communism, but in fighting Hitler, they realized that they had to work with the Soviet Union. Evolutionists of all kinds must likewise work together to fight creationism. But I finally come down on the side of my colleague, the Chicago geneticist Jerry Coyne, who wrote that Roos fails to grasp the real nature of the conflict. It's not just about evolution versus creationism. To scientists like Dawkins and Wilson, E.O. Wilson, the celebrated Harvard biologist, the real war is between rationalism and superstition. Science is but one form of rationalism, while religion is the most common form of superstition. Creationism is just a symptom of what they see as the greater enemy, religion. While religion can exist without creationism, creationism cannot exist without religion. I do have one thing in common with the creationists. Like me, but unlike the Chamberlain School, they will have no truck with Noma and its separate magisteria. Far from respecting the separateness of science's turf, creationists like nothing better than to trample their dirty hobnails all over it. And they fight dirty, too. Lawyers for creationists in court cases around the American boondocks seek out evolutionists who are openly atheists. I know to my chagrin that my name has been used in this way. It is an effective tactic because juries selected at random are likely to include individuals brought up to believe that atheists are demons incarnate, on a par with paedophiles or terrorists, today's equivalent of Salem's witches and McCarthy's commies. Any creationist lawyer who got me on the stand could instantly win over the jury simply by asking me, has your knowledge of evolution influenced you in the direction of becoming an atheist? I would have to answer yes, and at one stroke I would have lost the jury. By contrast, the judicially correct answer from the secularist side would be, my religious beliefs or lack of them are a private matter, neither the business of this court nor connected in any way with my science. I couldn't honestly say this, for reasons I shall explain in Chapter 4. The Guardian journalist Madeline Bunting wrote an article entitled Why the Intelligent Design Lobby Thanks God for Richard Dawkins. There's no indication that she consulted anybody except Michael Roos, and her article might as well have been ghostwritten by him. Dan Dennett replied, aptly quoting Uncle Remus, I find it amusing that two Brits, Madeline Bunting and Michael Roos, have fallen for a version of one of the most famous scams in American folklore, why the intelligent design lobby thanks God for Richard Dawkins, March 27th. When Br'er Rabbit gets caught by the fox, he pleads with him, Oh, please, please, Br'er Fox, whatever you do, don't throw me in that awful briar patch, where he ends up safe and sound after the fox does just that. When the American propagandist William Dembski writes tauntingly to Richard Dawkins, telling him to keep up the good work on behalf of intelligent design, Bunting and Roos fall for it. Oh, golly, Br'er Fox, your forthright assertion that evolutionary biology disproves the idea of a creator god jeopardizes the teaching of biology and science class, since teaching that would violate the separation of church and state. Right. You also ought to soft-pedal physiology since it declares virgin birth impossible. This whole issue, including an independent invocation of Br'er Rabbit in the Briar Patch, is well discussed by the biologist P.Z. Myers, whose Feringular blog can reliably be consulted for trenchant good sense. I'm not suggesting that my colleagues of the appeasement lobby are necessarily dishonest, 
They may sincerely believe in Noma, although I can't help wondering how thoroughly they've thought it through and how they reconcile the internal conflicts in their minds. There's no need to pursue the matter for the moment, but anyone seeking to understand the published statements of scientists on religious matters would do well not to forget the political context, the surreal culture wars now rending America. Noma style appeasement will surface again in a later chapter. Here, I return to agnosticism and the possibility of chipping away at our ignorance and measurably reducing our uncertainty about the existence or non-existence of God. Little Green Men Suppose Bertrand Russell's parable had concerned not a teapot in outer space, but life in outer space, the subject of Sagan's memorable refusal to think with his gut. Once again, we cannot disprove it, and the only strictly rational stance is agnosticism. But the hypothesis is no longer frivolous. We don't immediately scent extreme improbability. We can have an interesting argument based on incomplete evidence, and we can write down the kind of evidence that would decrease our uncertainty. We'd be outraged if our government invested in expensive telescopes for the sole purpose of searching for orbiting teapots. But we can appreciate the case for spending money on SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, using radio telescopes to scan the skies in the hope of picking up signals from intelligent aliens. I praised Carl Sagan for disavowing gut feelings about alien life. But one can, and Sagan did, make a sober assessment of what we would need to know in order to estimate the probability. This might start from nothing more than a listing of our points of ignorance, as in the famous Drake equation, which, in Paul Davis's phrase, collects probabilities. It states that to estimate the number of independently evolved civilizations in the universe, you must multiply seven terms together. The seven include the number of stars, the number of Earth-like planets per star, and the probability of this, that, and the other, which I need not list, because the only point I'm making is that they are all unknown, or estimated with enormous margins of error. When so many terms that are either completely or almost completely unknown are multiplied up, the product, the estimated number of alien civilizations, has such colossal error bars that agnosticism seems a very reasonable, if not the only credible stance. Some of the terms in the Drake equation are already less unknown than when he first wrote it down in 1961. At that time, our solar system of planets orbiting a central star was the only one known, together with the local analogies provided by Jupiter's and Saturn's satellite systems. Our best estimate of the number of orbiting systems in the universe was based on theoretical models coupled with the more informal principle of mediocrity, the feeling born of uncomfortable history lessons from Copernicus, Hubble, and others, that there should be nothing particularly unusual about the place where we happen to live. Unfortunately, the principle of mediocrity is, in its turn, emasculated by the anthropic principle. See Chapter 4. If our solar system really were the only one in the universe, this is precisely where we, as beings who think about such matters, would have to be living. The very fact of our existence could retrospectively determine that we live in an extremely unmediocre place. But today's estimates of the ubiquity of solar systems are no longer based on the principle of mediocrity. They are informed by direct evidence. The spectroscope, nemesis of Kant's positivism, strikes again. Our telescopes are scarcely powerful enough to see planets around other stars directly. But the position of a star is perturbed by the gravitational pull of its planets as they whirl around it, and spectroscopes can pick up the Doppler shifts in the star's spectrum, at least in cases where the perturbing planet is large. Mostly using this method, at the time of writing we now know of 170 extrasolar planets orbiting 147 stars. But the figure will certainly have increased by the time you read this book. So far, they are bulky Jupiters because only Jupiters are large enough to perturb their stars into the zone of detectability of present-day spectroscopes. We have at least quantitatively improved our estimate of one previously shrouded term of the Drake equation. This permits a significant, if still moderate, easing of our agnosticism about the final value yielded by the equation. We must still be agnostic about life on other worlds, 
but a little bit less agnostic, because we are just that bit less ignorant. Science can chip away at agnosticism in a way that Huxley bent over backwards to deny for the special case of God. I am arguing that, notwithstanding the polite abstinence of Huxley, Gould, and many others, the God question is not in principle and forever outside the remit of science. As with the nature of the stars, contra cont, and as with the likelihood of life in orbit around them, science can make at least probabilistic inroads into the territory of agnosticism. My definition of the God hypothesis included the words superhuman and supernatural. To clarify the difference, imagine that a SETI radio telescope actually did pick up a signal from outer space which showed unequivocally that we are not alone. It is a non-trivial question, by the way, what kind of signal would convince us of its intelligent origin. A good approach is to turn the question around. What should we intelligently do in order to advertise our presence to extraterrestrial listeners? Rhythmic pulses wouldn't do it. Jocelyn Bell Burnell, the radio astronomer who first discovered the pulsar in 1967, was moved by the precision of its 1.33 second periodicity to name it, tongue-in-cheek, the LGM, Little Green Men, signal. She later found a second pulsar elsewhere in the sky and of different periodicity, which pretty much disposed of the LGM hypothesis. Metronomic rhythms can be generated by many non-intelligent phenomena, from swaying branches to dripping water, from time lags in self-regulating feedback loops, to spinning and orbiting celestial bodies. More than a thousand pulsars have now been found in our galaxy, and it is generally accepted that each one is a spinning neutron star, emitting radio energy that sweeps around like a lighthouse beam. It is amazing to think of a star rotating on a time scale of seconds, Imagine if each of our days lasted 1.33 seconds instead of 24 hours. But just about everything we know of neutron stars is amazing. The point is that the pulsar phenomenon is now understood as a product of simple physics, not intelligence. Nothing simply rhythmic, then, would announce our intelligent presence to the waiting universe. Prime numbers are often mentioned as the recipe of choice since it is difficult to think of a purely physical process that could generate them. Whether by detecting prime numbers or by some other means, imagine that SETI does come up with unequivocal evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence, followed, perhaps, by a massive transmission of knowledge and wisdom along the science fiction lines of Fred Hoyle's A for Andromeda or Carl Sagan's Contact. How should we respond? A pardonable reaction would be something akin to worship, for any civilization capable of broadcasting a signal over such an immense distance is likely to be greatly superior to ours. Even if that civilization is not more advanced than ours at the time of transmission, the enormous distance between us entitles us to calculate that they must be millennia ahead of us by the time the message reaches us, unless they've driven themselves extinct, which is not unlikely. Whether we ever get to know about them or not, there are very probably alien civilizations that are superhuman to the point of being godlike in ways that exceed anything a theologian could possibly imagine. Their technical achievements would seem as supernatural to us as ours would seem to a Dark Age peasant transported to the 21st century. Imagine his response to a laptop computer, a mobile telephone, a hydrogen bomb or a jumbo jet. As Arthur C. Clarke put it in his Third Law, Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. The miracles wrought by our technology would have seemed to the ancients no less remarkable than the tales of Moses parting the waters or Jesus walking upon them. The aliens of our SETI signal would be to us like gods, just as missionaries were treated as gods and exploited the undeserved honour to the hilt when they turned up in Stone Age cultures bearing guns, telescopes, matches and almanacs predicting eclipses to the second. In what sense, then, would the most advanced SETI aliens not be gods? In what sense would they be superhuman but not supernatural? In a very important sense, which goes to the heart of this book, the crucial difference between gods and godlike extraterrestrials lies not in their properties, but in their provenance. Entities that are complex enough to be intelligent 
are products of an evolutionary process. No matter how godlike they may seem when we encounter them, they didn't start that way. Science fiction authors such as Daniel F. Galloy in Counterfeit World have even suggested, and I cannot think how to disprove it, that we live in a computer simulation set up by some vastly superior civilization. But the simulators themselves would have to come from somewhere. The laws of probability forbid all notions of their spontaneously appearing without simpler antecedents. They probably owe their existence to a perhaps unfamiliar version of Darwinian evolution, some sort of cumulatively ratcheting crane as opposed to skyhook, to use Daniel Dennett's terminology. Skyhooks, including all gods, are magic spells. They do no bona fide explanatory work and demand more explanation than they provide. Cranes are explanatory devices that actually do explain. Natural selection is the champion crane of all time. It has lifted life from primeval simplicity to the dizzy heights of complexity, beauty, and apparent design that dazzle us today. This will be a dominant theme of Chapter 4, why there almost certainly is no God. But first, before proceeding with my main reason for actively disbelieving in God's existence, I have a responsibility to dispose of the positive arguments for belief that have been offered through history. Chapter 3 Arguments for God's Existence A professorship of theology should have no place in our institution. Thomas Jefferson Arguments for the existence of God have been codified for centuries by theologians and supplemented by others, including purveyors of misconceived common sense. Thomas Aquinas's Proofs the five proofs asserted by Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century don't prove anything and are easily, though I hesitate to say so given his eminence, exposed as vacuous. The first three are just different ways of saying the same thing, and they can be considered together. All involve an infinite regress. The answer to a question raises a prior question, and so on ad infinitum. 1. The Unmoved Mover Nothing moves without a prior mover. This leads us to a regress from which the only escape is God. Something had to make the first move, and that something we call God. 2. The uncaused cause. Nothing is caused by itself. Every effect has a prior cause, and again we are pushed back into regress. This has to be terminated by a first cause, which we call God. 3. The cosmological argument. There must have been a time when no physical things existed, but since physical things exist now, there must have been something non-physical to bring them into existence, and that something we call God. All three of these arguments rely upon the idea of a regress and invoke God to terminate it. They make the entirely unwarranted assumption that God himself is immune to the regress. Even if we allow the dubious luxury of arbitrarily conjuring up a terminator to an infinite regress and giving it a name, simply because we need one, there is absolutely no reason to endow that terminator with any of the properties normally ascribed to God, omnipotence, omniscience, goodness, creativity of design, to say nothing of such human attributes as listening to prayers, forgiving sins, and reading innermost thoughts. Incidentally, it has not escaped the notice of logicians that omniscience and omnipotence are mutually incompatible. If God is omniscient, he must already know how he is going to intervene to change the course of history using his omnipotence. But that means he can't change his mind about his intervention, which means he is not omnipotent. Karen Owens has captured this witty little paradox in equally engaging verse. Can omniscient God, who knows the future, find the omnipotence to change his future mind? To return to the infinite regress and the futility of invoking God to terminate it, it is more parsimonious to conjure up, say, a Big Bang singularity or some other physical concept as yet unknown. Calling it God is at best unhelpful and at worst perniciously misleading. Edward Lear's nonsense recipe for crumbobblious cutlets 
invites us to procure some strips of beef and, having cut them into the smallest possible pieces, proceed to cut them still smaller, eight or perhaps nine times. Some regresses do reach a natural terminator. Scientists used to wonder what would happen if you could dissect, say, gold into the smallest possible pieces. Why shouldn't you cut one of those pieces in half and produce an even smaller smidgen of gold? The regress in this case is decisively terminated by the atom. The smallest possible piece of gold is a nucleus consisting of exactly 79 protons and a slightly larger number of neutrons, attended by a swarm of 79 electrons. If you cut gold any further than the level of the single atom, whatever else you get, it is not gold. The atom provides a natural terminator to the Crumbubblius cutlets type of regress. It is by no means clear that God provides a natural terminator to the regresses of Aquinas. That's putting it mildly, as we shall see later. Let's move on down Aquinas's list. Four, the argument from degree. We notice that things in the world differ. There are degrees of, say, goodness or perfection, but we judge these degrees only by comparison with a maximum. Humans can be both good and bad, so the maximum goodness cannot rest in us. Therefore, there must be some other maximum to set the standard for perfection, and we call that maximum God. That's an argument. You might as well say people vary in smelliness. But we can make the comparison only by reference to a perfect maximum of conceivable smelliness. Therefore, there must exist a preeminently peerless stinker, and we call him God. Or substitute any dimension of comparison you like, and derive an equally fatuous conclusion. Five, the teleological argument or argument from design. Things in the world, especially living things, look as though they have been designed. Nothing we know looks designed unless it is designed. Therefore, there must have been a designer, and we call him God. Aquinas himself used the analogy of an arrow moving towards a target, but a modern heat-seeking anti-aircraft missile would have suited his purpose better. The argument from design is the only one still in regular use today, and it still sounds to many like the ultimate knockdown argument. The young Darwin was impressed by it when, as a Cambridge undergraduate, he read it in William Paley's Natural Theology. Unfortunately for Paley, the mature Darwin blew it out of the water. There has probably never been a more devastating rout of popular belief by clever reasoning than Charles Darwin's destruction of the argument from design. It was so unexpected. Thanks to Darwin, it is no longer true to say that nothing that we know looks designed unless it is designed. Evolution by natural selection produces an excellent simulacrum of design, mounting prodigious heights of complexity and elegance. And among these eminences of pseudo design are nervous systems, which, among their more modest accomplishments, manifest goal-seeking behaviour that, even in a tiny insect, resembles a sophisticated heat-seeking missile more than a simple arrow on target. I shall return to the argument from design in Chapter Four. The ontological argument and other a priori arguments. Arguments for God's existence fall into two main categories: the a priori and the a posteriori. Thomas Aquinas's five are a posteriori arguments, relying upon inspection of the world. The most famous of the a priori arguments, those that rely upon pure armchair ratiocination, is the ontological argument. Proposed by Saint Anselm of Canterbury in 1078, and restated in different forms by numerous philosophers ever since. An odd aspect of Anselm's argument is that it was originally addressed not to humans but to God Himself in the form of a prayer. You'd think that any entity capable of listening to a prayer would need no convincing of his own existence. It is possible to conceive, Anselm said, of a being than which nothing greater can be conceived. Even an atheist can conceive of such a superlative being, though he would deny its existence in the real world. But goes the argument, a being that doesn't exist in the real world is, by that very fact, less than perfect. Therefore, we have a contradiction, and hey presto, God exists. 
Let me translate this infantile argument into the appropriate language, which is the language of the playground. Bet you I can prove God exists. Bet you can't. Right then, imagine the most perfect, perfect, perfect thing possible. Okay, now what? Now, is that perfect, perfect, perfect thing real? Does it exist? No, it's only in my mind. But if it was real, it would be even more perfect because a really, really perfect thing would have to be better than a silly old imaginary thing. So I've proved that God exists. Na 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 na. All atheists are fools. I had my childish wiseacre choose the word fools advisedly. Anselm himself quoted the first verse of Psalm 14: "The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God." And he had the cheek to use the name "fool" (Latin incipiens) for his hypothetical atheist. Hence, even the fool is convinced that something exists in the understanding, at least, than which nothing greater can be conceived. For when he hears of this, he understands it, and whatever is understood exists in the understanding, and assuredly that than which nothing greater can be conceived. Cannot exist in the understanding alone, for suppose it exists in the understanding alone, then it can be conceived to exist in reality, which is greater. The very idea that grand conclusions could follow from such logomachist trickery offends me aesthetically, so I must take care to refrain from bandying words like fool. Bertrand Russell, no fool, interestingly said. It is easier to feel convinced that the ontological argument must be fallacious than it is to find out precisely where the fallacy lies. Russell himself, as a young man, was briefly convinced by it. I remember the precise moment, one day in 1894, as I was walking along Trinity Lane, when I saw in a flash, or thought I saw, that the ontological argument is valid. I'd gone out to buy a tin of tobacco. On my way back. I suddenly threw it up in the air and exclaimed as I caught it, "Great Scott! The ontological argument is sound." Why, I wonder, didn't he say something like, "Great Scott! The ontological argument seems to be plausible." But isn't it too good to be true that a grand truth about the cosmos should follow from a mere word game? I'd better set to work to resolve what is perhaps a paradox, like those of Zeno. The Greeks had a hard time seeing through Zeno's proof that Achilles would never catch the tortoise. Achilles can run ten times as fast as the tortoise, so he gives the animal, say, a hundred yards start. Achilles runs one hundred yards, and the tortoise is now ten yards ahead. Achilles runs the ten yards, and the tortoise is now one yard ahead. Achilles runs the one yard, and the tortoise is still a tenth of a yard ahead, and so on ad infinitum. So Achilles never catches the tortoise. But the Greeks had the sense not to conclude that therefore Achilles really would fail to catch the tortoise. Instead, they called it a paradox and waited for later generations of mathematicians to explain it, with, as it turned out, the theory of infinite series converging on a limiting value. Russell himself, of course, was as well qualified as anyone to understand why no tobacco tins should be thrown up in celebration. Of Achilles' failure to catch the tortoise, why didn't he exercise the same caution over Saint Anselm? I suspect that he was an exaggeratedly fair-minded atheist, over-eager to be disillusioned if logic seemed to require it. Or perhaps the answer lies in something Russell himself wrote in 1946, long after he had rumbled the ontological argument. The real question is: Is there anything we can think of which, by the mere fact that we can think of it, Is shown to exist outside our thought. Every philosopher would like to say yes, because a philosopher's job is to find out things about the world by thinking rather than observing. If yes is the right answer, there is a bridge from pure thought to things. If not, not. My own feeling to the contrary would have been an automatic deep suspicion of any line of reasoning that reached such a significant conclusion. Without feeding in a single piece of data from the real world, perhaps that indicates no more than that I am a scientist rather than a philosopher. Philosophers down the centuries have indeed taken the ontological argument seriously, both for and against. The atheist philosopher J. L. Mackey gives a particularly clear discussion in *The Miracle of Theism*. 
I mean it as a compliment when I say that you could almost define a philosopher as someone who won't take common sense for an answer. The most definitive refutations of the ontological argument are usually attributed to the philosophers David Hume, 1711-76, and Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804. Kant identified the trick card up Anselm's sleeve as his slippery assumption that existence is more perfect than non-existence. The American philosopher Norman Malcolm put it like this, The doctrine that existence is a perfection is remarkably queer. It makes sense and is true to say that my future house will be a better one if it is insulated than if it is not insulated. But what could it mean to say that it will be a better house if it exists than if it does not? Another philosopher, the Australian Douglas Gasking, made the point with his ironic proof that God does not exist. Anselm's contemporary Gornilo had suggested a somewhat similar reductio. 1. The creation of the world is the most marvellous achievement imaginable. 2. The merit of an achievement is the product of a. its intrinsic quality, and b. the ability of its creator. 3. The greater the disability or handicap of the creator, the more impressive the achievement. 4. The most formidable handicap for a creator would be non-existence. 5. Therefore, if we suppose that the universe is the product of an existent creator, we can conceive a greater being, namely, one who created everything while not existing. 6. An existing God, therefore, would not be a being greater than which a greater cannot be conceived, because an even more formidable and incredible creator would be a God which did not exist. Ergo, 7. God does not exist. Needless to say, Gasking didn't really prove that God does not exist. By the same token, Anselm didn't prove that he does. The only difference is, Gasking was being funny on purpose. As he realized, the existence or non-existence of God is too big a question to be decided by dialectical prestidigitation. And I don't think the slippery use of existence as an indicator of perfection is the worst of the argument's problems. I've forgotten the details, but I once peaked a gathering of theologians and philosophers by adapting the ontological argument to prove that pigs can fly. They felt the need to resort to modal logic to prove that I was wrong. The ontological argument, like all a priori arguments for the existence of God, reminds me of the old man in Aldous Huxley's Point Counterpoint, who discovered a mathematical proof of the existence of God. You know the formula m over naught equals infinity, m being any positive number? Well, why not reduce the equation to a simpler form by multiplying both sides by naught? In which case, you have m equals infinity times naught. That is to say, that a positive number is the product of zero and infinity. Doesn't that demonstrate the creation of the universe by an infinite power out of nothing? Doesn't it? Or there is the notorious 18th century debate on the existence of God staged by Catherine the Great between Euler, the Swiss mathematician, and Diderot, the great encyclopedist of the Enlightenment. The pious Euler advanced upon the atheistic Diderot and in tones of the utmost conviction delivered his challenge. Monsieur, A plus B to the N over N equals X. Therefore God exists. Reply! Diderot was cowed into withdrawal and one version of the story has him withdrawing all the way back to France. Euler was employing what might be called the argument from blinding with science, in this case mathematics. David Mills, in Atheist Universe, transcribed the radio interview of himself by a religious spokesman who invoked the law of conservation of mass energy in a weirdly ineffectual attempt to blind with science. Since we're all composed of matter and energy... Doesn't that scientific principle lend credibility to a belief in eternal life? Mills replied more patiently and politely than I would have, for what the interviewer was saying, translated into English, was no more than, when we die, none of the atoms of our body and none of the energy are lost, therefore we are immortal. Even I, with my long experience, have never encountered wishful thinking as silly as that. I have, however, met many of the wonderful proofs collected at the richly comic webpage of over 300 proofs of God's existence. 
Here's a hilarious half dozen, beginning with proof number 36. Argument from incomplete devastation. A plane crashed, killing 143 passengers and crew, but one child survived with only third degree burns, therefore God exists. 37. Argument from possible worlds. If things had been different, then things would be different. That would be bad. Therefore, God exists. 38. Argument from sheer will. I do believe in God. I do believe in God. I do, I do, I do, I do believe in God. Therefore, God exists. 39. Argument from non-belief. The majority of the world's population are non-believers in Christianity. This is just what Satan intended. Therefore, God exists. 40. Argument from post-death experience. Person X died an atheist. He now realizes his mistake. Therefore, God exists. 41. Argument from emotional blackmail. God loves you. How could you be so heartless as not to believe in him? Therefore, God exists. The Argument from Beauty Another character in the Aldous Huxley novel just mentioned proved the existence of God by playing Beethoven's String Quartet No. 15 in A minor, Heiliger Dankgesang, on a gramophone. Unconvincing as that sounds, it does represent a popular strand of argument. I've given up counting the number of times I received the more or less truculent challenge, How do you account for Shakespeare, then? Substitute Schubert, Michelangelo, etc., to taste. The argument will be so familiar I needn't document it further, but the logic behind it is never spelled out, and the more you think about it, the more vacuous you realize it to be. Obviously, Beethoven's late quartets are sublime. So are Shakespeare's sonnets. They are sublime if God is there, and they are sublime if he isn't. They do not prove the existence of God, they prove the existence of Beethoven and of Shakespeare. A great conductor is credited with saying, if you have Mozart to listen to, why would you need God? I once was the guest of the week on the BBC radio show Desert Island Discs. You have to choose the eight records you would take with you if marooned on a desert island. Among my choices was Mache dich mein Herz herein, from Bach's St. Matthew Passion. The interviewer was unable to understand how I could choose religious music without being religious. You might as well say, how can you enjoy Wuthering Heights when you know perfectly well that Cathy and Heathcliff never really existed? But there is an additional point that I might have made, and which needs to be made whenever religion is given credit for, say, the Sistine Chapel or Raphael's Annunciation. Even great artists have to earn a living, and they will take commissions where they are to be had. I have no reason to doubt that Raphael and Michelangelo were Christians, it was pretty much the only option in their time, but the fact is almost incidental. Its enormous wealth had made the church the dominant patron of the arts. If history had worked out differently, and Michelangelo had been commissioned to paint a ceiling for a giant museum of science, mightn't he have produced something at least as inspirational as the Sistine Chapel? How sad that we shall never hear Beethoven's Mesozoic Symphony, or Mozart's opera The Expanding Universe. And what a shame that we are deprived of Haydn's evolution oratorio. But that does not stop us from enjoying his creation. To approach the argument from the other side, what if, as my wife chillingly suggests to me, Shakespeare had been obliged to work to commission from the church? We'd surely have lost Hamlet, King Lear, and Macbeth. And what would we have gained in return? Such stuff as dreams are made on? Dream on. If there is a logical argument linking the existence of great art to the existence of God, it is not spelled out by its proponents. It's simply assumed to be self-evident, which it most certainly is not. Maybe it is to be seen as yet another version of the argument from design. Schubert's musical brain is a wonder of improbability, even more so than the vertebrate eye. Or, more ignobly, perhaps it's a sort of jealousy of genius. How dare another human being make such beautiful music, poetry, art, when I can't? It must be God that did it. The Argument from Personal Experience One of the cleverer and more mature of my undergraduate contemporaries who was deeply religious went camping in the Scottish Isles. 
In the middle of the night, he and his girlfriend were woken in their tent by the voice of the devil, Satan himself. There could be no possible doubt. The voice was in every sense diabolical. My friend would never forget this horrifying experience, and it was one of the factors that later drove him to be ordained. My youthful self was impressed by his story, and I recounted it to a gathering of zoologists relaxing in the Rose and Crown Inn, Oxford. Two of them happened to be experienced ornithologists, and they roared with laughter. Manx sheer water! They shouted in delighted chorus. One of them added that the diabolical shrieks and cackles of this species have earned it in various parts of the world and various languages the local nickname "devil bird." Many people believe in God because they believe they have seen a vision of Him, or of an angel or a virgin in blue, with their own eyes, or He speaks to them inside their heads. This argument from personal experience is the one that is most convincing to those who claim to have had one, but it is the least convincing to anyone else and anyone knowledgeable about psychology. You say you have experienced God directly. Well, some people have experienced a pink elephant, but that probably doesn't impress you. Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, distinctly heard the voice of Jesus telling him to kill women, and he was locked up for life. George W. Bush says that God told him to invade Iraq. A pity God didn't vouchsafe him a revelation that there were no weapons of mass destruction. Individuals in asylums think they are Napoleon or Charlie Chaplin, or that the entire world is conspiring against them, or that they can broadcast their thoughts into other people's heads. We humour them, but don't take their internally revealed beliefs seriously, mostly because not many people share them. Religious experiences are different only in that the people who claim them are numerous. Sam Harris was not being overly cynical when he wrote in *The End of Faith*: "We have names for people who have many beliefs for which there is no rational justification. When their beliefs are extremely common, we call them religious. Otherwise, they are likely to be called mad, psychotic, or delusional. Clearly, there is sanity in numbers, and yet it is merely an accident of history." That it is considered normal in our society to believe that the Creator of the universe can hear your thoughts, while it is demonstrative of mental illness to believe that He is communicating with you by having the rain tap in Morse code on your bedroom window. And so, while religious people are not generally mad, their core beliefs absolutely are. I shall return to the subject of hallucinations in Chapter Ten. The human brain runs first-class simulation software. Our eyes don't present to our brains a faithful photograph of what is out there or an accurate movie of what is going on through time. Our brains construct a continuously updated model, updated by coded pulses chattering along the optic nerve, but constructed nevertheless. Optical illusions are vivid reminders of this. A major class of illusions, of which the Necker cube is an example. Arise because the sense data that the brain receives are compatible with two alternative models of reality. The brain, having no basis for choosing between them, alternates, and we experience a series of flips from one internal model to the other. The picture we are looking at appears almost literally to flip over and become something else. The simulation software in the brain is especially adept at constructing faces and voices. I have on my windowsill. A plastic mask of Einstein. When seen from the front, it looks like a solid face. Not surprisingly, what is surprising is that when seen from behind, the hollow side, it also looks like a solid face, and our perception of it is very odd indeed. As the viewer moves around, the face seems to follow, and not in the weak, unconvincing sense that the Mona Lisa's eyes are said to follow you. The hollow mask really, really looks as though it is moving. People who haven't previously seen the illusion gasp with amazement. Even stranger, if the mask is mounted on a slowly rotating turntable, it appears to turn in the correct direction when you are looking at the solid side, but in the opposite direction when the hollow side comes into view. The result is that when you watch the transition from one side to the other, the coming side appears to eat the going side. It is a stunning illusion, well worth going to some trouble to see. Sometimes you can get surprisingly close to the hollow face and still not see that it is really hollow. When you do see it, again there is a sudden flip which may be reversible. Why does it happen? 
There is no trick in the construction of the mask. Any hollow mask will do it. The trickery is all in the brain of the beholder. The internal simulating software receives data indicating the presence of a face, perhaps nothing more than a pair of eyes, a nose, and a mouth in approximately the right places. Having received these sketchy clues, the brain does the rest. The face simulation software kicks into action, and it constructs a fully solid model of a face, even though the reality presented to the eyes is a hollow mask. The illusion of rotation in the wrong direction comes about because it's quite hard, but if you think it through carefully, you will confirm it. Reverse rotation is the only way to make sense of the optical data when a hollow mask rotates while being perceived to be a solid mask. It's like the illusion of a rotating radar dish that you sometimes see at airports. Until the brain flips to the correct model of the radar dish, an incorrect model is seen rotating in the wrong direction, but in a weirdly cockeyed way. This is all just to demonstrate the formidable power of the brain's simulation software. It is well capable of constructing visions and visitations of the utmost veridical power. To simulate a ghost or an angel or a Virgin Mary would be child's play to software of this sophistication. And the same thing works for hearing. When we hear a sound, it is not faithfully transported up the auditory nerve and relayed to the brain as if by a high-fidelity Bang & Olufsen. As with vision, the brain constructs a sound model based upon continuously updated auditory nerve data. That is why we hear a trumpet blast as a single note, rather than as the composite of pure-tone harmonics that give it its brassy snarl. A clarinet playing the same note sounds woody, and an oboe sounds reedy because of different balances of harmonics. If you carefully manipulate a sound synthesizer to bring in the separate harmonics one by one, the brain hears them as a combination of pure tones for a short while until its simulation software gets it, and from then on we experience only a single note of pure trumpet or oboe or whatever it is. The vowels and consonants of speech are constructed in the brain in the same kind of way, and so, at another level, are higher-order phonemes and words. Once, as a child, I heard a ghost, a male voice murmuring as if in recitation or prayer. I could almost but not quite make out the words, which seemed to have a serious, solemn timbre. I'd been told stories of priest holes in ancient houses, and I was a little frightened, but I got out of bed and crept up on the source of the sound. As I got closer, it grew louder, and then suddenly it flipped inside my head. I was now close enough to discern what it really was. The wind, gusting through the keyhole, was creating sounds which the simulation software in my brain had used to construct a model of male speech, solemnly intoned. Had I been a more impressionable child, it is possible that I would have heard not just unintelligible speech, but particular words and even sentences. And had I been both impressionable and religiously brought up, I wonder what words the wind might have spoken. On another occasion, when I was about the same age, I saw a giant round face gazing with unspeakable malevolence out through the window of an otherwise ordinary house in a seaside village. In trepidation I approached until I was close enough to see what it really was, just a vaguely face-like pattern created by the chance fall of the curtains. The face itself and its evil mien had been constructed in my fearful child's brain. On the 11th of September 2001, pious people thought they saw the face of Satan in the smoke rising from the Twin Towers, a superstition backed by a photograph which was published on the Internet and widely circulated. Constructing models is something the human brain is very good at. When we are asleep, it is called dreaming. When we are awake, we call it imagination, or when it is exceptionally vivid, hallucination. As Chapter 10 will show, children who have imaginary friends sometimes see them clearly, exactly as if they were real. If we are gullible, we don't recognize hallucination or lucid dreaming for what it is, and we claim to have seen or heard a ghost or an angel or God, or, especially if we happen to be young, female and Catholic, the Virgin Mary. Such visions and manifestations are certainly not good grounds for believing that ghosts or angels 
gods or virgins, are actually there. On the face of it, mass visions, such as the report that 70,000 pilgrims at Fatima in Portugal in 1917 saw the sun tear itself from the heavens and come crashing down upon the multitude, are harder to write off. It is not easy to explain how 70,000 people could share the same hallucination. But it is even harder to accept that it really happened without the rest of the world outside Fatima seeing it too, and not just seeing it, but feeling it as the catastrophic destruction of the solar system, including acceleration forces sufficient to hurl everybody into space. David Hume's pithy test for a miracle comes irresistibly to mind. No testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavours to establish. It may seem improbable that 70,000 people could simultaneously be deluded or could simultaneously collude in a mass lie or that history is mistaken in recording that 70,000 people claimed to see the sun dance or that they all simultaneously saw a mirage. They had been persuaded to stare at the sun, which can't have done much for their eyesight. But any of those apparent improbabilities is far more probable than the alternative, that the Earth was suddenly yanked sideways in its orbit and the solar system destroyed, with nobody outside Fatima noticing. I mean, Portugal is not that isolated. Although, admittedly, my parents once stayed in a Paris hotel called L'Hôtel de l'Univers et du Portugal. That is really all that needs to be said about personal experiences of gods or other religious phenomena. If you've had such an experience, you may well find yourself believing firmly that it was real. But don't expect the rest of us to take your word for it, especially if we have the slightest familiarity with the brain and its powerful workings. The Argument from Scripture There are still some people who are persuaded by scriptural evidence to believe in God. A common argument attributed, among others, to C.S. Lewis, who should have known better, states that, since Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, he must have been either right or else insane or a liar, mad, bad, or God, or, with artless alliteration, lunatic, liar, or lord. The historical evidence that Jesus claimed any sort of divine status is minimal, but even if that evidence were good, the trilemma on offer would be ludicrously inadequate. A fourth possibility, almost too obvious to need mentioning, is that Jesus was honestly mistaken. Plenty of people are. In any case, as I said, there is no good historical evidence that he ever thought he was divine. The fact that something is written down is persuasive to people not used to asking questions like, who wrote it and when? How did they know what to write? Did they in their time really mean what we in our time understand them to be saying? Were they unbiased observers, or did they have an agenda that coloured their writing? Ever since the 19th century, scholarly theologians have made an overwhelming case that the Gospels are not reliable accounts of what happened in the history of the real world. All were written long after the death of Jesus, and also after the epistles of Paul, which mention almost none of the alleged facts of Jesus' life. All were then copied and recopied through many different Chinese Whispers Generations, see Chapter 5, by fallible scribes who in any case had their own religious agendas. A good example of the colouring by religious agendas is the whole heartwarming legend of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, followed by Herod's massacre of the innocents. When the Gospels were written many years after Jesus' death, nobody knew where he was born. But an Old Testament prophecy, Micah 5.2, had led Jews to expect that the long-awaited Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. In the light of this prophecy, John's Gospel specifically remarks that his followers were surprised that he was not born in Bethlehem. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the Scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? Matthew and Luke handle the problem differently by deciding that Jesus must have been born in Bethlehem after all. But they get him there by different routes. Matthew has Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem all along, moving to Nazareth only long after the birth of Jesus, on their return from Egypt, where they fled from King Herod and the massacre of the innocents. Luke, by contrast, 
acknowledges that Mary and Joseph lived in Nazareth before Jesus was born. So how to get them to Bethlehem at the crucial moment in order to fulfill the prophecy? Luke says that in the time when Cyrenius, Quirinius, was governor of Syria, Caesar Augustus decreed a census for taxation purposes, and everybody had to go to his own city. Joseph was of the house and lineage of David, and therefore he had to go to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. That must have seemed like a good solution, except that historically it is complete nonsense, as A. N. Wilson in Jesus and Robin Lane Fox in The Unauthorized Version, among others, have pointed out. David, if he existed, lived nearly a thousand years before Mary and Joseph. Why on earth would the Romans have required Joseph to go to the city where a remote ancestor had lived a millennium earlier? It is as though I were required to specify, say, Ashby de la Zouche as my hometown on a census form, if it happened that I could trace my ancestry back to the Seigneur de Dacaine, who came over with William the Conqueror and settled there. Moreover, Luke screws up his dating by tactlessly mentioning events that historians are capable of independently checking. There was indeed a census under Governor Quirinius, a local census, not one decreed by Caesar Augustus for the empire as a whole, but it happened too late, in A.D. 6, long after Herod's death. Lane Fox concludes that Luke's story is historically impossible and internally incoherent, but he sympathizes with Luke's plight and his desire to fulfill the prophecy of Micah. In the December 2004 issue of Free Inquiry, Tom Flynn, the editor of that excellent magazine, assembled a collection of articles documenting the contradictions and gaping holes in the well-loved Christmas story. Flynn himself lists the many contradictions between Matthew and Luke, the only two evangelists who treat the birth of Jesus at all. Robert Gillooly shows how all the essential features of the Jesus legend, including the star in the east, the virgin birth, the veneration of the baby by kings, the miracles, the execution, the resurrection, and the ascension, are borrowed, every last one of them, from other religions already in existence in the Mediterranean and Near East region. Flynn suggests that Matthew's desire to fulfill messianic prophecies, descent from David, birth in Bethlehem, for the benefit of Jewish readers, came into headlong collision with Luke's desire to adapt Christianity for the Gentiles, and hence to press the familiar hot buttons of pagan Hellenistic religions, virgin birth, worship by kings, etc. The resulting contradictions are glaring, but consistently overlooked by the faithful. Sophisticated Christians do not need George Gershwin to convince them that the things that you're liable to read in the Bible, it ain't necessarily so. But there are many unsophisticated Christians out there who think it absolutely is necessarily so, who take the Bible very seriously indeed as a literal and accurate record of history and hence as evidence supporting their religious beliefs. Do these people never open the book that they believe is the literal truth? Why don't they notice those glaring contradictions? Shouldn't a literalist worry about the fact that Matthew traces Joseph's descent from King David via 28 intermediate generations, while Luke has 41 generations? Worse, there is almost no overlap in the names on the two lists. In any case, if Jesus really was born of a virgin, Joseph's ancestry is irrelevant and cannot be used to fulfill, on Jesus' behalf, the Old Testament prophecy that the Messiah should be descended from David. The American biblical scholar Bart Ehrman, in a book whose subtitle is The Story Behind Who Changed the New Testament and Why, unfolds the huge uncertainty befogging the New Testament texts. In the introduction to the book, Professor Ehrman movingly charts his personal educational journey from Bible-believing fundamentalist to thoughtful skeptic, a journey driven by his dawning realization of the massive fallibility of the Scriptures. Significantly, as he moved up the hierarchy of American universities from rock bottom at the Moody Bible Institute through Wheaton College, a little bit higher on the scale but still the alma mater of Billy Graham, to Princeton in the world-beating class at the top, he was at every stage warned that he would have trouble maintaining his fundamentalist Christianity in the face of dangerous progressivism. So it proved, and we, his readers, are the beneficiaries. 
Other refreshingly iconoclastic books of biblical criticism are Robin Lane Fox's The Unauthorized Version, already mentioned, and Jack Berliner Blau's The Secular Bible, Why Non-Believers Must Take Religion Seriously. The four Gospels that made it into the official canon were chosen, more or less arbitrarily, out of a larger sample of at least a dozen, including the Gospels of Thomas, Peter, Nicodemus, Philip, Bartholomew, and Mary Magdalene. It is these additional Gospels that Thomas Jefferson was referring to in his letter to his nephew. I forgot to observe, when speaking of the New Testament, that you should read all the histories of Christ, as well of those whom a council of ecclesiastics have decided for us to be pseudo-evangelists, as those they named evangelists, because these pseudo-evangelists pretended to inspiration as much as the others, and you are to judge their pretensions by your own reason, and not by the reason of those ecclesiastics. The Gospels that didn't make it were omitted by those ecclesiastics, perhaps because they included stories that were even more embarrassingly implausible than those in the four canonical ones. The Gospel of Thomas, for example, has numerous anecdotes about the child Jesus abusing his magical powers in the manner of a mischievous fairy, impishly transforming his playmates into goats, or turning mud into sparrows, or giving his father a hand with the carpentry by miraculously lengthening a piece of wood. A. N. Wilson, in his biography of Jesus, casts doubt on the story that Joseph was a carpenter at all. The Greek word tekton does indeed mean carpenter, but it was translated from the Aramaic word nagar, which could mean craftsman or learned man. This is one of several constructive mistranslations that bedevil the Bible, the most famous being the mistranslation of Isaiah's Hebrew for young woman, Alma, into the Greek for virgin, Parthenos. An easy mistake to make, think of the English words maid and maiden to see how it might have happened. This one translator's slip was to be wildly inflated and give rise to the whole preposterous legend of Jesus' mother being a virgin. The only competitor for the title of champion constructive mistranslation of all time also concerns virgins. Ibn Warak has hilariously argued that in the famous promise of 72 virgins to every Muslim martyr, virgins is a mistranslation of white raisins of crystal clarity. Now, if only that had been more widely known, how many innocent victims of suicide missions might have been saved? It will be said that nobody believes crude miracle stories such as those in the Gospel of Thomas anyway. But there is no more and no less reason to believe the four canonical Gospels all have the status of legends, as factually dubious as the stories of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. Most of what the four canonical Gospels share is derived from a common source, either Mark's Gospel or a lost work of which Mark is the earliest extant descendant. Nobody knows who the four evangelists were, but they almost certainly never met Jesus personally. Much of what they wrote was in no sense an honest attempt at history, but was simply rehashed from the Old Testament, because the gospel makers were devoutly convinced that the life of Jesus must fulfill Old Testament prophecies. It is even possible to mount a serious, though not widely supported, historical case that Jesus never lived at all, as has been done by, among others, Professor G. A. Wells of the University of London in a number of books, including did Jesus exist? Although Jesus probably did exist, reputable biblical scholars do not in general regard the New Testament, and obviously not the Old Testament, as a reliable record of what actually happened in history, and I shall not consider the Bible further as evidence for any kind of deity. In the far-sighted words of Thomas Jefferson, writing to his predecessor John Adams, The day will come when the mystical generation of Jesus, by the supreme being as his father, in the womb of a virgin, will be classed with the fable of the generation of Minerva in the brain of Jupiter. Dan Brown's novel, The Da Vinci Code, and the film made from it, are arousing huge controversy in church circles. Christians are encouraged to boycott the film and picket cinemas that show it. It is indeed fabricated from start to finish, invented, made-up fiction. In that respect, it is exactly like the Gospels. The only difference between the Da Vinci Code and the Gospels is that the Gospels are ancient fiction 
while the Da Vinci Code is modern fiction. The Argument from Admired Religious Scientists The immense majority of intellectually eminent men disbelieve in Christian religion, but they conceal the fact in public because they are afraid of losing their incomes. Bertrand Russell Newton was religious. Who are you to set yourself up as superior to Newton, Galileo, Kepler, etc.? If God was good enough for the likes of them, just who do you think you are? Not that it makes much difference to such an already bad argument. Some apologists even add the name of Darwin, about whom persistent but demonstrably false rumors of a deathbed conversion continually come around like a bad smell, ever since they were deliberately started by a certain Lady Hope, who spun a touching yarn of Darwin resting against the pillows in the evening light, leafing through the New Testament and confessing that evolution was all wrong. Even I have been honoured by prophecies of deathbed conversion. Indeed, they recur with monotonous regularity, each repetition trailing dewy, fresh clouds of illusion that it is witty and the first. I should probably take the precaution of installing a tape recorder to protect my posthumous reputation. Lala Ward adds, Why mess around with deathbeds? If you're going to sell out, do it in good time to win the Templeton Prize and blame it on senility. In this section, I shall concentrate mostly on scientists because, for reasons that are perhaps not too hard to imagine, those who trot out the names of admired individuals as religious exemplars very commonly choose scientists. Newton did indeed claim to be religious. So did almost everybody until the 19th century, when there was less social and judicial pressure than in earlier centuries to profess religion and more scientific support for abandoning it. There have been exceptions, of course, in both directions. Even before Darwin, not everybody was a believer, as James Hort shows in his 2,000 Years of Disbelief, famous people with the courage to doubt. And some distinguished scientists went on believing after Darwin. We have no reason to doubt Michael Faraday's sincerity as a Christian, even after the time when he must have known of Darwin's work. He was a member of the Sandemanian sect, which believed past tense because they are now virtually extinct, in a literal interpretation of the Bible, ritually washed the feet of newly inducted members and drew lots to determine God's will. Faraday became an elder in 1860, the year after The Origin of Species was published, and he died a Sandemanian in 1867. The experimentalist Faraday's theorist counterpart, James Clark Maxwell, was an equally devout Christian. So was that other pillar of 19th century British physics, William Thompson, Lord Kelvin, who tried to demonstrate that evolution was ruled out for lack of time. That great thermodynamicist's erroneous datings assumed that the sun was some kind of fire, burning fuel, which would have to run out in tens of millions of years, not thousands of millions. Kelvin obviously could not be expected to know about nuclear energy. Pleasingly, at the British Association meeting of 1903, it fell to Sir George Darwin, Charles's second son, to vindicate his unknighted father by invoking the Curie's discovery of radium and confound the earlier estimate of the still-living Lord Kelvin. Great scientists who professed religion become harder to find through the 20th century, but they're not particularly rare. I suspect that most of the more recent ones are religious only in the Einsteinian sense, which... I argued in Chapter 1, is a misuse of the word. Nevertheless, there are some genuine specimens of good scientists who are sincerely religious in the full traditional sense. Among contemporary British scientists, the same three names crop up with the likeable familiarity of senior partners in a firm of Dickensian lawyers, Peacock, Stannard, and Polkinghorn. All three have either won the Templeton Prize or are on the Templeton Board of Trustees. After amicable discussions with all of them, both in public and in private, I remain baffled, not so much by their belief in a cosmic lawgiver of some kind, as by their belief in the details of the Christian religion, resurrection, forgiveness of sins and all. There are some corresponding examples in the United States, for example, Francis Collins, administrative head of the American branch of the official Human Genome Project. But, as in Britain, they stand out for their rarity, and are a subject of amused bafflement to their peers in the academic community.
In 1996, in the gardens of his old college at Cambridge, Clare, I interviewed my friend Jim Watson, founding genius of the Human Genome Project, for a BBC television documentary that I was making on Gregor Mendel, founding genius of genetics itself. Mendel, of course, was a religious man, an Augustinian monk, but that was in the 19th century when becoming a monk was the easiest way for the young Mendel to pursue his science. For him, it was the equivalent of a research grant. I asked Watson whether he knew many religious scientists today. He replied, Virtually none. Occasionally I meet them, and I'm a bit embarrassed, because, you know, I can't believe anyone accepts truth by revelation. Francis Crick, Watson's co-founder of the whole molecular genetics revolution, resigned his fellowship at Churchill College, Cambridge, because of the college's decision to build a chapel at the behest of a benefactor. In my interview with Watson at Clare, I conscientiously put it to him that, unlike him and Crick, some people see no conflict between science and religion, because they claim science is about how things work, and religion is about what it is all for. Watson retorted, Well, I don't think we're for anything. We're just products of evolution. You can say, Gee, your life must be pretty bleak if you don't think there's a purpose. But I'm anticipating having a good lunch. We did have a good lunch, too. The efforts of apologists to find genuinely distinguished modern scientists who are religious have an air of desperation, generating the unmistakably hollow sound of bottoms of barrels being scraped. The only website I could find that claimed to list Nobel Prize-winning scientific Christians came up with six out of a total of several hundred scientific Nobelists. Of these six, it turned out that four were not Nobel Prize winners at all, and at least one, to my certain knowledge, is a non-believer who attends church for purely social reasons. A more systematic study by Benjamin Bight Halami found that among Nobel Prize laureates in the sciences, as well as those in literature, there was a remarkable degree of irreligiosity as compared to the populations they came from. A study in the leading journal Nature by Larson and Whittam in 1998 showed that of those American scientists considered eminent enough by their peers to have been elected to the National Academy of Sciences, equivalent to being a fellow of the Royal Society in Britain, only about 7% believe in a personal God. This overwhelming preponderance of atheists is almost the exact opposite of the profile of the American population at large, of whom more than 90% are believers in some sort of supernatural being. The figure for less eminent scientists, not elected to the National Academy, is intermediate. As with the more distinguished sample, religious believers are in a minority, but a less dramatic minority of about 40%. It is completely as I would expect that American scientists are less religious than the American public generally, and that the most distinguished scientists are the least religious of all. What is remarkable is the polar opposition between the religiosity of the American public at large and the atheism of the intellectual elite. It is faintly amusing that the leading creationist website called Answers in Genesis cites the Larson and Whittam study not in evidence that there might be something wrong with religion, but as a weapon in their internal battle against those rival religious apologists who claim that evolution is compatible with religion. Under the headline, National Academy of Science is Godless to the Core, Answers in Genesis is pleased to quote the concluding paragraph of Larson and Whittam's letter to the editor of Nature. As we compiled our findings, the NAS, National Academy of Sciences, issued a booklet encouraging the teaching of evolution in public schools, an ongoing source of friction between the scientific community and some conservative Christians in the United States. The booklet assures readers, whether God exists or not, is a question about which science is neutral. NAS President Bruce Albert said, There are many very outstanding members of this academy who are very religious people, people who believe in evolution, many of them biologists. Our survey suggests otherwise. Albert's, one feels, embraced NOMA for the reasons I discussed in the Neville Chamberlain School of Evolutionists. Answers in Genesis has a very different agenda. The equivalent of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences in Britain and the Commonwealth, including Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, 
Pakistan, Anglophone Africa, etc., is the Royal Society. As this book goes to press, my colleagues R. Elizabeth Cornwall and Michael Stirrett are writing up their comparable but more thorough research on the religious opinions of the Fellows of the Royal Society, FRS. The author's conclusions will be published in full later, but they have kindly allowed me to quote preliminary results here. They used a standard technique for scaling opinion, the liquor type seven-point scale. All 1,074 Fellows of the Royal Society who possess an email address, the great majority, were polled, and about 23% responded, a good figure for this kind of study. They were offered various propositions, for example, I believe in a personal God, that is, one who takes an interest in individuals, hears and answers prayers, is concerned with sin and transgressions, and passes judgment. For each such proposition, they were invited to choose a number from one, strong disagreement, to seven, strong agreement. It is a little hard to compare the results directly with the Larson and Whittam study, because Larson and Whittam offered their academicians only a three-point scale, not a seven-point scale, but the overall trend is the same. The overwhelming majority of FRS, like the overwhelming majority of U.S. academicians, are atheists. Only 3.3% of the fellows agreed strongly with the statement that a personal God exists, i.e. chose seven on the scale, while 78.8% strongly disagreed, i.e. chose one on the scale. If you define believers as those who chose six or seven, and if you define unbelievers as those who chose one or two, there were a massive 213 unbelievers and a mere 12 believers. Like Larson and Whittam, and as also noted by Bight Halami and Argyle, Cornwall and Sterrett found a small but significant tendency for biological scientists to be even more atheistic than physical scientists. For the details and all the rest of their very interesting conclusions, please refer to their own paper when it is published. Moving on from the elite scientists of the National Academy and the Royal Society, is there any evidence that, in the population at large, atheists are likely to be drawn from among the better educated and more intelligent? Several research studies have been published on the statistical relationship between religiosity and educational level, or religiosity and IQ. Michael Shermer in How We Believe, The Search for God in an Age of Science describes a large survey of randomly chosen Americans that he and his colleague Frank Soloway carried out. Among their many interesting results was the discovery that religiosity is indeed negatively correlated with education. More highly educated people are less likely to be religious. Religiosity is also negatively correlated with interest in science and, strongly, with political liberalism. None of this is surprising, nor is the fact that there is a positive correlation between religiosity and parents' religiosity. Sociologists studying British children have found that only about one in twelve break away from their parents' religious beliefs. As you might expect, different researchers measure things in different ways, so it is hard to compare different studies. Meta-analysis is the technique whereby an investigator looks at all the research papers that have been published on a topic and counts up the number of papers that have concluded one thing versus the number that have concluded something else. On the subject of religion and IQ, a meta-analysis was published by Paul Bell in Mensa magazine in 2002. Mensa is the society of individuals with a high IQ, and their journal, not surprisingly, includes articles on the one thing that draws them together. Bell concluded... Of 43 studies carried out since 1927 on the relationship between religious belief and one's intelligence and or educational level, all but four found an inverse connection. That is, the higher one's intelligence or education level, the less one is likely to be religious or hold beliefs of any kind. A meta-analysis is almost bound to be less specific than any one of the studies that contributed to it. It would be nice to have more studies along these lines, as well as more studies of the members of elite bodies, such as other national academies, and winners of major prizes and medals, such as the Nobel, the Crawford, the Field, the Kyoto, the Cosmos, and others. Future editions of this book should include such data. A reasonable conclusion from existing studies 
is that religious apologists might be wise to keep quieter than they habitually do on the subject of admired role models, at least where scientists are concerned. Pascal's Wager The great French mathematician Blaise Pascal reckoned that however long the odds against God's existence might be, there is an even larger asymmetry in the penalty for guessing wrong. You'd better believe in God, because if you are right, you stand to gain eternal bliss, and if you are wrong, it won't make any difference anyway. On the other hand, if you don't believe in God and you turn out to be wrong, you get eternal damnation, whereas if you are right, it makes no difference. On the face of it, the decision is a no-brainer. Believe in God. There is something distinctly odd about the argument, however. Believing is not something you can decide to do as a matter of policy. At least it's not something I can decide to do as an act of will. I can decide to go to church, and I can decide to recite the Nicene Creed, and I can decide to swear on a stack of Bibles that I believe every word inside them. But none of that can make me actually believe it if I don't. Pascal's wager could only ever be an argument for feigning belief in God. And the God that you claim to believe in had better not be of the omniscient kind, or he'd see through the deception. The ludicrous idea that believing is something you can decide to do is deliciously mocked by Douglas Adams in Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, where we meet the robotic electric monk, a labor-saving device that you buy to do your believing for you. The deluxe model is advertised as capable of believing things they wouldn't believe in Salt Lake City. But why, in any case, do we so readily accept the idea that the one thing you must do if you want to please God is believe in him? What's so special about believing? Isn't it just as likely that God would reward kindness or generosity or humility or sincerity? What if God is a scientist who regards honest seeking after truth as the supreme virtue? Indeed, wouldn't the designer of the universe have to be a scientist? Bertrand Russell was asked what he would say if he died and found himself confronted by God, demanding to know why Russell had not believed in him. Not enough evidence, God. Not enough evidence, was Russell's immortal reply. Mightn't God respect Russell for his courageous scepticism, let alone for the courageous pacifism that landed him in prison in the First World War, far more than he would respect Pascal for his cowardly bet-hedging. And while we cannot know which way God would jump, we don't need to know in order to refute Pascal's wager. We are talking about a bet, remember, and Pascal wasn't claiming that his wager enjoyed anything but very long odds. Would you bet on God's valuing dishonestly faked belief, or even honest belief, over honest scepticism? Then again, suppose the God who confronts you when you die turns out to be Baal, and suppose Baal is just as jealous as his old rival Yahweh was said to be. Mightn't Pascal have been better off wagering on no God at all, rather than on the wrong God? Indeed, doesn't the sheer number of potential gods and goddesses on whom one might bet vitiate Pascal's whole logic? Pascal was probably joking when he promoted his wager, just as I'm joking in my dismissal of it. But I have encountered people, for example, in the question session after a lecture, who have seriously advanced Pascal's wager as an argument in favour of believing in God. So it was right to give it a brief airing here. Is it possible, finally, to argue for a sort of anti-Pascal wager? Suppose we grant that there is indeed some small chance that God exists. Nevertheless, it could be said that you will lead a better, fuller life if you bet on his not existing than if you bet on his existing, and therefore squander your precious time on worshipping him, sacrificing to him, fighting and dying for him, etc. I won't pursue the question here, but readers might like to bear it in mind when we come to later chapters on the evil consequences that can flow from religious belief and observance. Bayesian Arguments I think the oddest case I have seen attempted for the existence of God is the Bayesian argument recently put forward by Stephen Unwin in The Probability of God. I hesitated before including this argument, which is both weaker and less hallowed by antiquity than others. Unwin's book, however, received considerable journalistic attention when it was published in 2003, and it does give the opportunity 
to bring some explanatory threads together. I have some sympathy with his aims because, as argued in Chapter 2, I believe the existence of God as a scientific hypothesis is, at least in principle, investigable. Also, Unwin's quixotic attempt to put a number on the probability is quite agreeably funny. The book's subtitle, A Simple Calculation That Proves the Ultimate Truth, has all the hallmarks of a late edition by the publisher, because such overweening confidence is not to be found in Unwin's text. The book is better seen as a how-to manual, a sort of Bayes' theorem for dummies, using the existence of God as a semi-facetious case study. Unwin could equally well have used a hypothetical murder as his test case to demonstrate Bayes' theorem. The detective marshals the evidence. The fingerprints on the revolver point to Mrs. Peacock. Quantify that suspicion by slapping a numerical likelihood on her. However, Professor Plum had a motive to frame her. Reduce the suspicion of Mrs. Peacock by a corresponding numerical value. The forensic evidence suggests a 70% likelihood that the revolver was fired accurately from a long distance, which argues for a culprit with military training. Quantify our raised suspicion of Colonel Mustard. The Reverend Green has the most plausible motive for murder. Increase our numerical assessment of his likelihood. But the long blonde hair on the victim's jacket could only belong to Miss Scarlet and so on. A mix of more or less subjectively judged likelihoods churns around in the detective's mind, pulling him in different directions. Bayes' theorem is supposed to help him to a conclusion. It is a mathematical engine for combining many estimated likelihoods and coming up with a final verdict which bears its own quantitative estimate of likelihood. But of course that final estimate can only be as good as the original numbers fed in. These are usually subjectively judged, with all the doubts that inevitably flow from that. The Geigo principle, garbage in, garbage out, is applicable here, and in the case of Unwin's God example, applicable is too mild a word. Unwin is a risk management consultant who carries a torch for Bayesian inference as against rival statistical methods. He illustrates Bayes' theorem by taking on not a murder, but the biggest test case of all, the existence of God. The plan is to start with complete uncertainty, which he chooses to quantify by assigning the existence and non-existence of God a 50% starting likelihood each. Then he lists six facts that might bear on the matter, puts a numerical weighting on each, feeds the six numbers into the engine of Bayes' theorem, and sees what number pops out. The trouble is that, to repeat, the six weightings are not measured quantities, but simply Stephen Unwin's own personal judgments, turned into numbers for the sake of the exercise. The six facts are... 1. We have a sense of goodness. 2. People do evil things. Hitler, Stalin, Saddam Hussein. 3. Nature does evil things. Earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes. 4. There might be minor miracles. I lost my keys and found them again. Five, there might be major miracles. Jesus might have risen from the dead. Six, people have religious experiences. For what it is worth, nothing in my opinion, at the end of a ding-dong Bayesian race in which God surges ahead in the betting, then drops way back, then claws his way up to the 50% mark from which he started, he finally ends up enjoying, in Unwin's estimation, a 67% likelihood of existing. Unwin then decides that his Bayesian verdict of 67% isn't high enough, so he takes the bizarre step of boosting it to 95% by an emergency injection of faith. It sounds like a joke, but that really is how he proceeds. I wish I could say how he justifies it, but there really is nothing to say. I have met this kind of absurdity elsewhere, when I've challenged religious but otherwise intelligent scientists to justify their belief, given their admission that there is no evidence. I admit that there's no evidence. There's a reason why it's called faith. This last sentence uttered with almost truculent conviction, and no hint of apology or defensiveness. Surprisingly, Unwin's list of six statements does not include the argument from design, nor any of Aquinas's five proofs, nor any of the various ontological arguments. 
He has no truck with them. They don't contribute even a minor fillip to his numerical estimate of God's likelihood. He discusses them, and as a good statistician, dismisses them as empty. I think this is to his credit, although his reason for discounting the design argument is different from mine. But the arguments that he does admit through his Bayesian door are, it seems to me, just as weak. That is only to say that the subjective likelihood weightings I would give to them are different from his, and who cares about subjective judgments anyway? He thinks the fact that we have a sense of right and wrong counts strongly in God's favour, whereas I don't see that it should really shift him in either direction from his initial prior expectation. Chapter 6 and 7 will show that there is no good case to be made for our possession of a sense of right and wrong having any clear connection with the existence of a supernatural deity. As in the case of our ability to appreciate a Beethoven quartet, our sense of goodness, though not necessarily our inducement to follow it, would be the way it is with a god and without a god. On the other hand, Unwin thinks the existence of evil, especially in natural catastrophes such as earthquakes and tsunamis, counts strongly against the likelihood that God exists. Here Unwin's judgment departs from mine. I still think it has no bearing on the matter, but goes along with many uncomfortable theologians. The Odyssey, the vindication of divine providence in the face of the existence of evil, keeps theologians awake at night. The authoritative Oxford companion to philosophy gives the problem of evil as the most powerful objection to traditional theism. But it is an argument only against the existence of a good God. Goodness is no part of the definition of the God hypothesis, merely a desirable add-on. Admittedly, people of a theological bent are often chronically incapable of distinguishing what is true from what they'd like to be true. But for a more sophisticated believer in some kind of supernatural intelligence, it is childishly easy to overcome the problem of evil. Simply postulate a nasty God, such as the one who stalks every page of the Old Testament. Or if you don't like that, invent a separate evil God, call him Satan, and blame his cosmic battle against the good God for the evil in the world. Or, a more sophisticated solution, postulate a God with grander things to do than fuss about human distress or a God who is not indifferent to suffering, but regards it as the price that has to be paid for free will in an orderly, lawful cosmos. Theologians can be found buying into all these rationalizations. For these reasons, if I were redoing Unwin's Bayesian exercise, neither the problem of evil nor moral considerations in general would shift me far one way or the other from the null hypothesis, Unwin's 50%. But I don't want to argue the point because in any case, I can't get excited about personal opinions, whether Unwin's or mine. There is a much more powerful argument which does not depend upon subjective judgment, and it is the argument from improbability. It really does transport us dramatically away from 50% agnosticism, far towards the extreme of theism, in the view of many theists, far towards the extreme of atheism, in my view. I have alluded to it several times already. The whole argument turns on the familiar question, who made God, which most thinking people discover for themselves. A design funniest, most open-minded, wittiest, tallest, and possibly only convert. I hope this book might have made you laugh, though not as much as you made me. That scientifically savvy philosopher Daniel Dennett pointed out Evolution does the same thing for our sense of time not surprisingly since it works on the geological timescale. But Darwinian evolution, specifically natural selection, does something more. It shatters the illusion of design within the domain of biology and teaches us to be suspicious of any kind of design hypothesis in physics and cosmology as well. I think the physicist Leonard Susskind had this in mind when he wrote, I'm not an historian, but I'll venture an opinion. Modern cosmology really began with Darwin and Wallace. Unlike anyone before them, they provided explanations of our existence that completely rejected supernatural agents. Darwin and Wallace set a standard not only for the life, but for the moment I want to continue demonstrating the problem that any theory of life must solve, the problem of how to escape from chance. Turning Watchtower's page, we find the wonderful plant known as Dutchman's Pipe, 
Aristolochia trilobata, all of whose parts seem elegantly designed to trap insects, cover them with pollen, and send them on their way to another Dutchman's pipe. The intricate elegance of the flower moves Watchtower to ask, Did all of this happen by chance, or did it happen by intelligent design? Once again, no, of course it didn't happen by chance. Once again, intelligent design is not the proper alternative to chance. Natural selection is not only a parsimonious, plausible and elegant solution, it is the only workable alternative to chance that has ever been suggested. Intelligent design suffers from exactly the same objection as chance. It is simply not a plausible solution to the riddle of statistical improbability. And the higher the improbability, the more implausible intelligent design becomes. Seen clearly, intelligent design will turn out to be a redoubling of the problem. Once again, this is because the designer himself, herself, itself, immediately raises the bigger problem of his own origin. Any entity capable of intelligently designing something as improbable as a Dutchman's pipe, or a universe, would have to be even more improbable than a Dutchman's pipe. Far from terminating the vicious regress, God aggravates it with a vengeance. Turn another watchtower page for an eloquent account of the giant redwood, Sequoia dendron giganteum, a tree for which I have a special affection because I have one in my garden, a mere baby scarcely more than a century old, but still the tallest tree in the neighborhood. A puny man standing at a sequoia's base can only gaze upward in silent awe at its massive grandeur. Does it make sense to believe that the shaping of this majestic giant and of the tiny seed that packages it was not by design? Yet again, if you think the only alternative to design is chance, then no, it does not make sense. But again, the authors omit all mention of the real alternative, natural selection, either because they genuinely don't understand it, or because they don't want to. The process by which plants, whether tiny pimpernels or massive wellingtonias, acquire the energy to build themselves is photosynthesis. Watchtower again. There are about 70 separate chemical reactions involved in photosynthesis, one biologist said. It is truly a miraculous event. Green plants have been called nature's factories, beautiful, quiet, non-polluting, producing oxygen, recycling water and feeding the world. Did they just happen by chance? Is that truly believable? No, it is not believable. But the repetition of example after example gets us nowhere. Creationists long to the problem of statistical improbability, because one of them is the problem and the other one regresses to it. Natural selection is a real solution. It is the only workable solution that has ever been suggested. And it is not only a workable solution, it is a solution of stunning elegance and power. What is it that makes natural selection succeed as a solution to the problem of improbability, where chance and design both fail at the starting gate? The answer is that natural selection is a cumulative process, which breaks the problem of improbability up into small pieces. Each of the small pieces is slightly improbable, but not prohibitively so. When large numbers of these slightly improbable events are stacked up in C on the summit, sits a complex device such as an eye or a bacterial flagella motor. The absurd notion that such complexity could spontaneously self-assemble is symbolized by leaping from the foot of the cliff to the top in one bound. Evolution, by contrast, goes around the back of the mountain and creeps up the gentle slope to the summit, easy. The principle of climbing the gentle slope as opposed to leaping up the precipice is so simple one is tempted to marvel that it took so long for a Darwin to arrive on the scene and discover it. By the time he did, nearly three centuries had elapsed since Newton's Annus Mirabilis of discovery, although his achievement seems on the face of it harder than Darwin's. Another favorite metaphor for extreme improbability is the combination lock on a bank vault. Theoretically, a bank robber could get lucky and hit upon the right combination of numbers by chance. In practice, the bank's combination lock is designed with enough improbability to make this tantamount to impossible, almost as unlikely as Fred Hoyle's Boeing 747. 
But imagine a badly designed combination lock that gave out little hints progressively, the equivalent of the getting warmer of children playing hunt the slipper. Suppose that when each one of the dials approaches its correct setting, the vault door opens another chink and a dribble of money trickles out. The burglar would home in on the jackpot in no time. Creationists who attempt to deploy the argument from improbability in their favor always assume that biological adaptation is a question of the jackpot or nothing. Another name for the jackpot or nothing fallacy is irreducible complexity, I.C. Either the I sees or it doesn't. Either the wing flies or it doesn't. There are assumed to be no useful intermediates, but this is simply wrong. Such intermediates abound in practice, which is exactly what we should expect in theory. The combination lock of life is a getting warmer, getting cooler, getting warmer, hunt the slipper device. Real life seeks the gentle slopes at the back of Mount Improbable, while creationists are blind to all but the daunting precipice at the front. Darwin devoted an entire chapter of The Origin of Species to difficulties on the theory of descent with modification. And it is fair to say that this brief chapter anticipated and disposed of every single one of the alleged difficulties that have since been proposed right up to the present day. The most formidable difficulties are Darwin's organs of extreme perfection and complication, sometimes erroneously described as irreducibly complex. Darwin singled out the eye as posing a particularly challenging problem. To suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. Creationists gleefully quote this sentence again and again. Needless to say, they never quote what follows. Darwin's fulsomely free confession turned out to be a rhetorical device. He was drawing his opponents towards him so that his punch, when it came, struck the harder. The punch, of course, was Darwin's effortless explanation of exactly how the eye evolved by gradual degrees. Darwin may not have used the phrase irreducible complexity or the smooth gradient up Mount Improbable, but he clearly understood the principle of both. What is the use of half an eye and what is the use of half a wing are both instances of the argument from irreducible complexity. A functioning unit is said to be irreducibly complex if the removal of one of its parts causes the whole to cease functioning. This has been assumed to be self-evident for both eyes and wings, but as soon as we give these assumptions a moment's thought, we immediately see the fallacy. A cataract patient, with the lens of her eye surgically removed, can't see clear images without glasses, but can see enough not to bump into a tree or fall over a cliff. Half a wing is indeed not as good as a whole wing, but it is certainly better than no wing at all. Half a wing could save your life by easing your fall from a tree of a certain height, and 51% of a wing could save you if you fall from a slightly taller tree. Whatever fraction of a wing you have, there is a fall from which it will save your life where a slightly smaller winglet would not. The thought experiment of trees of different height from which one might fall is just one way to see, in theory, that there must be a smooth gradient of advantage all the way from 1% of a wing to 100%. The forests are replete with gliding or parachuting animals illustrating in practice every step of the way up that particular slope of Mount Improbable. By analogy with the trees of different height, it is easy to imagine situations in which half an eye would save the life of an animal where 49% of an eye would not. Smooth gradients are provided by variations in lighting conditions, variations in the distance at which you catch sight of your prey or your predators. And as with wings and flight surfaces, plausible intermediates are not only easy to imagine, they are abundant all around the animal kingdom. A flatworm has an eye that, by any sensible measure, is less than half a human eye. Nautilus, and perhaps its extinct Ammonite cousins, who dominated Paleozoic and Mesozoic seas, has an eye that is intermediate in quality between flatworm and human. 
unlike the flatworm eye, which can detect light and shade but see no image, the Nautilus pinhole camera eye makes a real image, but it is a blurred and dim image compared to ours. It would be spurious precision to put numbers on the improvement, but nobody could sanely deny that these invertebrate eyes and many others are all better than no eye at all, and all lie on a continuous and shallow slope up Mount Improbable, with our eyes near a peak, not the highest peak, but a high one. In Climbing Mount Improbable, I devoted a whole chapter each to the eye and the wing, demonstrating how easy it was for them to evolve by slow, or even maybe not all that slow, gradual degrees. And I will leave the subject here. So, we have seen that eyes and wings are certainly not irreducibly complex. But what is more interesting than these particular examples is the general lesson we should draw. The fact that so many people have been dead wrong over these obvious cases should serve to warn us of other examples that are less obvious, such as the cellular and biochemical cases now being touted by those creationists who shelter under the politically expedient euphemism of intelligent design theorists. We have a cautionary tale here, and it is telling us this. Do not just declare things to be irreducibly complex. The chances are that you haven't looked carefully enough at the details or thought carefully enough about them. On the other hand, we on the science side must not be too dogmatically confident. Maybe there is something out there in nature that really does preclude, by its genuinely irreducible complexity, the smooth gradient of Mount Improbable. The creationists are right that if genuinely irreducible complexity could be properly demonstrated, it would wreck Darwin's theory. Darwin himself said as much. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. But I can find no such case. Darwin could find no such case, and nor has anybody since Darwin's time, despite strenuous, indeed desperate efforts. Many candidates for this holy grail of creationism have been proposed. None has stood up to analysis. In any case, even though genuinely irreducible complexity would wreck Darwin's theory if it were ever found, who is to say that it wouldn't wreck the intelligent design theory as well? Indeed, it already has wrecked the intelligent design theory, for, as I keep saying and will say again, however little we know about God, the one thing we can be sure of is that he would have to be very, very complex, and presumably irreducibly so. The Worship of Gaps Searching for particular examples of irreducible complexity is a fundamentally unscientific way to proceed, a special case of arguing from present ignorance. It appeals to the same faulty logic as the God of the Gap strategy condemned by the theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Creationists eagerly seek a gap in present-day knowledge or understanding. If an apparent gap is found, it is assumed that God, by default, must fill it. What worries thoughtful theologians such as Bonhoeffer is that gaps shrink as science advances, and God is threatened with eventually having nothing to do and nowhere to hide. What worries scientists is something else. It is an essential part of the scientific enterprise to admit ignorance, even to exult in ignorance, as a challenge to future conquests. As my friend Matt Ridley has written, Most scientists are bored by what they have already discovered. It is ignorance that drives them on. Mystics exult in mystery and want it to stay mysterious. Scientists exult in mystery for a different reason. It gives them something to do. More generally, as I shall repeat in Chapter 8, one of the truly bad effects of religion is that it teaches us that it is a virtue to be satisfied with not understanding. Admissions of ignorance and temporary mystification are vital to good science. It is therefore unfortunate, to say the least, that the main strategy of creation propagandists is the negative one of seeking out gaps in scientific knowledge and claiming to fill them with intelligent design by default. The following is hypothetical but entirely typical. A creation is speaking. The elbow joint of the lesser spotted weasel frog is irreducibly complex. 
no part of it would do any good at all until the whole was assembled. Bet you can't think of a way in which the weasel frog's elbow could have evolved by slow, gradual degrees. If the scientist fails to give an immediate and comprehensive answer, the creationist draws a default conclusion. Right then, the alternative theory, intelligent design, wins by default. Notice the biased logic. If theory A fails in some particular, theory B must be right. Needless to say, the argument is not applied the other way around. We are encouraged to leap to the default theory without even looking to see whether it fails in the very same particular as the theory it is alleged to replace. Intelligent design, ID, is granted a get-out-of-jail-free card, a charmed immunity to the rigorous demands made of evolution. But my present point is that the creationist ploy undermines the scientist's natural, indeed necessary, rejoicing in temporary uncertainty. For purely political reasons, today's scientists might hesitate before saying, Hmm, interesting point. I wonder how the weasel frog's ancestors did evolve their elbow joint. I'm not a specialist in weasel frogs. I'll have to go to the university library and take a look. Might make an interesting project for a graduate student. The moment a scientist said something like that, and long before the student began the project, the default conclusion would become a headline in a creationist pamphlet. Weasel frog could only have been designed by God. There is then an unfortunate hookup between science's methodological need to seek out areas of ignorance in order to target research, and ID's need to seek out areas of ignorance in order to claim victory by default. It is precisely the fact that ID has no evidence of its own, but thrives like a weed in gaps left by scientific knowledge, that sits uneasily with science's need to identify and proclaim the very same gaps as a prelude to researching them. In this respect, science finds itself in alliance with sophisticated theologians like Bonhoeffer, united against the common enemies of naive populist theology and the gap theology of intelligent design. The creationists' love affair with gaps in the fossil record symbolizes their whole gap theology. I once introduced a chapter on the so-called Cambrian explosion with the sentence, It is as though the fossils were placed there without any evolutionary history. Again, this was a rhetorical overture intended to whet the reader's appetite for the full explanation that was to follow. Sad hindsight tells me now how predictable it was that my patient explanation would be excised, and my overture itself gleefully quoted out of context. Creationists adore gaps in the fossil record, just as they adore gaps generally. Many evolutionary transitions are elegantly documented by more or less continuous series of gradually changing intermediate fossils. Some are not, and these are the famous gaps. Michael Shermer has wittily pointed out that if a new fossil discovery neatly bisects a gap, the creationist will declare that there are now twice as many gaps. But in any case, note yet again the unwarranted use of a default. If there are no fossils to document a postulated evolutionary transition, the default assumption is that there was no evolutionary transition, therefore God must have intervened. It is utterly illogical to demand complete documentation of every step of any narrative, whether in evolution or any other science. You might as well demand, before convicting somebody of murder, a complete cinematic record of the murderer's every step leading up to the crime, with no missing frames. Only a tiny fraction of corpses fossilize, and we're lucky to have as many intermediate fossils as we do. We could easily have had no fossils at all, and still the evidence for evolution from other sources, such as molecular genetics and geographical distribution, would be overwhelmingly strong. On the other hand, evolution makes the strong prediction that if a single fossil turned up in the wrong geological stratum, the theory would be blown out of the water. When challenged by a zealous Popperian to say how evolution could ever be falsified, J.B.S. Haldane famously growled, Fossil rabbits in the Precambrian. No such anachronistic fossils have ever been authentically found despite discredited creationist legends of human skulls in the coal measures and human footprints interspersed with dinosaurs. Gaps, by default in the mind of the creationist, are filled by God. 
The same applies to all apparent precipices on the massif of Mount Improbable, where the graded slope is not immediately obvious or is otherwise overlooked. Areas where there is a lack of data or a lack of understanding are automatically assumed to belong, by default, to God. The speedy resort to a dramatic proclamation of irreducible complexity represents a failure of the imagination. Some biological organ, if not an eye, then a bacterial flagella motor or a biochemical pathway, is decreed, without further argument, to be irreducibly complex. No attempt is made to demonstrate irreducible complexity. Notwithstanding the cautionary tales of eyes, wings, and many other things, each new candidate for the dubious accolade is assumed to be transparently, self-evidently, irreducibly complex, its status asserted by fiat. But think about it. Since irreducible complexity is being deployed as an argument for design, it should no more be asserted by fiat than design itself. You might as well simply assert that the weasel frog, bombardier beetle, etc., demonstrates design without further argument or justification. That is no way to do science. The logic turns out to be no more convincing than this. I, insert own name, am personally unable to think of any way in which, insert biological phenomenon, could have been built up step by step. Therefore, it is irreducibly complex. That means it is designed. Put it like that and you immediately see that it is vulnerable to some scientist coming along and finding an intermediate or at least imagining a plausible intermediate. Even if no scientists do come up with an explanation, it is plain bad logic to assume that design will fare any better. The reasoning that underlies intelligent design theory is lazy and defeatist, classic God of the Gaps reasoning. I have previously dubbed it the argument from personal incredulity. Imagine that you are watching a really great magic trick. The celebrated conjuring duo Penn and Teller have a routine in which they simultaneously appear to shoot each other with pistols, and each appears to catch the bullet in his teeth. Elaborate precautions are taken to scratch identifying marks on the bullets before they are put in the guns. The whole procedure is witnessed at close range by volunteers from the audience who have experience of firearms, and apparently all possibilities for trickery are eliminated. Teller's marked bullet ends up in Penn's mouth, and Penn's marked bullet ends up in Teller's. I, Richard Dawkins, am utterly unable to think of any way in which this could be a trick. The argument from personal incredulity screams from the depths of my pre-scientific brain centers and almost compels me to say, it must be a miracle. There is no scientific explanation. It's got to be supernatural. But the still small voice of scientific education speaks a different message. Penn and Teller are world-class illusionists. There is a perfectly good explanation. It is just that I am too naive or too unobservant or too unimaginative to think of it. That is the proper response to a conjuring trick. It is also the proper response to a biological phenomenon that appears to be irreducibly complex. Those people who leap from personal bafflement at a natural phenomenon straight to a hasty invocation of the supernatural are no better than the fools who see a conjurer bending a spoon and leap to the conclusion that it is paranormal. In his book Seven Clues to the Origin of Life, the Scottish chemist A.G. Cairn Smith makes an additional point using the analogy of an arch. A free-standing arch of rough-hewn stones and no mortar can be a stable structure, but it is irreducibly complex. It collapses if any one stone is removed. How, then, was it built in the first place? One instant at a time, each should change capriciously, haphazardly, and fleetingly from moment to moment. That is Swinburne's view of the simple native state of affairs. Anything more uniform, what you or I would call more simple, requires a special explanation. It is only because electrons and bits of copper and all other material objects have the same powers in the 20th century as they did in the 19th century that things are as they are now. Enter God. God comes to the rescue by deliberately and continuously sustaining the properties of all those billions of electrons and bits of copper and neutralizing their otherwise ingrained inclination 
to wild and erratic fluctuation. That is why when you've seen one electron, you've seen them all. That is why bits of copper all behave like bits of copper. And that is why each electron and each bit of copper stays the same as itself from microsecond to microsecond and from century to century. It is because God constantly keeps a finger on each and every particle, curbing its reckless excesses and whipping it into line with its colleagues to keep them all the same. But how can Swinburne possibly maintain that this hypothesis of God simultaneously keeping a gazillion fingers on wayward electrons is a simple hypothesis? It is, of course, precisely the opposite of simple. Swinburne pulls off the trick to his own satisfaction by a breathtaking piece of intellectual chutzpah. He asserts, without justification, that God is only a single substance. What brilliant economy of explanatory causes, compared with all those gigazillions of independent electrons, all just happening to be the same. Theism claims that every other object which exists is caused to exist and kept in existence by just one substance, God. And it claims that every property which every substance has is due to God causing or permitting it to exist. It is a hallmark of a simple explanation to postulate few causes. There could in this respect be no simpler explanation than one which postulated only one cause. Theism is simpler than polytheism. And theism postulates for its one cause a person with infinite power, God can do anything logically possible, infinite knowledge, God knows everything logically possible to know, and infinite freedom. Swinburne generously concedes that God cannot accomplish feats that are logically impossible, and one feels grateful for this forbearance. Having said that, there is no limit to the explanatory purposes to which God's infinite power is put. Is science having a little difficulty explaining X? No problem. Don't give X another glance. God's infinite power is effortlessly wheeled from cancer, then cancer would no longer be a problem for humans to solve. And then what would be fine to do with our time? Not all theologians go as far as Swinburne. Nevertheless, the remarkable suggestion that the God hypothesis is simple can be found in other modern theological writings. Keith Ward, then Regis Professor of Divinity at Oxford, was very clear on the matter. Just one being, an ultimate cause which assigns a reason for the existence of everything, including itself. It is elegant because from one key idea, the idea of the most perfect possible being, the whole nature of God and the existence of the universe can be intelligibly explicated. Like Swinburne, Ward mistakes what it means to explain something, and he also seems not to understand what it means to say of something that it is simple. I'm not clear whether Ward really thinks God is simple, or whether the above passage represented a temporary, for the sake of argument, exercise. Ward earlier criticised the thought of Thomas Aquinas. Its basic error is in supposing that God is logically simple, simple not just in the sense that his being is indivisible, but in the much stronger sense that what is true of any part of God is true of the whole. It is quite coherent, however, to suppose that God, while indivisible, is internally complex. Ward gets it right here. Indeed, the biologist Julian Huxley in 1912 defined complexity in terms of heterogeneity of parts, by which he meant a particular kind of functional indivisibility. Elsewhere, Ward gives evidence of the difficulty the theological mind has in grasping where the complexity of life comes from. He quotes another theologian scientist, the biochemist Arthur Peacock, the third member of my trio of British religious scientists, as postulating the existence in living matter of a propensity for increased complexity. Ward characterizes this as some inherent weighting of evolutionary change which favors complexity. He goes on to suggest that such a bias might be some weighting of the mutational process to ensure that more complex mutations occurred. Ward is skeptical of this, as well he should be. The evolutionary drive towards complexity comes, in those lineages where it comes at all, not from any inherent propensity for increased complexity and not from biased mutation. It comes from natural selection, the process which, as far as we know, is the only process ultimately capable of generating complexity out of simplicity. 
The theory of natural selection is genuinely simple. So is the origin from which it starts. That which it explains, on the other hand, is complex, almost beyond telling, more complex than anything we can imagine, save a god capable of designing it. An interlude at Cambridge. At a recent Cambridge conference on science and religion, where I put forward the argument I'm here calling the ultimate 747 argument, I encountered what, to say the least, was a cordial failure to achieve a meeting of minds on the question of God's simplicity. The experience was a revealing one, and I'd like to share it. First, I should confess, that is probably the right word, that the conference was sponsored by the Templeton Foundation. The audience was a small number of hand-picked science journalists from Britain and America. I was the token atheist among the eighteen invited speakers. One of the journalists, John Horgan, reported that they had each been paid the handsome sum of $15,000 to attend the conference on top of all expenses. This surprised me. My long experience of academic conferences included no instances where the audience, as opposed to the speakers, was paid to attend. If I had known, my suspicions would immediately have been aroused. Was Templeton using his money to suborn science journalists and subvert their scientific integrity? John Horgan later wondered the same thing and wrote an article about his whole experience. In it, he revealed to my chagrin that my advertised involvement as a speaker had helped him and others to overcome their doubts. The British biologist Richard Dawkins, whose participation in the meeting helped convince me and other fellows of its legitimacy, was the only speaker who denounced religious beliefs as incompatible with science, irrational and harmful. The other speakers, three agnostics, one Jew, a deist and twelve Christians, a Muslim philosopher cancelled at the last minute, offered a perspective clearly skewed in favour of religion and Christianity. Horgan's article is itself endearingly ambivalent. Despite his misgivings, there were aspects of the experience that he clearly valued, and so did I, as will become apparent below. Horgan wrote, My conversations with the faithful deepened my appreciation of why some intelligent, well-educated people embrace religion. One reporter discussed the experience of speaking in tongues, and another described having an intimate relationship with Jesus. My convictions did not change, but others did. At least one fellow said that his faith was wavering as a result of Dawkins's deception of religion. And if the Templeton Foundation can help bring about even such a tiny step toward my vision of a world without religion, how bad can it be? Horgan's article was given a second airing by the literary agent John Brockman on his Edge website, often described as an online scientific salon, where it elicited varying responses, including one from the theoretical physicist Freeman Dyson. I responded to Dyson, quoting from his acceptance speech when he won the Templeton Prize. Whether he liked it or not, by accepting the Templeton Prize, Dyson had sent a powerful signal to the world. It would be taken as an endorsement of religion by one of the world's most distinguished physicists. I am content to be one of the multitude of Christians who do not care much about the doctrine of the Trinity or the historical truth of the Gospels. But isn't that exactly what any atheistic scientist would say if he wanted to sound Christian? I gave further quotations from Dyson's acceptance speech, satirically interspersing them with imagined questions to a Templeton official. Oh, you want something a bit more profound as well. How about... I do not make any clear distinction between mind and God. God is what mind becomes when it has passed beyond the scale of our comprehension. Have I said enough yet, and can I get back to doing physics now? Oh, uh, not enough yet. Okay, then. How about this? Even in the gruesome history of the 20th century, I see some evidence of progress in religion. The two individuals who epitomized the evils of our century, Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, were both avowed atheists. Can I go now? Dyson could easily refute the implication of these quotations from his Templeton acceptance speech, if only he would explain clearly what evidence he finds to believe in God, in something more than just the Einsteinian sense which, as I explained in Chapter 1, we can all trivially subscribe to. If I understand Horgan's point, it is that Templeton's money corrupts science. 
I'm sure Freeman Dyson is way above being corrupted, but his acceptance speech is still unfortunate if it seems to set an example to others. The Templeton Prize is two orders of magnitude larger than the inducements offered to the journalists at Cambridge, having been explicitly set up to be larger than the Nobel Prize. In Faustian vein, my friend the philosopher Daniel Dennett once joked to me, Richard, if ever you fall on hard times... For better or worse, I attended two days at the Cambridge Conference, giving a talk of my own and taking part in the discussion of several other talks. I challenged the theologians to answer the point that a God capable of designing a universe, or anything else, would have to be complex and statistically improbable. The strongest response I heard was that I was brutally foisting a scientific epistemology upon an unwilling theology. Theologians had always defined God as simple. Who was I, a scientist, to dictate to theologians that their God had to be complex? Scientific arguments, such as those I was accustomed to deploying in my own field, were inappropriate, since theologians had always maintained that God lay outside science. I did not gain the impression that the theologians who mounted this evasive defense were being willfully dishonest. I think they were sincere. Nevertheless, I was irresistibly reminded of Peter Medawar's comment on Father Teilhard de Chardin's The Phenomenon of Man, in the course of what is possibly the greatest negative book review of all time. Its author can be excused of dishonesty only on the grounds that before deceiving others, he has taken great pains to deceive himself. The theologians of my Cambridge encounter were defining themselves into an epistemological safe zone, where rational argument could not reach them because they had declared by fiat that it could not. Who was I to say that rational argument was the only admissible kind of argument? There are other ways of knowing besides the scientific, and it is one of these other ways of knowing that must be deployed to know God. The most important of these other ways of knowing turned out to be personal, subjective experience of God. Several discussants at Cambridge claimed that God spoke to them inside their heads, just as vividly and as personally as another human might. I have dealt with illusion and hallucination in Chapter 3, the argument from personal experience, but at the Cambridge Conference I added two points. First, that if God really did communicate with humans, that fact would emphatically not lie outside science. God comes bursting through from whatever otherworldly domain is his natural abode, crashing through into our world, where his messages can be intercepted by human brains. Has that phenomenon really nothing to do with science? Second, a God who is capable of sending intelligible signals to millions of people simultaneously, and of receiving messages from all of them simultaneously, cannot be, whatever else he might be, simple. Such bandwidth! God may not have a brain made of neurons or a CPU made of silicon, but if he has the powers attributed to him, he must have something far more elaborately and non-randomly constructed than the largest brain or the largest computer we know. Time and again my theologian friends returned to the point that there had to be a reason why there is something rather than nothing. There must have been a first cause of everything, and we might as well give it the name God. Yes, I said, but it must have been simple, and therefore whatever else we call it, God is not an appropriate name unless we very explicitly divest it of all the baggage that the word God carries in the minds of most religious believers. The first cause that we seek must have been the simple basis for a self-bootstrapping crane, which eventually raised the world as we know it into its present complex existence. To suggest that the original prime mover was complicated enough to indulge in intelligent design, to say nothing of mind-reading millions of humans simultaneously, is tantamount to dealing yourself a perfect hand at bridge. Look around at the world of life at the Amazon rainforest, with its rich interlacement of lianas, bromeliads, roots and flying buttresses, its army ants and its jaguars, its tapirs and peccaries, tree frogs and parrots. What you are looking at is the statistical equivalent of a perfect hand of cards. Think of all the other ways you could permute the parts, none of which would work. Except that we know how it came about, by the gradualistic crane of natural selection. It is not just scientists who revolt at mute acceptance of such improbability arising spontaneously. Common sense balks too. 
to suggest that the first cause, the great unknown which is responsible for something existing rather than nothing, is a being capable of designing the universe and of talking to a million people simultaneously, is a total abdication of the responsibility to find an explanation. It is a dreadful exhibition of self-indulgent, thought-denying skyhookery. I am not advocating some sort of narrowly scientific way of thinking, but the very least that any honest quest for truth must have in setting out to explain such monstrosities of improbability as a rainforest, a coral reef, or a universe is a crane and not a skyhook. The crane doesn't have to be natural selection. Admittedly, nobody has ever thought of a better one, but there could be others yet to be discovered. Maybe the inflation that physicists postulate as occupying some fraction of the first yocta second of the universe's existence will turn out, when it is better understood, to be a cosmological crane to stand alongside Darwin's biological one. Or maybe the elusive crane that cosmologists seek will be a version of Darwin's idea itself, either Smolin's model or something similar. Or maybe it will be the multiverse plus anthropic principle espoused by Martin Rees and others. It may even be a superhuman designer, but if so, it will most certainly not be a designer who just popped into existence or who always existed. If, which I don't believe for a moment, our universe was designed, and a fortiori, if the designer reads our thoughts and hands out omniscient advice, forgiveness and redemption, the designer himself must be the end product of some kind of cumulative escalator or crane, perhaps a version of Darwinism in another universe. The last-ditch defence by my critics at Cambridge was attack. My whole world view was condemned as 19th century. This is such a bad argument that I almost omitted to mention it but regrettably I encounter it rather frequently. Needless to say, to call an argument 19th century is not the same as explaining what is wrong with it. Some 19th century ideas were very good ideas, not least Darwin's own dangerous idea. In any case, this particular piece of name-calling seemed a bit rich, coming as it did from an individual, a distinguished Cambridge geologist, surely well advanced along the Faustian road to a future Templeton Prize, who justified his own Christian belief by invoking what he called the historicity of the New Testament. It was precisely in the 19th century that theologians, especially in Germany, called into grave doubt that alleged historicity, using the evidence-based methods of history to do so. This was indeed swiftly pointed out by the theologians at the Cambridge Conference. In any case, I know the 19th century taunt of old, it goes with the village atheist jibe. It goes with... Contrary to what you seem to think, ha, 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 we don't believe in an old man with a long white beard anymore. Ha, ha, ha. All three jibes are code for something else. Just as when I lived in America in the late 1960s, law and order was politicians' code for anti-black prejudice. What, then, is the coded meaning of... You are so 19th century. In the context of an argument about religion, it is code for... You are so crude and unsubtle. How could you be so insensitive and ill-mannered as to ask me a direct, point-blank question like, Do you believe in miracles, or do you believe Jesus was born of a virgin? Don't you know that in polite society we don't ask such questions? That sort of question went out in the 19th century. But think about why it is impolite to ask such direct, factual questions of religious people today. It is because it is embarrassing. But it is the answer that is embarrassing, if it is yes. The 19th century connection is now clear. The 19th century is the last time when it was possible for an educated person to admit to believing in miracles like the virgin birth without embarrassment. When pressed, Many educated Christians today are too loyal to deny the virgin birth and the resurrection. But it embarrasses them because their rational minds know it is absurd, so they would much rather not be asked. Hence, if somebody like me insists on asking the question, it is I who am accused of being 19th century. It's really quite funny when you think about it. I left the conference stimulated and invigorated, and reinforced in my conviction that the argument from improbability, the ultimate 747 gambit, is a very serious argument against the existence of God, 
and one to which I have yet to hear a theologian give a convincing answer, despite numerous opportunities and invitations to do so. Dan Dennett rightly describes it as an unrebuttable refutation as devastating today as when Philo used it to trance Cleanthes in Hume's dialogues two centuries earlier. A skyhook would at best simply postpone the solution to the problem, but Hume couldn't think of any cranes, so he caved in. Darwin, of course, supplied the vital crane. How Hume would have loved it. This chapter has contained the central argument of the book, and so, at the risk of sounding repetitive, let's summarize it as a series of six numbered points. 1. One of the greatest challenges to the human intellect over the centuries has been to explain how the complex, improbable appearance of design in the universe arises. 2. The natural temptation is to attribute the appearance of design to actual design itself. In the case of a man-made artifact such as a watch, the designer really was an intelligent engineer. It is tempting to apply the same logic to an eye or a wing, a spider or a person. 3. The temptation is a false one because the designer hypothesis immediately raises the larger problem of who designed the designer. The whole problem we started out with was the problem of explaining statistical improbability. It is obviously no solution to postulate something even more improbable. We need a crane, not a skyhook, for only a crane can do the business of working up gradually and plausibly from simplicity to otherwise improbable complexity. 4. The most ingenious and powerful crane so far discovered is Darwinian evolution by natural selection. Darwin and his successors have shown how living creatures, with their spectacular statistical improbability and appearance of design, have evolved by slow, gradual degrees from simple beginnings. We can now safely say that the illusion of design in living creatures is just that, an illusion. 5. We don't yet have an equivalent crane for physics. Some kind of multiverse theory could in principle do for physics the same explanatory work as Darwinism does for biology. This kind of explanation is superficially less satisfying than the biological version of Darwinism because it makes heavier demands on luck. But the anthropic principle entitles us to postulate far more luck than our limited human intuition is comfortable with. 6. We should not give up hope of a better crane arising in physics, something as powerful as Darwinism is for biology. But even in the absence of a strongly satisfying crane to match the biological one, the relatively weak cranes we have at present are, when abetted by the anthropic principle, self-evidently better than the self-defeating skyhook hypothesis of an intelligent designer. If the argument of this chapter is accepted, the factual premise of religion, the God hypothesis, is untenable. God almost certainly does not exist. This is the main conclusion of the book so far. Various questions now follow. Even if we accept that God doesn't exist, doesn't religion still have a lot going for it? Isn't it consoling? Doesn't it motivate people to do good? If it weren't for religion, how would we know what is good? Why in any case be so hostile? Why, if it is false, does every culture in the world have religion? True or false, religion is ubiquitous, so where does it come from? It is to this last question that we turn next. Chapter 5. The Roots of Religion To an evolutionary psychologist, the universal extravagance of religious rituals with their costs in time, resources, pain and privation should suggest as vividly as a mandrill's bottom that religion may be adaptive. Marek Cohn The Darwinian Imperative Everybody has their own pet theory of where religion comes from and why all human cultures have it. It gives consolation and comfort. It fosters togetherness in groups. It satisfies our yearning to understand why we exist. I shall come to explanations of this kind in a moment. But I want to begin with a prior question, one that takes precedence for reasons we shall see, a Darwinian question, 
about natural selection. Knowing that we are products of Darwinian evolution, we should ask what pressure or pressures exerted by natural selection originally favoured the impulse to religion. The question gains urgency from standard Darwinian considerations of economy. Religion is so wasteful, so extravagant, and Darwinian selection habitually targets and eliminates waste. Nature is a miserly accountant, grudging the pennies, watching the clock, punishing the smallest extravagance. Unrelentingly and unceasingly, as Darwin explained, Natural selection is daily and hourly scrutinizing throughout the world every variation, even the slightest, rejecting that which is bad, preserving and adding up all that is good, silently and insensibly working, whenever and wherever opportunity offers, at the improvement of each organic being. If a wild animal habitually performs some useless activity, natural selection will favor rival individuals who devote the time and energy instead to surviving and reproducing. Nature cannot afford frivolous jeu d'esprit. Ruthless utilitarianism trumps, even if it doesn't always seem that way. On the face of it, the tale of a peacock is a jeu d'esprit par excellence. It surely does no favors to the survival of its possessor. But it does benefit the genes that distinguish him from his less spectacular rivals. The tale is an advertisement, which buys its place in the economy of nature by attracting females. The same is true of the labor and time that a male bowerbird devotes to his bower, a sort of external tail built of grass, twigs, colorful berries, flowers, and when available, beads, baubles, and bottle caps. Or to choose an example that doesn't involve advertising, there is anting, the odd habit of birds such as jays, of bathing in an ant's nest or otherwise applying ants to the feathers. Nobody's sure what the benefit of anting is, perhaps some kind of hygiene, cleaning out parasites from the feathers. There are various other hypotheses, none of them strongly supported by evidence. But uncertainty as to details doesn't, nor should it, stop Darwinians from presuming with great confidence that anting must be for something. In this case, common sense might agree, but Darwinian logic has a particular reason for thinking that if the birds didn't do it, their statistical prospects of genetic success would be damaged, even if we don't yet know the precise root of the damage. The conclusion follows from the twin premises that natural selection punishes wastage of time and energy, and that birds are consistently observed to devote time and energy to anting. If there is a one-sentence manifesto of this adaptationist principle, it was expressed, admittedly in somewhat extreme and exaggerated terms, by the distinguished Harvard geneticist Richard Lewontin. That is the one point which I think all evolutionists are agreed upon, that it is virtually impossible to do a better job than an organism is doing in its own environment. If anting wasn't positively useful for survival and reproduction, Natural selection would long ago have favored individuals who refrained from it. A Darwinian might be tempted to say the same of religion, hence the need for this discussion. To an evolutionist, religious rituals stand out like peacocks in a sunlit glade, Dan Dennett's phrase. Religious behavior is a writ large human equivalent of anting or bower building. It is time consuming, energy consuming, often as extravagantly ornate as the plumage of a bird of paradise. Religion can endanger the life of the pious individual, as well as the lives of others. Thousands of people have been tortured for their loyalty to a religion, persecuted by zealots for what is, in many cases, a scarcely distinguishable alternative faith. Religion devours resources, sometimes on a massive scale. A medieval cathedral could consume a hundred man sanctuaries in its construction, yet was never used as a dwelling or for any recognizably useful purpose. Was it some kind of architectural peacock's tail? If so, at whom was the advertisement aimed? Sacred music and devotional paintings largely monopolized medieval and Renaissance talent. Devout people have died for their gods and killed for them, whipped blood from their backs, sworn themselves to a lifetime of celibacy or to lonely silence all in the service of religion. What is it all for? What is the benefit of religion? By benefit, 
the Darwinian normally means some enhancement to the survival of the individual's genes. What is missing from this is the important point that Darwinian benefit is not restricted to the genes of the individual organism. There are three possible alternative targets of benefit. One arises from the theory of group selection, and I'll come to that. The second follows from the theory that I advocated in The Extended Phenotype. The individual you are watching may be working under the manipulative influence of genes in another individual, perhaps a parasite. Dan Dennett reminds us that the common cold is universal to all human peoples in much the same way as religion is, yet we would not want to suggest that colds benefit us. Plenty of examples are known of animals manipulated into behaving in such a way as to benefit the transmission of a parasite to its next host. I encapsulated the point in my central theorem of the extended phenotype. An animal's behavior tends to maximize the survival of the genes for that behavior, whether or not those genes happen to be in the body of the particular animal performing it. Third, the central theorem may substitute for genes the more general term replicators. The fact that religion is ubiquitous probably means that it has worked to the benefit of something, but it may not be us or our genes. It may be to the benefit of only the religious ideas themselves, to the extent that they behave in a somewhat gene-like way as replicators. I shall deal with this below under the heading, Tread Softly, because you tread on my memes. Meanwhile, I press on with more traditional interpretations of Darwinism, in which benefit is assumed to mean benefit to individual survival and reproduction. Hunter-gatherer peoples, such as Australian Aboriginal tribes, presumably live in something like the way our distant ancestors did. The New Zealand-Australian philosopher of science Kim Sturelny points up a dramatic contrast in their lives. On the one hand, Aboriginals are superb survivors under conditions that test their practical skills to the uttermost. But Sturelny goes on, intelligent as our species might be, we are perversely intelligent. The very same peoples who are so savvy about the natural world and how to survive in it simultaneously clutter their minds with beliefs that are palpably false and for which the word useless is a generous understatement. Sterelny himself is familiar with Aboriginal peoples of Papua New Guinea. They survive under arduous conditions where food is hard to come by, by dint of a legendarily accurate understanding of their biological environment. But they combine this understanding with deep and destructive obsessions about female menstrual pollution and about witchcraft. Many of the local cultures are tormented by fears of witchcraft and magic and by the violence that accompanies those fears. Sterelny challenges us to explain how we can be simultaneously so smart and so dumb. Though the details differ across the world, no known culture lacks some version of the time-consuming, wealth-consuming, hostility-provoking rituals, the anti-factual, counterproductive fantasies of religion. Some educated individuals may have abandoned religion, but all were brought up in a religious culture from which they usually had to make a conscious decision to depart. The old Northern Ireland joke, yes, but are you a Protestant atheist or a Catholic atheist, is spiked with bitter truth. Religious behavior can be called a human universal in the same way as heterosexual behavior can. Both generalizations allow individual exceptions but all those exceptions understand only too well the rule from which they have departed. Universal features of a species demand a Darwinian explanation. Obviously there is no difficulty in explaining the Darwinian advantage of sexual behavior. It is about making babies, even on those occasions where contraception or homosexuality seems to belie it. But what about religious behavior? Why do humans fast, kneel, genuflect, self-flagellate, nod maniacally towards a wall, crusade, or otherwise indulge in costly practices that can consume life and, in extreme cases, terminate it? Direct Advantages of Religion There is a little evidence that religious belief protects people from stress-related diseases. The evidence is not strong, but it would not be surprising if it were true for the same kind of reason as faith healing might turn out to work in a few cases. 
I wish it were not necessary to add that such beneficial effects in no way boost the truth value of religious claims. In George Bernard Shaw's words, The fact that a believer is happier than a skeptic is no more to the point than the fact that a drunken man is happier than a sober one. Part of what a doctor can give a patient is consolation and reassurance. This is not to be dismissed out of hand. My doctor doesn't literally practice faith healing by laying on of hands, but many's the time I've been instantly cured of some minor ailment by a reassuring voice from an intelligent face surmounting a stethoscope. The placebo effect is well documented and not even very mysterious. Dummy pills with no pharmacological activity at all demonstrably improve health. That is why double-blind drug trials must use placebos as controls. It's why homeopathic remedies appear to work, even though they are so dilute that they have the same amount of active ingredient as the placebo control, zero molecules. Incidentally, an unfortunate byproduct of the encroachment by lawyers and doctors' territory is that doctors are now afraid to prescribe placebos in normal practice. Or bureaucracy may oblige them to identify the placebo in written notes, to which the patient has access, which of course defeats the object. Homeopaths may be achieving relative success because they, unlike orthodox practitioners, are still allowed to administer placebos under another name. They also have more time to devote to talking and simply being kind to the patient. In the early part of its long history, moreover, homeopathy's reputation was inadvertently enhanced by the fact that its remedies did nothing at all by contrast with orthodox medical practices, such as bloodletting, which did active harm. Is religion a placebo that prolongs life by reducing stress? Possibly, although the theory must run a gauntlet of skeptics who point out the many circumstances in which religion causes rather than relieves stress. It's hard to believe, for example, that health is improved by the semi-permanent state of morbid guilt suffered by a Roman Catholic possessed of normal human frailty and less than normal intelligence. Perhaps it's unfair to single out the Catholics. The American comedian Kathy Ladman observes that All religions are the same. Religion is basically guilt with different holidays. In any case, I find the placebo theory unworthy of the massively pervasive worldwide phenomenon of religion. I don't think the reason we have religion is that it reduced the stress levels of our ancestors. That's not a big enough theory for the job, although it may have played a subsidiary role. Religion is a large phenomenon, and it needs a large theory to explain it. Other theories miss the point of Darwinian explanations altogether. I'm talking about suggestions like, religion satisfies our curiosity about the universe and our place in it, or religion is consoling. There may be some psychological truth here, as we shall see in chapter 10, but neither is in itself a Darwinian explanation. As Stephen Pinker pointedly said, of the consolation theory in How the Mind Works. It only raises the question of why a mind would evolve to find comfort in beliefs it can plainly see are false. A freezing person finds no comfort in believing he is warm. A person face to face with a lion is not put at ease by the conviction that it is a rabbit. At the very least, the consolation theory needs to be translated into Darwinian terms, and that is harder than you might think. Psychological explanations to the effect that people find some belief agreeable or disagreeable are proximate, not ultimate, explanations. Darwinians make much of this distinction between proximate and ultimate. The proximate explanation for the explosion in the cylinder of an internal combustion engine invokes the sparking plug. The ultimate explanation concerns the purpose for which the explosion was designed to impel a piston from the cylinder, thereby turning a crankshaft. The proximate cause of religion might be hyperactivity in a particular node of the brain. I shall not pursue the neurological idea of a god center in the brain because I'm not concerned here with proximate questions. That is not to belittle them. I recommend Michael Shermer's How We Believe, The Search for God in an Age of Science for a succinct discussion, which includes the suggestion by Michael Persinger and others that visionary religious experiences are related to temporal lobe epilepsy. But my preoccupation in this chapter is with Darwinian ultimate explanations. If neuroscientists find a god center in the brain, Darwinian scientists like me will still want to understand the natural selection pressure that favored it. Why did those of our ancestors who had a genetic tendency to grow a god center 
survived to have more grandchildren than rivals who didn't. The Darwinian ultimate question is not a better question, not a more profound question, not a more scientific question than the neurological proximate question, but it is the one I am talking about here. Nor are Darwinians satisfied by political explanations, such as, religion is a tool used by the ruling class to subjugate the underclass. It is surely true that black slaves in America were consoled by promises of another life, which blunted their dissatisfaction with this one and thereby benefited their owners. The question of whether religions are deliberately designed by cynical priests or rulers is an interesting one to which historians should attend, but it is not in itself a Darwinian question. The Darwinian still wants to know why people are vulnerable to the charms of religion and therefore open to exploitation by priests, politicians and kings. A cynical manipulator might use sexual lust as a tool of political power, but we still need the Darwinian explanation of why it works. In the case of sexual lust, the answer is easy. Our brains are set up to enjoy sex because sex, in the natural state, makes babies. Or a political manipulator might use torture to achieve his ends. Once again, the Darwinian must supply the explanation for why torture is effective, why we will do almost anything to avoid intense pain. Again, it seems obvious to the point of banality, but the Darwinian still needs to spell it out. Natural selection has set up the perception of pain as a token of life-threatening bodily damage and programmed us to avoid it. Those rare individuals who cannot feel pain or don't care about it usually die young of injuries which the rest of us would have taken steps to avoid. Whether it is cynically exploited or whether it just manifests itself spontaneously, what ultimately explains the lust for gods? Group Selection Some alleged ultimate explanations turn out to be, or avowedly are, group selection theories. Group selection is the controversial idea that Darwinian selection chooses among species or other groups of individuals. The Cambridge archaeologist Colin Renfrew suggests that Christianity survived by a form of group selection because it fostered the idea of in-group loyalty and in-group brotherly love, and this helped religious groups to survive at the expense of less religious groups. The American group selection apostle D.S. Wilson independently developed a similar suggestion at more length in Darwin's Cathedral. Here's an invented example to show what a group selection theory of religion might look like. A tribe with a stirringly belligerent god of battles wins wars against rival tribes whose gods urge peace and harmony, or tribes with no gods at all. Warriors who unshakably believe that a martyr's death will send them straight to paradise fight bravely and willingly give up their lives. So tribes with this kind of religion are more likely to survive in intertribal warfare, steal the conquered tribe's livestock, and seize their women as concubines. Such successful tribes prolifically spawn daughter tribes that go off and propagate more daughter tribes, all worshipping the same tribal god. The idea of a group spawning daughter groups like a beehive throwing off swarms is not implausible, by the way. The anthropologist Napoleon Chagnon mapped just such fissioning of villages in his celebrated study of the fierce people, the Yanomamo of the South American jungle. Chagnon is not a supporter of group selection, and nor am I. There are formidable objections to it. A partisan in the controversy, I must beware of riding off on my pet steed tangent far from the main track of this book. Some biologists betray a confusion between true group selection, as in my hypothetical example of the god of battles, and something else which they call group selection, but which turns out on closer inspection to be either kin selection or reciprocal altruism. See chapter 6. Those of us who belittle group selection admit that in principle it can happen. The question is whether it amounts to a significant force in evolution. When it is pitted against selection at lower levels, as when group selection is advanced as an explanation for individual self-sacrifice, lower level selection is likely to be stronger. In our hypothetical tribe, imagine a single self-interested warrior in an army dominated by aspiring martyrs eager to die for the tribe and earn a heavenly reward. 
he will be only slightly less likely to end up on the winning side as a result of hanging back in the battle to save his own skin. The martyrdom of his comrades will benefit him more than it benefits each one of them on average, because they will be dead. He is more likely to reproduce than they are, and his genes for refusing to be martyred are more likely to be reproduced into the next generation. Hence, tendencies towards martyrdom will decline in future generations. This is a simplified toy example, but it illustrates a perennial problem with group selection. Group selection theories of individual self-sacrifice are always vulnerable to subversion from within. Individual deaths and reproductions occur on a faster time scale and with greater frequency than group extinctions and fissionings. Mathematical models can be crafted to come up with special conditions under which group selection might be evolutionarily powerful. These special conditions are usually unrealistic in nature, but it can be argued that religions in human tribal groupings foster just such otherwise unrealistic special conditions. This is an interesting line of theory, but I shall not pursue it here, except to concede that Darwin himself, though he was normally a staunch advocate of selection at the level of the individual organism, came as close as he ever came to group selectionism in his discussion of human tribes. When two tribes of primeval man, living in the same country, came into competition, if the one tribe included, other circumstances being equal, a greater number of courageous, sympathetic and faithful members, who were always ready to warn each other of danger, to aid and defend each other, this tribe would, without doubt, succeed best and conquer the other. Selfish and contentious people will not cohere, and without coherence, nothing can be affected. A tribe possessing the above qualities in a high degree would spread and be victorious over other tribes. But in the course of time, it would, judging from all past history, be in turn overcome by some other and still more highly endowed tribe. To satisfy any biological specialists who might be reading this, I should add that Darwin's idea was not strictly group selection, in the true sense of successful groups spawning daughter groups whose frequency might be counted in a meta-population of groups. Rather, Darwin visualized tribes with altruistically cooperative members spreading and becoming more numerous in terms of numbers of individuals. Darwin's model is more like the spread of the grey squirrel in Britain at the expense of the red, ecological replacement, not true group selection. Religion as a byproduct of something else. In any case, I want now to set aside group selection and turn to my own view of the Darwinian survival value of religion. I am one of an increasing number of biologists who see religion as a byproduct of something else. More generally, I believe that we who speculate about Darwinian survival value need to think byproduct. When we ask about the survival value of anything, we may be asking the wrong question we need to rewrite the question in a more helpful way. Perhaps the feature we're interested in, religion in this case, doesn't have a direct survival value of its own, but is a byproduct of something else that does. I find it helpful to introduce the byproduct idea with an analogy from my own field of animal behavior. Moths fly into the candle flame, and it doesn't look like an accident. They go out of their way to make a burnt offering of themselves. We could label it self-immolation behavior, and under that provocative name, wonder how on earth natural selection could favor it. The point is that we must rewrite the question before we can even attempt an intelligent answer. It isn't suicide. Apparent suicide emerges as an inadvertent side effect or byproduct of something else. A byproduct of what? Well, here's one possibility which will serve to make the point. Artificial light is a recent arrival on the night scene. Until recently, the only night lights on view were the moon and the stars. They are at optical infinity, so rays coming from them are parallel. This fits them for use as compasses. Insects are known to use celestial objects such as the sun and the moon to steer accurately in a straight line, and they can use the same compass with reversed sign for returning home after a foray. The insect nervous system is adept at setting up a temporary rule of thumb of this kind. 
steer a course such that the light rays hit your eye at an angle of 30 degrees. Since insects have compound eyes, with straight tubes or light guides radiating out from the center of the eye like the spines of a hedgehog, this might amount in practice to something as simple as keeping the light in one particular tube, or omatidium. But the light compass relies critically on the celestial object being at optical infinity. If it isn't, the rays are not parallel, but diverge like the spokes of a wheel. A nervous system applying a 30-degree, or any acute angle, rule of thumb to a nearby candle, as though it were the moon at optical infinity, will steer the moth via a spiral trajectory into the flame. Draw it out for yourself, using some particular acute angle such as 30 degrees, and you'll produce an elegant logarithmic spiral into the candle. Though fatal in this particular circumstance, the moth's rule of thumb is still, on average, a good one because, for a moth, sightings of candles are rare compared with sightings of the moon. We don't notice the hundreds of moths that are silently and effectively steering by the moon or a bright star, or even the glow from a distant city. We see only moths wheeling into our candle, and we ask the wrong question. Why are all these moths committing suicide? Instead, we should ask why they have nervous systems that steer by maintaining a fixed angle to light rays, a tactic that we notice only when it goes wrong. When the question is rephrased, the mystery evaporates. It never was right to call it suicide. It is a misfiring byproduct of a normally useful compass. Now, apply the byproduct lesson to religious behavior in humans. We observe large numbers of people, in many areas it amounts to 100%, who hold beliefs that flatly contradict demonstrable scientific facts, as well as rival religions followed by others. People not only hold these beliefs with passionate certitude, but devote time and resources to costly activities that flow from holding them. They die for them, or kill for them. We marvel at this just as we marveled at the self-immolation behavior of the moths. Baffled, we ask why. But the point is that we may be asking the wrong question. The religious behavior may be a misfiring, an unfortunate byproduct of an underlying psychological propensity which in other circumstances is, or once was, useful. On this view, the propensity that was naturally selected in our ancestors was not religion per se. It had some other benefit, and it only incidentally manifests itself as religious behavior. We shall understand religious behavior only after we have renamed it. If then religion is a byproduct of something else, what is that something else? What is the counterpart to the moth habit of navigating by celestial light compasses? What is the primitively advantageous tray that sometimes misfires to generate religion? I shall offer one suggestion by way of illustration, but I must stress that it is only an example of the kind of thing I mean, and I shall come on to parallel suggestions made by others. I am much more wedded to the general principle that the question should be properly put, and if necessary rewritten, than I am to any particular answer. My specific hypothesis is about children. More than any other species, we survive by the accumulated experience of previous generations, and that experience needs to be passed on to children for their protection and well-being. Theoretically, children might learn from personal experience not to go too near a cliff edge, not to eat untried red berries, not to swim in crocodile-infested waters. But, to say the least, there will be a selective advantage to child brains that possess the rule of thumb, believe without question, whatever your grown-ups tell you. Obey your parents, obey the tribal elders, especially when they adopt a solemn, minatory tone. Trust your elders without question. This is a generally valuable rule for a child. But as with the moths, it can go wrong. I have never forgotten a horrifying sermon preached in my school chapel when I was little. Horrifying in retrospect, that is. At the time, my child brain accepted it in the spirit intended by the preacher. He told us a story of a squad of soldiers drilling beside a railway line. At a critical moment, the drill sergeant's attention was distracted, and he failed to give the order to halt. The soldiers were so well schooled to obey orders without question that they carried on marching right into the path of an oncoming train. 
Now, of course, I don't believe the story, and I hope the preacher didn't either. But I believed it when I was nine, because I heard it from an adult in authority over me. And whether he believed it or not, the preacher wished us children to admire and model ourselves on the soldier's slavish and unquestioning obedience to an order, however preposterous, from an authority figure. Speaking for myself, I think we did admire it. As an adult, I find it almost impossible to credit that my childhood self wondered whether I would have had the courage to do my duty by marching under the train. But that, for what it is worth, is how I remember my feelings. The sermon obviously made a deep impression on me, for I have remembered it and passed it on to you. To be fair, I don't think the preacher thought he was serving up a religious message. It was probably more military than religious, in the spirit of Tennyson's Charge of the Light Brigade, which he may well have quoted. Forward the Light Brigade! Was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldiers knew someone had blundered. Theirs not to make reply, theirs not to reason why, theirs but to do and die. Into the Valley of Death rode the Six Hundred. One of the earliest and scratchiest recordings of the human voice ever made is of Lord Tennyson himself reading this poem, and the impression of hollow declaiming down a long, dark tunnel from the depths of the past seems eerily appropriate. From the High Command's point of view, it would be madness to allow each individual soldier discretion over whether or not to obey orders. Nations whose infantrymen act on their own initiative, rather than following orders, will tend to lose wars. From the nation's point of view, this remains a good rule of thumb, even if it sometimes leads to individual disasters. Soldiers are drilled to become as much like automata or computers as possible. Computers do what they are told. They slavishly obey any instructions given in their own programming language. This is how they do useful things like word processing and spreadsheet calculations. But as an inevitable byproduct, they are equally robotic in obeying bad instructions. They have no way of telling whether an instruction will have a good effect or a bad. They simply obey as soldiers are supposed to. It is their unquestioning obedience that makes computers useful, and exactly the same thing makes them inescapably vulnerable to infection by software viruses and worms. A maliciously designed program that says, copy me and send me to every address that you find on this hard disk, will simply be obeyed, and then obeyed again by the other computers down the line to which it is sent in exponential expansion. It is difficult, perhaps impossible, to design a computer which is usefully obedient and at the same time immune to infection. If I've done my softening up work well, you will already have completed my argument about child brains and religion. Natural selection builds child brains with a tendency to believe whatever their parents and tribal elders tell them. Such trusting obedience is valuable for survival, the analogue of steering by the moon for a moth. But the flip side of trusting obedience is slavish gullibility. The inevitable byproduct is vulnerability to infection by mind viruses. For excellent reasons related to Darwinian survival, child brains need to trust parents and elders whom parents tell them to trust. An automatic consequence is that the truster has no way of distinguishing good advice from bad. The child cannot know that don't paddle in the crocodile-infested Limpopo is good advice, but you must sacrifice a goat at the time of the full moon, otherwise the rains will fail, is at best a waste of time and goats. Both admonitions sound equally trustworthy. Both come from a respected source and are delivered with a solemn earnestness that commands respect and demands obedience. The same goes for propositions about the world, about the cosmos, about morality, and about human nature. And very likely, when the child grows up and has children of her own, she will naturally pass the whole lot on to her own children, nonsense as well as sense, using the same infectious gravitas of manner. On this model, we should expect that in different geographical regions, different arbitrary beliefs, none of which have any factual basis, will be handed down to be believed with the same conviction as useful pieces of traditional wisdom, such as the belief that manure is good for the crops. We should also expect that superstitions and other non-factual beliefs will locally evolve, change over generations, 
either by random drift or by some sort of analogue of Darwinian selection, eventually showing a pattern of significant divergence from common ancestry. Languages drift apart from a common progenitor, given sufficient time in geographical separation. I shall return to this point in a moment. The same seems to be true of baseless and arbitrary beliefs and injunctions handed down the generations, beliefs that were perhaps given a fair wind by the useful programmability of the child brain. Religious leaders are well aware of the vulnerability of the child brain and the importance of getting the indoctrination in early. The Jesuit boast, Give me the child for his first seven years and I'll give you the man, is no less accurate or sinister for being hackneyed. In more recent times, James Dobson, founder of today's infamous Focus on the Family movement, is equally acquainted with the principle. Those who control what young people are taught and what they experience, what they see, hear, think and believe, will determine the future course for the nation. But remember, my specific suggestion about the useful gullibility of the child mind is only an example of the kind of thing that might be the analogue of moths navigating by the moon or the stars. The ethologist Robert Hind in Why Gods Persist and the anthropologists Pascal Boyer in Religion Explained and Scott Atran in In Gods We Trust have independently promoted the general idea of religion as a byproduct of normal psychological dispositions. Many byproducts, I should say, for the anthropologists especially, are concerned to emphasize the diversity of the world's religions as well as what they have in common. The findings of anthropologists seem weird to us only because they are unfamiliar. All religious beliefs seem weird to those not brought up in them. Boye did research on the Fang people of Cameroon, who believe that witches have an extra internal, animal-like organ that flies away at night and ruins other people's crops or poisons their blood. It is also said that these witches sometimes assemble for huge banquets where they devour their victims and plan future attacks. Many will tell you that a friend of a friend actually saw witches flying over the village at night, sitting on a banana leaf and throwing magical darts at various unsuspecting victims. Boye continues with a personal anecdote. I was mentioning these and other exotica over dinner in a Cambridge college when one of our guests, a prominent Cambridge theologian, turned to me and said, that is what makes anthropology so fascinating and so difficult, too. You have to explain how people can believe such nonsense. Which left me dumbfounded. The conversation had moved on before I could find a pertinent response to do with kettles and pots. Assuming that the Cambridge theologian was a mainstream Christian, he probably believed some combination of the following. In the time of the ancestors, a man was born to a virgin mother with no biological father being involved. The same fatherless man called out to a friend called Lazarus, who'd been dead long enough to stink, and Lazarus promptly came back to life. The fatherless man himself came alive after being dead and buried three days. Forty days later, the fatherless man went up to the top of a hill and then disappeared bodily into the sky. If you murmur thoughts privately in your head, the fatherless man and his father, who is also himself, will hear your thoughts and may act upon them. He is simultaneously able to hear the thoughts of everybody else in the world. If you do something bad or something good, the same fatherless man sees all, even if nobody else does. You may be rewarded or punished accordingly, including after your death. The fatherless man's virgin mother never died, but ascended bodily into heaven. Bread and wine, if blessed by a priest who must have testicles, become the body and blood of the fatherless man. What would an objective anthropologist coming fresh to this set of beliefs while on field work in Cambridge make of them? Psychologically primed for religion. The idea of psychological byproducts grows naturally out of the important and developing field of evolutionary psychology. Evolutionary psychologists suggest that, just as the eye is an evolved organ for seeing and the wing an evolved organ for flying, 
so the brain is a collection of organs, or modules, for dealing with a set of specialist data processing needs. There is a module for dealing with kinship, a module for dealing with reciprocal exchanges, a module for dealing with empathy, and so on. Religion can be seen as a byproduct of the misfiring of several of these modules. For example, the modules for forming theories of other minds, for forming coalitions, and for discriminating in favor of in-group members and against strangers. Any of these could serve as the human equivalent of the moth's celestial navigation, vulnerable to misfiring in the same kind of way as I suggested for childhood gullibility. The psychologist Paul Bloom, another advocate of the religion is a byproduct view, points out that children have a natural tendency towards a dualistic theory of mind. Religion, for him, is a byproduct of such instinctive dualism. We humans, he suggests, and especially children, are natural-born dualists. A dualist acknowledges a fundamental distinction between matter and mind. A monist, by contrast, believes that mind is a manifestation of matter, material in a brain or perhaps a computer, and cannot exist apart from matter. A dualist believes the mind is some kind of disembodied spirit that inhabits the body and therefore conceivably could leave the body and exist somewhere else. Dualists readily interpret mental illness as possession by devils, those devils being spirits whose residence in the body is temporary such that they might be cast out. Dualists personify inanimate physical objects at the slightest opportunity, seeing spirits and demons even in waterfalls and clouds. F. Anstey's 1882 novel Vice Versa makes sense to a dualist, but strictly should be incomprehensible to a dyed-in-the-wool monist like most scientists. Mr. Bultitude and his son mysteriously find that they have swapped bodies. The father, much to the son's glee, is obliged to go to school in the son's body, while the son, in the father's body, almost ruins the father's business through his immature decisions. A similar plotline was used by P.G. Woodhouse in Laughing Gas, where the Earl of Havershot and a child movie star go under the anaesthetic at the same moment in neighbouring dentist chairs and wake up in each other's bodies. Once again, the plot makes sense only to a dualist. There has to be something corresponding to Lord Havershot, which is no part of his body, otherwise how could he wake up in the body of a child actor? I am not a dualist but I am nevertheless easily capable of enjoying vice versa and laughing gas. Paul Bloom would say that is because, even though I have learned to be an intellectual monist, I am a human animal and therefore evolved as an instinctive dualist. The idea that there is a me perched somewhere behind my eyes and capable, at least in fiction, of migrating into somebody else's head is deeply ingrained in me and in every other human being, whatever our intellectual pretensions to monism. Bloom supports his contention with experimental evidence that children are even more likely to be dualists than adults are, especially extremely young children. This suggests that a tendency to dualism is built into the brain and, according to Bloom, provides a natural predisposition to embrace religious ideas. Bloom also suggests that we are innately predisposed to be creationists. Natural selection makes no intuitive sense. Children are especially likely to assign purpose to everything, as the psychologist Deborah Kellerman tells us in her article, Are Children Intuitive Theists? Clouds are foreraining. Pointy rocks are so that animals could scratch on them when they get itchy. The assignment of purpose to everything is called teleology. Children are native teleologists, and many never grow out of it. Native dualism and native teleology predispose us, given the right conditions, to religion, just as the moth's light compass reaction predisposed them to inadvertent suicide. Our innate dualism prepares us to believe in a soul which inhabits the body rather than being integrally part of the body. Such a disembodied spirit can easily be imagined to move on somewhere else after the death of the body. We can also easily imagine the existence of a deity as pure spirit, not an emergent property of complex matter, but existing independently of matter. Even more obviously, childish teleology sets us up for religion. If everything has a purpose, whose purpose is it?
gods, of course. But what is the counterpart of the usefulness of the moth's light compass? Why might natural selection have favoured dualism and teleology in the brains of our ancestors and their children? So far, my account of the innate dualist theory has simply posited that humans are natural-born dualists and teleologists. But what would the Darwinian advantage be? Predicting the behaviour of entities in our world is important for our survival, and we would expect natural selection to have shaped our brains to do it efficiently and fast. Might dualism and teleology serve us in this capacity? We may understand this hypothesis better in the light of what the philosopher Daniel Dennett has called the intentional stance. Dennett has offered a helpful three-way classification of the stances that we adopt in trying to understand, and hence predict, the behaviour of entities such as animals, machines, or each other. They are the physical stance, the design stance, and the intentional stance. The physical stance always works in principle because everything ultimately obeys the laws of physics. But working things out using the physical stance can be very slow. By the time we have sat down to calculate all the interactions of a complicated object's moving parts, our prediction of its behaviour will probably be too late. For an object that really is designed, like a washing machine or a crossbow, the design stance is an economical shortcut. We can guess how the object will behave by going over the head of physics and appealing directly to design. As Dennett says, Almost anyone can predict when an alarm clock will sound on the basis of the most casual inspection of its exterior. One does not know or care to know whether it is spring-wound, battery-driven, sunlight-powered, made of brass wheels and jewel bearings, or silicon chips. One just assumes that it is designed so that the alarm will sound when it is set to sound. Living things are not designed, but Darwinian natural selection licenses a version of the design stance for them. We get a short cut to understanding the heart if we assume that it is designed to pump blood. Carl von Frisch was led to investigate colour vision in bees, in the face of orthodox opinion that they were colour blind, because he assumed that the bright colours of flowers were designed to attract them. The quotation marks are designed to scare off mendacious creationists who might otherwise claim the great Austrian zoologist as one of their own. Needless to say, he was perfectly capable of translating the design stance into proper Darwinian terms. The intentional stance is another shortcut, and it goes one better than the design stance. An entity is assumed not merely to be designed for a purpose, but to be or contain an agent with intentions that guide its actions. When you see a tiger, you had better not delay your prediction of its probable behaviour, never mind the physics of its molecules, and never mind the design of its limbs, claws and teeth. That cat intends to eat you, and it will deploy its limbs, claws and teeth in flexible and resourceful ways to carry out its intention. The quickest way to second-guess its behaviour is to forget physics and physiology and cut to the intentional chase. Note that just as the design stance works even for things that were not actually designed as well as things that were, so the intentional stance works for things that don't have deliberate conscious intentions as well as things that do. It seems to me entirely plausible that the intentional stance has survival value as a brain mechanism that speeds up decision-making in dangerous circumstances and in crucial social situations. It is less immediately clear that dualism is a necessary concomitant of the intentional stance. I shan't pursue the matter here, but I think a case could be developed that some kind of theory of other minds, which could fairly be described as dualistic, is likely to underlie the intentional stance, especially in complicated social situations, and even more especially where higher order intentionality comes into play. Dennett speaks of third order intentionality. The man believed that the woman knew he wanted her. Fourth order. The woman realised that the man believed that the woman knew he wanted her, and even fifth-order intentionality. The shaman guessed that the woman realised that the man believed that the woman knew he wanted her. Very high orders of intentionality are probably confined to fiction, as satirised in Michael Frayn's hilarious novel The Tin Men.
Watching Nanopolos, Rick knew that he was almost certain that Anna felt a passionate contempt for Fiddling Child's failure to understand her feelings about Fiddling Child, and she knew too that Nina knew she knew about Nanopolos's knowledge. But the fact that we can laugh at such contortions of other mind inference in fiction is probably telling us something important about the way our minds have been naturally selected to work in the real world. In its lower orders at least, the intentional stance, like the design stance, saves time that might be vital to survival. Consequently, natural selection shaped brains to deploy the intentional stance as a shortcut. We are biologically programmed to impute intentions to entities whose behavior matters to us. Once again, Paul Bloom quotes experimental evidence that children are especially likely to adopt the intentional stance. When small babies see an object apparently following another object, for example on a computer screen, they assume that they are witnessing an active chase by an intentional agent, and they demonstrate the fact by registering surprise when the putative agent fails to pursue the chase. The design stance and the intentional stance are useful brain mechanisms, important for speeding up the second guessing of entities that really matter for survival, such as predators or potential mates. But like other brain mechanisms, these stances can misfire. Children and primitive peoples impute intentions to the weather, to waves and currents, to falling rocks. All of us are prone to do the same thing with machines, especially when they let us down. Many will remember with affection the day Basil Fawlty's car broke down during his vital mission to save Gourmet Night from disaster. He gave it fair warning counted to three, then got out of the car, seized a tree branch and thrashed it to within an inch of its life. Most of us have been there, at least momentarily with a computer if not with a car. Justin Barrett coined the acronym HAD for Hyperactive Agent Detection Device. We hyperactively detect agents where there are none, and this makes us suspect malice or benignity where in fact nature is only indifferent. I catch myself momentarily harboring savage resentment against some blameless inanimate, such as my bicycle chain. There was a poignant recent report of a man who tripped over his untied shoelace in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, fell down the stairs, and smashed three priceless Qing dynasty vases. He landed in the middle of the vases, and they splintered into a million pieces. He was still sitting there, stunned, when staff appeared. Everyone stood around in silence, as if in shock. The man kept pointing to his shoelace, saying, There it is. That's the culprit. Other byproduct explanations of religion have been proposed by Hind, Shermer, Boye, Atron, Bloom, Dennett, Kellerman, and others. One especially intriguing possibility mentioned by Dennett is that the irrationality of religion is a byproduct of a particular built-in irrationality mechanism in the brain, our tendency, which presumably has genetic advantages, to fall in love. The anthropologist Helen Fisher, in Why We Love, has beautifully expressed the insanity of romantic love, and how over the top it is compared with what might seem strictly necessary. Look at it this way. From the point of view of a man, say, it is unlikely that any one woman of his acquaintance is a hundred times more lovable than her nearest competitor, Yet that is how he is like. And give others the benefit of the doubt. Then repay good deeds with good, but avenge bad deeds. In game theory language, this strategy, or family of related strategies, goes under various names including tit-for-tat, retaliator, and reciprocator. It is evolutionarily stable under some conditions in the sense that, given a population dominated by reciprocators, no single nasty individual and no single unconditionally nice individual will do better. There are other, more complicated variants of tit-for-tat which can, in some circumstances, do better. I've mentioned kinship and reciprocation as the twin pillars of altruism in a Darwinian world, but there are secondary structures which rest atop those main pillars. Especially in human society, with language and gossip, reputation is important. One individual may have a reputation for kindness and generosity. Another individual may have a reputation for unreliability, for cheating and reneging on deals. Another may have a reputation for generosity when trust has been built up, but for ruthless punishment of cheating. 
The unadorned theory of reciprocal altruism expects animals of any species to base their behavior upon unconscious responsiveness to such traits in their fellows. In human societies, we add the power of language to spread reputations, usually in the form of gossip. You don't need to have suffered personally from X's failure to buy his round at the pub. You hear on the grapevine that X is a tightwad, or to add an ironic complication to the example. That why is a terrible gossip. Reputation is important, and biologists can acknowledge a Darwinian survival value in not just being a good reciprocator, but fostering a reputation as a good reciprocator too. Matt Ridley's *The Origins of Virtue*, as well as being, is not confined to humans. It has recently been shown to apply to one of the clan animals. The symbiotic relationship diligent cleaners were more likely to be chosen by the client. Than rival Labroin and Veblen's concept of conspicuous consumption strikes a chord with many observers of the modern scene. Sir Harvey's contribution, unregarded by biologists for many years until vindicated by brilliant mathematical models from the theorist Alan Graffan, has been to provide an evolutionary altruistic act would look first for reciprocation and kinship relationships among the birds. When a babbler feeds a companion. Is it in the expectation of being fed at a later date, or is the recipient of the favour a close genetic succession? Is radically unexpected. Dominant babblers assert their dominance by feeding subordinates, equivalent of "Look how superior I am to you. I can afford to give you food," or "Look how superior I am. I can afford to make myself vulnerable to hawks by sitting on a high branch, acting as a sentinel to warn the rest of the flock feeding on the ground." The observations of Zahavi and his colleagues suggest that babblers actively compete for the dangerous role of sentinel, and when a subordinate babbler attempts to offer food to a dominant individual, the apparent generosity is violently rebuffed. The essence of Zahavi's idea is that advertisements of superiority are authenticated by their cost. Only a genuinely superior individual can afford to advertise the fact by means of a costly gift. Individuals buy success, for example, in attracting mates, through costly demonstrations of superiority, including ostentatious generosity and public-spirited risk-taking. We now have four good Darwinian reasons for individuals to be altruistic, generous, or moral towards each other. First, there is the special case of genetic kinship. Second, there is reciprocation. The repayment of favors given and the giving of favors in anticipation of payback. Following on from this, there is third the Darwinian benefit of acquiring a reputation for generosity and kindness, and fourth, if Sir Harvey is right, there is the particular additional benefit of conspicuous generosity as a way of buying unfakeably authentic advertising. Through most of our prehistory, humans lived under conditions that would have strongly favoured the evolution of all four kinds of altruism. We lived in villages, or earlier in discrete roving bands like baboons, partially isolated from neighbouring bands or villages. Most of your fellow band members would have been kin, more closely related to you than members of other bands. Plenty of opportunities for kin altruism to evolve, and whether kin or not. You would tend to meet the same individuals again and again throughout your life, ideal conditions for the evolution of reciprocal altruism. Those are also the ideal conditions for building a reputation for altruism, and the very same ideal conditions for advertising conspicuous generosity. By any or all of the four routes, genetic tendencies towards altruism would have been favoured in early humans. It is easy to see why our prehistoric ancestors would have been good to their own in-group, but bad to the point of xenophobia towards other groups. But why, now that most of us live in big cities where we are no longer surrounded by kin and where every day we meet individuals whom we are never going to meet again, why are we still so good to each other, even sometimes to others who might be thought to belong to an out-group? It is important not to misstate the reach of natural selection. Selection does not favour the evolution of a cognitive awareness of what is good for your genes. That awareness had to wait for the 20th century to reach a cognitive level, and even now, full understanding 
is confined to a minority of scientific specialists. What natural selection favors is rules of thumb, which work in practice to promote the genes that built them. Rules of thumb by their nature sometimes misfire. In a bird's brain, the rule, look after small squawking things in your nest and drop food into their red gapes, typically has the effect of preserving the genes that built the rule, because the squawking, gaping objects in an adult bird's nest are normally its own offspring. The rule misfires if another baby bird somehow gets into the nest, a circumstance that is positively engineered by cuckoos. Could it be that our good Samaritan urges are misfirings, analogous to the misfiring of a reed warbler's parental instincts when it works itself to the bone for a young cuckoo? An even closer analogy is the human urge to adopt a child. I must rush to add that misfiring is intended only in a strictly Darwinian sense. It carries no suggestion of the pejorative. The mistake or byproduct idea which I'm espousing works like this. Natural selection in ancestral times when we lived in small and stable bands like baboons programmed into our brains altruistic urges alongside sexual urges, hunger urges, xenophobic urges, and so on. An intelligent couple can read their Darwin and know that the ultimate reason for their sexual urges is procreation. They know that the woman cannot conceive because she is on the pill, yet they find that their sexual desire is in no way diminished by the knowledge. Sexual desire is sexual desire, and its force in an individual's psychology is independent of the ultimate Darwinian pressure that drove it. It is a strong urge which exists independently of its ultimate rationale. I am suggesting that the same is true of the urge to kindness, to altruism, to generosity, to empathy, to pity. In ancestral times, we had the opportunity to be altruistic only towards close kin and potential reciprocators. Nowadays, that restriction is no longer there, but the rule of thumb persists. Why would it not? It is just like sexual desire. We can no more help ourselves feeling pity when we see a weeping unfortunate, who is unrelated and unable to reciprocate, than we can help ourselves feeling lust for a member of the opposite sex, who may be infertile or otherwise unable to reproduce. Both are misfirings, Darwinian mistakes, blessed, precious mistakes. Do not for one moment think of such Darwinizing as demeaning or reductive of the noble emotions of compassion and generosity. Nor of sexual desire. Sexual desire, when channeled through the cumlets of linguistic culture, emerges as great poetry and drama, John Donne's love poems say, or Romeo and Juliet. And of course, the same thing happens with the misfired redirection of kin and reciprocation-based compassion. Mercy to a debtor is, when seen out of context, as un-Darwinian as adopting someone else's child. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. Sexual lust is the driving force behind a large proportion of human ambition and struggle, and much of it constitutes a misfiring. There is no reason why the same should not be true of the lust to be generous and compassionate if this is the misfired consequence of ancestral village life. The best way for natural selection to build in both kinds of lust in ancestral times was to install rules of thumb in the brain. Those rules still influence us today, even where circumstances make them inappropriate to their original functions. Such rules of thumb influence us still, not in a Calvinistically deterministic way, but filtered through the civilizing influences of literature and custom, law and tradition, and, of course, religion. Just as the primitive brain rule of sexual lust passes through the filter of civilization to emerge in the love scenes of Romeo and Juliet, so primitive brain rules of us versus them, vendetta, emerge in the form of the running battles between Capulets and Montagues, while primitive brain rules of altruism and empathy end up in the misfiring that cheers us in the chastened reconciliation of Shakespeare's final scene. A case study in the roots of morality. If our moral sense, like our sexual desire, is indeed rooted deep in our Darwinian past predating religion, we should expect that research on the human mind would reveal some moral universals, crossing geographical and cultural barriers and also, crucially, religious barriers. 
The Harvard biologist Mark Hauser, in his book Moral Minds: How Nature Designed Our Universal Sense of Right and Wrong, has enlarged upon a fruitful line of thought experiments originally suggested by moral philosophers. Hauser's study will serve the additional purpose of introducing the way moral philosophers think. A hypothetical moral dilemma is posed, and the difficulty we experience in answering it tells us something about our sense of right and wrong. Where Hauser goes beyond the philosophers is that he actually does statistical surveys and psychological experiments, using questionnaires on the internet, for example, to investigate the moral sense of real people. From the present point of view. The interesting thing is that most people come to the same decisions when faced with these dilemmas, and their agreement over the decisions themselves is stronger than their ability to articulate their reasons. That is what we should expect if we have a moral sense which is built into our brains, like our sexual instinct or our fear of heights, or, as Hauser himself prefers to say, like our capacity for language. The details vary from culture to culture, but the underlying deep structure of grammar. Is universal. As we shall see, the way people respond to these moral tests and their inability to articulate their reasons seems largely independent of their religious beliefs or lack of them. The message of Hauser's book, to anticipate it in his own words, is this: Driving our moral judgments is a universal moral grammar, a faculty of the mind that evolved over millions of years to include a set of principles for building a range of possible moral systems. As with language, the principles that make up our moral grammar fly beneath the radar of our awareness. Typical of Hauser's moral dilemmas are variations on the theme of a runaway truck or trolley on a railway line, which threatens to kill a number of people. The simplest story imagines a person, Denise, standing by a set of points and in a position to divert the trolley onto a siding, thereby saving the lives of five people trapped on the main line ahead. Unfortunately, there is a man trapped on the siding, but since he is only one, outnumbered by the five people trapped on the main track, most people agree that it is morally permissible, if not obligatory, for Denise to throw the switch and save the five by killing the one. We ignore hypothetical possibilities such as that the one man on the siding might be Beethoven or a close friend. Elaborations of the thought experiment present a series of increasingly teasing moral conundrums. What if the trolley can be stopped by dropping a large weight in its path from a bridge overhead? That's easy. Obviously, we must drop the weight. But what if the only large weight available is a very fat man sitting on the bridge admiring the sunset? Almost everybody agrees that it is immoral to push the fat man off the bridge, even though, from one point of view. The dilemma might seem parallel to Denise's, where throwing the switch kills one to save five. Most of us have a strong intuition that there is a crucial difference between the two cases, though we may not be able to articulate what it is. Pushing the fat man off the bridge is reminiscent of another dilemma considered by Hauser. Five patients in a hospital are dying, each with a different organ failing. Each would be saved if a donor could be found for their particular faulty organ, but none is available. Then the surgeon notices that there is a healthy man in the waiting room, all five of whose organs are in good working order and suitable for transplanting. In this case, almost nobody can be found who is prepared to say that the moral act is to kill the one to save the five. As with the fat man on the bridge, the intuition that most of us share. Is that an innocent bystander should not suddenly be dragged into a bad situation and used for the sake of others without his consent? Immanuel Kant famously articulated the principle that a rational being should never be used as merely an unconsenting means to an end, even the end of benefiting others. This seems to provide the crucial difference between the case of the fat man on the bridge, or the man in the hospital waiting room, and the man on Denise's siding. The fat man on the bridge is being positively used as the means to stop the runaway trolley. This clearly violates the Kantian principle. The person on the siding is not being used to save the lives of the five people on the line. It is the siding that is being used, and he just has the bad luck to be standing on it. But when you put the distinction like that, why does it satisfy us? 
For Kant, it was a moral absolute. For Hauser, it is built into us by our evolution. The hypothetical situations involving the runaway trolley become increasingly ingenious and the moral dilemmas correspondingly tortuous. Hauser contrasts the dilemmas faced by hypothetical individuals called Ned and Oscar. Ned is standing by the railway track. Unlike Denise, who could divert the trolley onto a siding, Ned's switch diverts it onto a side loop, which joins the main track again just before the five people. Simply switching the points doesn't help. The trolley will plow into the five anyway when the diversion rejoins the main track. However, as it happens, there is an extremely fat man on the diversionary track who is heavy enough to stop the trolley. Should Ned change the points and divert the train? Most people's intuition is that he should not. But what is the difference between Ned's dilemma and Denise's? Presumably, people are intuitively applying Kant's principle. Denise diverts the trolley from ploughing into the five people, and the unfortunate casualty on the siding is collateral damage, to use the charmingly Rumsfeldian phrase. He's not being used by Denise to save the others. Ned is actually using the fat man to stop the trolley, and most people, perhaps unthinkingly, along with Kant, thinking it out in great detail, See this as a crucial difference. The difference is brought out again by the dilemma of Oscar. Oscar's situation is identical to Ned's, except that there is a large iron weight on the diversionary loop of track, heavy enough to stop the trolley. Clearly, Oscar should have no problem in deciding to pull the points and divert the trolley, except that there happens to be a hiker walking in front of the iron weight. He will certainly be killed if Oscar pulls the switch, just as surely as Ned's fat man. The difference is that Oscar's hiker is not being used to stop the trolley. He is collateral damage, as in Denise's dilemma. Like Hauser, and like most of Hauser's experimental subjects, I feel that Oscar is permitted to throw the switch, but Ned is not. But I also find it quite hard to justify my intuition. Hauser's point is that such moral intuitions are often not well thought out, but that we feel them strongly anyway because of our evolutionary heritage. In an intriguing venture into anthropology, Hauser and his colleagues adapted their moral experiments to the Kuna, a small Central American tribe with little contact with Westerners and no formal religion. The researchers changed the trolley-on-a-line thought experiment to locally suitable equivalents, such as crocodiles swimming towards canoes. With corresponding minor differences, the Kuna show the same moral judgments as the rest of us. Of particular interest for this book, Hauser also wondered whether religious people differ from atheists in their moral intuitions. Surely, if we get our morality from religion, they should differ. But it seems that they don't. Hauser, working with the moral philosopher Peter Singer, focused on three hypothetical dilemmas and compared the verdicts of atheists with those of religious people. In each case, the subjects were asked to choose whether a hypothetical action is morally obligatory, permissible, or forbidden. The three dilemmas were... 1. Denise's Dilemma 90% of people said it was permissible to divert the trolley, killing the one to save the five. 2. You see a child drowning in a pond and there is no other help in sight. You can save the child, but your trousers will be ruined in the process. 97% agreed that you should save the child. Amazingly, 3% apparently would prefer to save their trousers. 3. The organ transplant dilemma described above. 97% of subjects agreed that it is morally forbidden to seize the healthy person in the waiting room and kill him for his organs, thereby saving five other people. The main conclusion of Hauser and Singer's study was that there is no statistically significant difference between atheists and religious believers in making these judgments. This seems compatible with the view, which I and many others hold, that we do not need God in order to be good or evil. If there is no God, why be good? Posed like that, the question sounds positively ignoble. When a religious person puts it to me in this way, and many of them do, my immediate temptation is to issue the following challenge. Do you really mean to tell me the only reason you try to be good 
is to gain God's approval and reward, or to avoid his disapproval and punishment. That's not morality. That's just sucking up, apple polishing, looking over your shoulder at the great surveillance camera in the sky, or the still small wiretap inside your head, monitoring your every move, even your every base thought. As Einstein said, If people are good only because they fear punishment and hope for reward, then we are a sorry lot indeed. Michael Shermer, in The Science of Good and Evil, calls it a debate stopper. If you agree that in the absence of God you would commit robbery, rape and murder, you reveal yourself as an immoral person, and we would be well advised to steer a wide course around you. If, on the other hand, you admit that you would continue to be a good person even when not under divine surveillance, you have fatally undermined your claim that God is necessary for us to be good. I suspect that quite a lot of religious people do think religion is what motivates them to be good, especially if they belong to one of those faiths that systematically exploits personal guilt. It seems to me to require quite a low self-regard to think that, should belief in God suddenly vanish from the world, we would all become callous and selfish hedonists with no kindness, no charity, no generosity, nothing that would deserve the name of goodness. It is widely believed that Dostoevsky was of that opinion, presumably because of some remarks he put into the mouth of Ivan Karamazov. Ivan solemnly observed that there was absolutely no law of nature to make man love humanity, and that if love did exist, and had existed at all in the world up to now, then it was not by virtue of the natural law, but entirely because man believed in his own immortality. He added as an aside that it was precisely that which constituted the natural law, namely that once man's faith in his own immortality was destroyed, not only would his capacity for love be exhausted, but so would the vital forces that sustain life on this earth. And furthermore, nothing would be immoral then, everything would be permitted, even anthropophagy. And finally, as though all this were not enough, he declared that for every individual, such as you and me, for example, who does not believe either in God or in his own immortality, the natural law is bound immediately to become the complete opposite of the religion-based law that preceded it, and that egoism, even extending to the perpetration of crime, would not only be permissible, but would be recognized as the essential, the most rational, and even the noblest raison d'être of the human condition. Perhaps naively, I have inclined towards a less cynical view of human nature than Ivan Karamazov. Do we really need policing, whether by God or by each other, in order to stop us from behaving in a selfish and criminal manner? I dearly want to believe that I do not need such surveillance, and nor, dear reader, do you. On the other hand, just to weaken our confidence, listen to Stephen Pinker's disillusioning experience of a police strike in Montreal, which he describes in The Blank Slate. As a young teenager in proudly peaceable Canada during the romantic 1960s, I was a true believer in Bakunin's anarchism. I laughed off my parents' argument that if the government ever laid down its arms, all hell would break loose. Our competing predictions were put to the test at 8 a.m. on October the 17th, 1969, when the Montreal police went on strike. By 11.20 a.m., the first bank was robbed. By noon, most downtown stores had closed because of looting. Within a few more hours, taxi drivers burned down the garage of a limousine service that competed with them for airport customers. A rooftop sniper killed a provincial police officer, rioters broke into several hotels and restaurants, and a doctor slew a burglar in his suburban home. By the end of the day, six banks had been robbed, a hundred shops had been looted, twelve fires had been set, Forty carloads of storefront glass had been broken, and three million dollars in property damage had been inflicted before city authorities had to call in the army and, of course, the Mounties to restore order. This decisive empirical test left my politics in tatters. Perhaps I, too, am a Pollyanna to believe that people would remain good when unobserved and unpoliced by God. On the other hand, the majority of the population of Montreal presumably believed in God. Why didn't the fear of God restrain them when earthly policemen were temporarily removed from the scene? Wasn't the Montreal strike a pretty good natural experiment to test the hypothesis that belief in God makes us good? 
Or did the cynic H. L. Mencken get it right when he tartly observed, People say we need religion when what they really mean is we need police. Obviously, not everybody in Montreal behaved badly as soon as the police were off the scene. It would be interesting to know whether there was any statistical tendency, however slight, for religious believers to loot and destroy less than unbelievers. My uninformed prediction would have been opposite. It is often cynically said that there are no atheists in foxholes. I'm inclined to suspect, with some evidence, although it may be simplistic to draw conclusions from it, that there are very few atheists in prisons. I'm not necessarily claiming that atheism increases morality, although humanism, the ethical system that often goes with atheism, probably does. Another good possibility is that atheism is correlated with some third factor, such as higher education, intelligence or reflectiveness, which might counteract criminal impulses. Such research evidence as there is certainly doesn't support the common view that religiosity is positively correlated with morality. Correlational evidence is never conclusive, but the following data, described by Sam Harris in his Letter to a Christian Nation, are nevertheless striking. While political party affiliation in the United States is not a perfect indicator of religiosity, it is no secret that the red, Republican states, are primarily red due to the overwhelming political influence of conservative Christians. If there were a strong correlation between Christian conservatism and societal health, we might expect to see some sign of it in red state America. We don't. Of the 25 cities with the lowest rates of violent crime, 62% are in blue, Democrat states, and 38% are in red, Republican states. Of the 25 most dangerous cities, 76% are in red states and 24% are in blue states. In fact, three of the five most dangerous cities in the U.S. are in the pious state of Texas. Twelve states with the highest rates of burglary are red. Twenty-four of the twenty-nine states with the highest rates of theft are red. Of the twenty-two states with the highest rates of murder, seventeen are red. Note that these color conventions in America are exactly the opposite of those in Britain, where blue is the color of the Conservative Party and red, as in the rest of the world, is the color traditionally associated with the political left. Systematic research, if anything, tends to support such correlational data. Dan Dennett, in Breaking the Spell, sardonically comments, not on Harris's book in particular, but on such studies generally, Needless to say, these results strike so hard at the standard claims of greater moral virtue among the religious that there has been a considerable surge of further research initiated by religious organizations attempting to refute them. One thing we can be sure of is that if there is a significant positive relationship between moral behavior and religious affiliation, practice or belief, it will soon be discovered, since so many religious organizations are eager to confirm their traditional beliefs about this scientifically. They are quite impressed with the truth-finding power of science when it supports what they already believe. Every month that passes without such a demonstration underlines the suspicion that it just isn't so. Most thoughtful people would agree that morality in the absence of policing is somehow more truly moral than the kind of false morality that vanishes as soon as the police go on strike or the spy camera is switched off, whether the spy camera is a real one monitored in the police station or an imaginary one in heaven. But it is perhaps unfair to interpret the question, if there is no God, why bother to be good, in such a cynical way. A religious thinker could offer a more genuinely moral interpretation along the lines of the following statement from an imaginary apologist. If you don't believe in God, you don't believe there are any absolute standards of morality. With the best will in the world, you may intend to be a good person, but how do you decide what is good and what is bad? Only religion can ultimately provide your standards of good and evil. Without religion, you have to make it up as you go along. That would be morality without a rule book, morality flying by the seat of its pants. If morality is merely a matter of choice, Hitler could claim to be moral by his own eugenically inspired standards and all the atheist can do is make a personal choice to live by different lights. The Christian, the Jew, or the Muslim, by contrast, can claim that evil has an absolute meaning, true for all time and in all places, according to which Hitler was absolutely evil. 
Even if it were true that we need God to be moral, it would of course not make God's existence more likely, merely more desirable. Many people cannot tell the difference. But that is not the issue here. The imaginary religious apologist has no need to admit that sucking up to God is the religious motive for doing good. Rather, his claim is that wherever the motive to be good comes from, without God, there would be no standard for deciding what is good. We could each make up our own definition of the good and behave accordingly. Moral principles that are based only upon religion, as opposed to, say, the golden rule which is often associated with religions but can be derived from elsewhere, may be called absolutist. Good is good, and bad is bad, and we don't mess around deciding particular cases by whether, for example, somebody suffers. The religious apologist would claim that only religion can provide a basis for deciding what is good. Some philosophers, notably Kant, have tried to derive absolute morals from non-religious sources. Though ostensibly a religious man himself, as was almost obligatory in his time, Kant tried to base a morality on duty for duty's sake, rather than for God's. His famous categorical imperative enjoins us to Act only on that maxim whereby thou canst at the same time will that it should become a universal law. This works tidily for the example of telling lies. Imagine a world in which people told lies as a matter of principle, where lying was regarded as a good and moral thing to do. In such a world, Lying itself would cease to have any meaning. Lying needs a presumption of truth for its very definition. If a moral principle is something we should wish everybody to follow, lying cannot be a moral principle because the principle itself would break down in meaninglessness. Lying, as a rule for life, is inherently unstable. More generally, selfishness, or free-riding parasitism on the goodwill of others, may work for me as a lone selfish individual and give me personal satisfaction. But I cannot wish that everybody would adopt selfish parasitism as a moral principle, if only because then I would have nobody to parasitize. The Kantian imperative seems to work for truth-telling and some other cases. It's not so easy to see how to broaden it to morality generally. Kant notwithstanding, it is tempting to agree with the hypothetical apologist that absolutist morals are usually driven by religion. Is it always wrong to put a terminally ill patient out of her misery at her own request? Is it always wrong to make love to a member of your own sex? Is it always wrong to kill an embryo? There are those who believe so, and their grounds are absolute. They brook no argument or debate. Anybody who disagrees deserves to be shot, metaphorically, of course, not literally, except in the case of some doctors in American abortion clinics. See next chapter. Fortunately, however, morals do not have to be absolute. Moral philosophers are the professionals when it comes to thinking about right and wrong. As Robert Hind succinctly put it, they agree that moral precepts, while not necessarily constructed by reason, should be defensible by reason. They classify themselves in many ways, but in modern terminology the major divide is between deontologists, such as Kant, and consequentialists, including utilitarians such as Jeremy Bentham, 1748-1832. Deontology is a fancy name for the belief that morality consists in the obeying of rules. It is literally the science of duty, from the Greek, for that which is binding. Deontology is not quite the same thing as moral absolutism, but for most purposes in a book about religion, there is no need to dwell on the distinction. Absolutists believe there are absolutes of right and wrong, imperatives whose rightness makes no reference to their consequences. Consequentialists more pragmatically hold that the morality of an action should be judged by its consequences. One version of consequentialism is utilitarianism, the philosophy associated with Bentham, his friend James Mill, 1773 to 1836, and Mill's son John Stuart Mill. 1806-73. Utilitarianism is often summed up in Bentham's unfortunately imprecise catchphrase, The greatest happiness of the greatest number is the foundation of morals and legislation. Not all absolutism is derived from religion. Nevertheless, it is pretty hard to defend absolutist morals on grounds other than religious ones. The only competitor I can think of is 
patriotism, especially in times of war. As the distinguished Spanish film director Luis Buñuel said, God and country are an unbeatable team. They break all records for oppression and bloodshed. Recruiting officers rely heavily on their victims' sense of patriotic duty. In the First World War, women handed out white feathers to young men not in uniform. Oh, we don't want to lose you, but we think you ought to go, for your king and your country both need you so. People despised conscientious objectors, even those of the enemy country, because patriotism was held to be an absolute virtue. It is hard to get much more absolute than the "my country, right or wrong" of the professional soldier. For the slogan commits you to kill whomever the politicians of some future date might choose to call enemies. Consequentialist reasoning may influence the political decision to go to war, but once war is declared, absolutist patriotism takes over with a force and a power not otherwise seen outside religion. A soldier who allows his own thoughts of consequentialist morality to persuade him not to go over the top would likely find himself court-martialed. And even executed. The springboard for this discussion of moral philosophy was a hypothetical religious claim that, without a god, morals are relative and arbitrary. Kant and other sophisticated moral philosophers apart, and with due recognition given to patriotic fervor, the preferred source of absolute morality is usually a holy book of some kind, interpreted as having an authority far beyond its history's capacity to justify. Indeed, adherents of scriptural authority show distressingly little curiosity about the normally highly dubious historical origins of their holy books. The next chapter will demonstrate that, in any case, people who claim to derive their morals from scripture do not really do so in practice, and a very good thing too, as they themselves, on reflection, should agree. Chapter Seven: The Good Book. And the changing moral zeitgeist. Politics has slain its thousands, but religion has slain its tens of thousands. Sean O'Casey. There are two ways in which Scripture might be a source of morals or rules for living. One is by direct instruction, for example, through the Ten Commandments, which are the subject of such bitter contention in the culture wars of America's boondocks. The other is by example. God or some other biblical character might serve as, to use the contemporary jargon, a role model. Both scriptural roots, if followed through religiously, the adverb is used in its metaphoric sense, but with an eye to its origin, encourage a system of morals which any civilized modern person, whether religious or not, would find, I can put it no more gently, obnoxious. To be fair, much of the Bible is not systematically evil. But just plain weird, as you would expect of a chaotically cobbled together anthology of disjointed documents, composed, revised, translated, distorted, and improved by hundreds of anonymous authors, editors, and copyists, unknown to us and mostly unknown to each other, spanning nine centuries. This may explain some of the sheer strangeness of the Bible, but unfortunately, it is this same weird volume that religious zealots hold up to us. As the inerrant source of our morals and rules for living, those who wish to base their morality literally on the Bible have either not read it or not understood it, as Bishop John Shelby Spong in *The Sins of Scripture* rightly observed. Bishop Spong, by the way, is a nice example of a liberal bishop whose beliefs are so advanced as to be almost unrecognisable to the majority of those who call themselves Christians. A British counterpart is Richard Holloway. Recently retired as Bishop of Edinburgh, Bishop Holloway even describes himself as a recovering Christian. I had a public discussion with him in Edinburgh, which was one of the most stimulating and interesting encounters I've had. The Old Testament. Begin in Genesis with the well-loved story of Noah, derived from the Babylonian myth of Uta Napishtim, and known from the older mythologies of several cultures. The legend of the animals going into the ark two by two is charming, but the moral of the story of Noah is appalling. God took a dim view of humans, so he, with the exception of one family, drowned the lot of them, including children, and also, for good measure, 
the rest of the presumably blameless animals as well. Of course irritated theologians will protest that we don't take the book of Genesis literally anymore, but that is the whole point. We pick and choose which bits of scripture to believe, which bits to write off as symbols or allegories. Such picking and choosing is a matter of personal decision, just as much or as little as the atheist decision to follow this moral precept or that was a personal decision, without an absolute foundation. If one of these is morality flying by the seat of its pants, so is the other. In any case, despite the good intentions of the sophisticated theologian, a frighteningly large number of people still do take their scriptures, including the story of Noah, literally. According to Gallup, they include approximately 50% of the U.S. electorate. Also, no doubt, many of those Asian holy men who blamed the 2004 tsunami not on a plate tectonic shift, but on human sins, ranging from drinking and dancing in bars to breaking some footling Sabbath rule. Steeped in the story of Noah, and ignorant of all except biblical learning, who can blame them? Their whole education has led them to view natural disasters as bound up with human affairs, paybacks for human misdemeanors, rather than anything so impersonal as plate tectonics. By the way, what presumptuous egocentricity to believe that earth-shaking events, on the scale at which a god or a tectonic plate might operate, must always have a human connection. Why should a divine being, with creation and eternity on his mind, care a fig for petty human malefactions? We humans give ourselves such airs, even aggrandizing our pokey little sins to the level of cosmic significance. When I interviewed for television the Reverend Michael Bray, a prominent American anti-abortion activist, I asked him why evangelical Christians were so obsessed with private sexual inclinations, such as homosexuality, which didn't interfere with anybody else's life. His reply invoked something like self-defense. Innocent citizens are at risk of becoming collateral damage when God chooses to strike a town with a natural disaster because it houses sinners. In 2005, the fine city of New Orleans was catastrophically flooded in the aftermath of a hurricane, Katrina. The Reverend Pat Robertson, one of America's best-known televangelists and a former presidential candidate, was reported as blaming the hurricane on a lesbian comedian who happened to live in New Orleans. You'd think an omnipotent god would adopt a slightly more targeted approach to zapping sinners, a judicious heart attack perhaps, rather than the wholesale destruction of an entire city just because it happened to be the domicile of one lesbian comedian. In November 2005, the citizens of Dover, Pennsylvania, voted off their local school board the entire slate of fundamentalists who had brought the town notoriety, not to say ridicule, by attempting to enforce the teaching of intelligent design. When Pat Robertson heard that the fundamentalists had been democratically defeated at the ballot, he offered a stern warning to Dover. I'd like to say to the good citizens of Dover, if there is a disaster in your area, don't turn to God. You just rejected him from your city, and don't wonder why he hasn't helped you when problems begin, if they begin, and I'm not saying they will, but if they do, just remember, you just voted God out of your city, and if that's the case, then don't ask for his help, because he might not be there. Pat Robertson would be harmless comedy were he less typical of those who today hold power and influence in the United States. In the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Noah equivalent, chosen to be spared with his family because he was uniquely righteous, was Abraham's nephew Lot. Two male angels were sent to Sodom to warn Lot to leave the city before the brimstone arrived. Lot hospitably welcomed the angels into his house, whereupon all the men of Sodom gathered around and demanded that Lot should hand the angels over so that they could, what else, sodomize them. Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. Genesis 19, 5 Yes, no has the authorized version's usual euphemistic meaning, which is very funny in the context. Lot's gallantry in refusing the demand suggests that God might have been on to something when he singled him out as the only good man in Sodom. But Lot's halo is tarnished by the terms of his refusal. I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. 
Behold now, I have two daughters, which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. Genesis 19, 7-8 Whatever else this strange story might mean, it surely tells us something about the respect accorded to women in this intensely religious culture. As it happened, Lot's bargaining away of his daughter's virginity proved unnecessary, for the angels succeeded in repelling the marauders by miraculously striking them blind. They then warned Lot to decamp immediately with his family and his animals, because the city was about to be destroyed. The whole household escaped with the exception of Lot's unfortunate wife, whom the Lord turned into a pillar of salt, because she committed the offence, comparatively mild one might have thought, of looking over her shoulder at the fireworks display. Lot's two daughters make a brief reappearance in the story. After their mother was turned into a pillar of salt, they lived with their father in a cave up a mountain. Starved of male company, they decided to make their father drunk and copulate with him. Lot was beyond noticing when his elder daughter arrived in his bed or when she left, but he was not too drunk to impregnate her. The next night, the two daughters agreed it was the younger one's turn. Again, Lot was too drunk to notice, and he impregnated her too. Genesis 19, 31-6 If this dysfunctional family was the best Sodom had to offer by way of morals, some might begin to feel a certain sympathy with God and his judicial brimstone. The story of Lot and the Sodomites is eerily echoed in chapter 19 of the book of Judges, where an unnamed Levite priest was travelling with his concubine in Gibeah. They spent the night in the house of a hospitable old man. While they were eating their supper, the men of the city came and beat on the door, demanding that the old man should hand over his male guest, so that we may know him. In almost exactly the same words as Lot, the old man said, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly. Seeing that this man is come into mine house, do not this folly. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man, do not so vile a thing. Judges 19, 23-4 Again, the misogynistic ethos comes through loud and clear. I find the phrase, humble ye them, particularly chilling. Enjoy yourselves by humiliating and raping my daughter and this priest's concubine, but show a proper respect for my guest who is, after all, male. In spite of the similarity between the two stories, the denouement was less happy for the Levite's concubine than for Lot's daughters. The Levite handed her over to the mob, who gang-raped her all night. They knew her, and abused her all the night until the morning, and when the day began to spring, they let her go. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day, and fell down at the door of the man's house where her lord was, till it was light. Judges 19, 25-6 In the morning, the Levite found his concubine lying prostrate on the doorstep, and said, with what we today might see as callous abruptness, Up, and let us be going. But she didn't move. She was dead. So he took a knife and laid hold on his concubine and divided her, together with her bones, into twelve pieces and sent her into all the coasts of Israel. Yes, you read correctly. Look it up in Judges 19.29. Let's charitably put it down again to the ubiquitous weirdness of the Bible. This story is so similar to that of Lot, one can't help wondering whether a fragment of manuscript became accidentally misplaced in some long-forgotten scriptorium, an illustration of the erratic provenance of sacred texts. Lot's uncle Abraham was the founding father of all three great monotheistic religions. His patriarchal status renders him only somewhat less likely than God to be taken as a role model. But what modern moralist would wish to follow him? Relatively early in his long life, Abraham went to Egypt to tough out a famine with his wife Sarah. He realized that such a beautiful woman would be desirable to the Egyptians, and that therefore his own life as her husband might be endangered. So he decided to pass her off as his sister. In this capacity she was taken into Pharaoh's harem, 
and Abraham consequently became rich in Pharaoh's favor. God disapproved of this cozy arrangement and sent plagues on Pharaoh and his house. Why not on Abraham? An understandably aggrieved Pharaoh demanded to know why Abraham had not told him Sarah was his wife. He then handed her back to Abraham and kicked them both out of Egypt. Genesis 12, 18 to 19. Weirdly, it seems that the couple later tried to pull the same stunt again, this time with Abimelech, the king of Gerar. He, too, was induced by Abraham to marry Sarah, again having been led to believe she was Abraham's sister, not his wife. Genesis 20, 2-5. He, too, expressed his indignation in almost identical terms to Pharaoh's, and one can't help sympathizing with both of them. Is the similarity another indicator of textual unreliability? Such unpleasant episodes in Abraham's story are mere peccadilloes compared with the infamous tale of the sacrificing of his son Isaac. Muslim scripture tells the same story about Abraham's other son, Ishmael. God ordered Abraham to make a burnt offering of his longed-for son. Abraham built an altar, put firewood upon it, and trussed Isaac up on top of the wood. His murdering knife was already in his hand when an angel dramatically intervened with the news of a last-minute change of plan. God was only joking, after all, tempting Abraham and testing his faith. A modern moralist cannot help but wonder how a child could ever recover from such psychological trauma. By the standards of modern morality, this disgraceful story is an example simultaneously of child abuse, bullying in two asymmetrical power relationships, and the first recorded use of the Nuremberg defense, I was only obeying orders. Yet the legend is one of the great foundational myths of all three monotheistic religions. Once again, modern theologians will protest that the story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac should not be taken as literal fact, and once again the appropriate response is twofold. First, many, many people, even to this day, do take the whole of their scripture to be literal fact, and they have a great deal of political power over the rest of us, especially in the United States and in the Islamic world. Second, if not as literal fact, how should we take the story? As an allegory? Then an allegory for what? Surely nothing praiseworthy. As a moral lesson? But what kind of morals could one derive from this appalling story? Remember, all I'm trying to establish for the moment is that we do not, as a matter of fact, derive our morals from Scripture. Or if we do, we pick and choose among the Scriptures for the nice bits and reject the nasty. But then we must have some independent criterion for deciding which are the moral bits, a criterion which, wherever it comes from, cannot come from Scripture itself, and is presumably available to all of us, whether we are religious or not. Apologists even seek to salvage some decency for the God character in this deplorable tale. Wasn't it good of God to spare Isaac's life at the last minute? In the unlikely event that any of my readers are persuaded by this obscene piece of special pleading, I refer them to didn't waste any time. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. Exodus 32, 1 Aaron got everybody to pool their gold, melted it down, and made a golden calf, for which newly invented deity he then built an altar so that they could all start sacrificing to it. Well, they should have known better than to fool around behind God's back like that. He might be up a mountain, but he was, after all, omniscient, and he lost no time in dispatching Moses as his enforcer. Moses raced hot foot down the mountain, carrying the stone tablets on which God had written the Ten Commandments. When he arrived and saw the golden calf, he was so furious that he dropped the tablets and broke them. God later gave him a replacement set, so that was all right. Moses seized the golden calf, burned it, ground it to powder, mixed it with water, and made the people swallow it. Then he told everybody in the priestly tribe of Levi to pick up a sword, and kill as many people as possible. This amounted to about three thousand, which, one might have hoped, would have been enough to assuage God's jealous sulk. But no, God wasn't finished yet. In the last verse of this terrible chapter, his parting shot was to send a plague upon what was left of the people. Because they made the calf which Aaron made. 
The book of Numbers tells how God incited Moses to attack the Midianites. His army made short work of slaying all the men, and they burned all the Midianite cities, but they didn't kill the women and children. This merciful restraint by his soldiers infuriated Moses, and he gave orders that all the boy children should be killed, and all the women who were not virgins. But all the women children that have not known a man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. Numbers 31, 18. No, Moses was not a great role model for modern moralists. Insofar as modern religious writers attach any kind of symbolic or allegorical meaning to the massacre of the Midianites, the symbolism is aimed in precisely the wrong direction. The unfortunate Midianites, so far as one can tell from the biblical account, were the victims of genocide in their own country. Yet their name lives on in Christian law only in that favourite hymn, which I can still sing from memory after fifty years to two different tunes, both in grim minor keys. Christian, dost thou see them on the holy ground? How the troops of Midian prowl and prowl around. Christian, up and smite them, counting gain but loss. Smite them by the merit of the holy cross. Alas, poor slandered, slaughtered Midianites, to be remembered only as poetic symbols of universal evil in a Victorian hymn. The rival god Baal seems to have been a perennially seductive tempter to wayward worship. In Numbers chapter 25, many of the Israelites were lured by Moabite women to sacrifice to Baal. God reacted with characteristic fury. He ordered Moses to Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. One cannot help yet again marvelling at the extraordinarily draconian view taken of the sin of flirting with rival gods. To our modern sense of values and justice, it seems a trifling sin, compared to, say, offering your daughter for a gang rape. It is yet another example of the disconnect between scriptural and modern, one is tempted to say civilised, morals. Of course, it is easily enough understood in terms of the theory of memes, and the qualities that a deity needs in order to survive in the meme pool. The tragic farce of God's maniacal jealousy against alternative gods recurs continually throughout the Old Testament. It motivates the first of the Ten Commandments, the ones on the tablets that Moses broke, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, and it is even more prominent in the otherwise rather different substitute commandments that God provided to replace the broken tablets, Exodus 34. Having promised to drive out of their homelands, the unfortunate Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hevites, and Jebusites, God gets down to what really matters, rival gods. Ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous god. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a-whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice, and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a-whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a-whoring after their gods, thou shalt make thee no molten gods. Exodus 34, 13-17 I know, yes, of course, of course, times have changed and no religious leader today, apart from the likes of the Taliban or the American Christian equivalent, thinks like Moses. But that is my whole point. All I'm establishing is that modern morality, wherever else it comes from, does not come from the Bible. Apologists cannot get away with claiming that religion provides them with some sort of inside track to defining what is good and what is bad, a privileged source unavailable to atheists. They cannot get away with it, not even if they employ that favourite trick of interpreting selected scriptures as symbolic rather than literal. By what criterion do you decide which passages are symbolic, which literal? The ethnic cleansing begun in the time of Moses is brought to bloody fruition in the book of Joshua a text remarkable for the bloodthirsty massacres it records and the xenophobic relish with which it does so. As the charming old song exultantly has it, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came a-tumbling down. There's none like good old Joshua at the battle of Jericho. 
Good old Joshua didn't rest until... They utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and ass, with the edge of the sword. Joshua 6, 21. Yet again, theologians will protest, it didn't happen. Well, no, the story has it that the walls came tumbling down at the mere sound of men shouting and blowing horns, so indeed it didn't happen. But that is not the point. The point is that, whether true or not, the Bible is held up to us as the source of our morality, and the Bible story of Joshua's destruction of Jericho and the invasion of the Promised Land in general is morally indistinguishable from Hitler's invasion of Poland or Saddam Hussein's massacres of the Kurds and the Marsh Arabs. The Bible may be an arresting and poetic work of fiction, but it is not the sort of book you should give your children to form their morals. As it happens, the story of Joshua in Jericho is the subject of an interesting experiment in child morality to be discussed later in this chapter. Do not think, by the way, that the God character in the story nursed any doubts or scruples about the massacres and genocides that accompanied the seizing of the Promised Land. On the contrary, his orders, for example in Deuteronomy 20, were ruthlessly explicit. He made a clear distinction between the people who lived in the land that was needed and those who lived a long way away. The latter should be invited to surrender peacefully. If they refused, all the men were to be killed and the women carried off for breeding. In contrast to this relatively humane treatment, see what was in store for those tribes unfortunate enough to be already in residence in the promised Laban's realm. But of the cities of these people, which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth, but thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hevites and the Jebusites, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Do those people who hold up the Bible as an inspiration to moral rectitude have the slightest notion of what is actually written in it? The following offences merit the death penalty, according to Leviticus 20. Cursing your parents, committing adultery, making love to your stepmother or your daughter-in-law, homosexuality, marrying a woman and her daughter, bestiality, and to add injury to insult, the unfortunate beast is to be killed too. You also get executed, of course, for working on the Sabbath. The point is made again and again throughout the Old Testament. In Numbers 15, the children of Israel found a man in the wilderness gathering sticks on the forbidden day. They arrested him and then asked God what to do with him. As it turned out, God was in no mood for half measures that day. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died. Did this harmless gatherer of firewood have a wife and children to grieve for him? Did he whimper with fear as the first stones flew and scream with pain as the fusillade crashed into his head? What shocks me today about such stories is not that they really happened. They probably didn't. What makes my jaw drop is that people today should base their lives on such an appalling role model as Yahweh, and even worse, that they should bossily try to force the same evil monster, whether fact or fiction, on the rest of us. The political power of America's Ten Commandment tablet toters is especially regrettable in that great republic whose constitution, after all, was drawn up by men of the Enlightenment in explicitly secular terms. If we took the Ten Commandments seriously, we would rank the worship of the wrong gods and the making of graven images as first and second among sins. Rather than condemn the unspeakable vandalism of the Taliban, who dynamited the 150-foot-high Bamiyan Buddhas in the mountains of Afghanistan, we would praise them for their righteous piety. What we think of as their vandalism was certainly motivated by sincere religious zeal. This is vividly attested by a truly bizarre story, which was the lead in the London Independent of 6th of August 2005. Under the front page headline, The Destruction of Mecca, the Independent reported, Historic Mecca, the cradle of Islam, is being buried in an unprecedented onslaught by religious zealots. Almost all of the rich and multi-layered history of the holy city is gone. 
now the actual birthplace of the Prophet Muhammad, is facing the bulldozers, with the connivance of Saudi religious authorities, whose hardline interpretation of Islam is compelling them to wipe out their own heritage. The motive behind the destruction is the Wahhabists' fanatical fear that places of historical and religious interest could give rise to idolatry or polytheism, the worship of multiple and potentially equal gods. The practice of idolatry in Saudi Arabia remains, in principle, punishable by beheading. I do not believe there is an atheist in the world who would bulldoze Mecca or Chartres, York Minster or Notre Dame, the Schwedagon, the temples of Kyoto, or, of course, the Buddhas of Bamiyan. As the Nobel Prize-winning American physicist Steven Weinberg said, Religion is an insult to human dignity. With or without it, you'd have good people doing good things and evil people doing evil things. But for good people to do evil things, it takes religion. Blaise Pascal, he of the wager, said something similar. Men never do evil so completely and cheerfully as when they do it from religious conviction. My main purpose here has not been to show that we shouldn't get our morals from Scripture, although that is my opinion. My purpose has been to demonstrate that we, and that includes most religious people, as a matter of fact, don't get our morals from Scripture. If we did, we would strictly observe the Sabbath and think it just and proper to execute anybody who chose not to. We would stone to death any new bride who couldn't prove she was a virgin if her husband pronounced himself unsatisfied with her. We would execute disobedient children. We would... But wait, perhaps I've been unfair. Nice Christians will have been protesting throughout this section. Everyone knows the Old Testament is pretty unpleasant. The New Testament of Jesus undoes the damage and makes it all right. Doesn't it? Is the New Testament any better? Well, there's no denying that from a moral point of view, Jesus is a huge improvement over the cruel ogre of the Old Testament. Indeed, Jesus, if he existed, or whoever wrote his script if he didn't, was surely one of the great ethical innovators of history. The Sermon on the Mount is way ahead of its time. His Turn the Other Cheek anticipated Gandhi and Martin Luther King by 2,000 years. It was not for nothing that I wrote an article called Atheists for Jesus, and was later delighted to be presented with a T-shirt bearing the legend. But the moral superiority of Jesus precisely bears out my point. Jesus was not content to derive his ethics from the scriptures of his upbringing. He explicitly departed from them, for example, when he deflated the dire warnings about breaking the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, has been generalized into a wise proverb. Since a principal thesis of this chapter is that we do not and should not derive our morals from Scripture, Jesus has to be honored as a model for that very thesis. Jesus' family values, it has to be admitted, were not such as one might wish to focus on. He was short to the point of brusqueness with his own mother, and he encouraged his disciples to abandon their families to follow him. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children, and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. The American comedian Julia Sweeney expressed her bewilderment in her one-woman stage show, Letting Go of God. Isn't that what cults do? Get you to reject your family in order to inculcate you? Notwithstanding his somewhat dodgy family values, Jesus' ethical teachings were, at least by comparison with the ethical disaster area that is the Old Testament, admirable. But there are other teachings in the New Testament that no good person should support. I refer especially to the central doctrine of Christianity, that of atonement for original sin. This teaching, which lies at the heart of New Testament theology, is almost as morally obnoxious as the story of Abraham setting out to barbecue Isaac, which it resembles, and that is no accident, as Geza Vermesh makes clear in The Changing Faces of Jesus. Original sin itself comes straight from the Old Testament myth of Adam and Eve. Their sin, eating the fruit of a forbidden tree, seems mild enough to merit a mere reprimand. But the symbolic nature of the fruit, knowledge of good and evil, which in practice turned out to be knowledge that they were naked, was enough to turn their scrumping escapade into the mother and father of all sins.
they and all their descendants were banished forever from the Garden of Eden, deprived of the gift of eternal life, and condemned to generations of painful labor in the field and in childbirth, respectively. So far, so vindictive. Par for the Old Testament course. New Testament theology adds a new injustice, topped off by a new sadomasochism, whose viciousness even the Old Testament barely exceeds. It is, when you think about it, remarkable that a religion should adopt an instrument of torture and execution as its sacred symbol, often worn around the neck. Lenny Bruce rightly quipped that, If Jesus had been killed twenty years ago, Catholic schoolchildren would be wearing little electric chairs around their necks, instead of crosses. But the theology and punishment theory behind it is even worse. The sin of Adam and Eve is thought to have passed down the male line, transmitted in the semen, according to Augustine. What kind of ethical philosophy is it that condemns every child, even before it is born, to inherit the sin of a remote ancestor? Augustine, by the way, who rightly regarded himself as something of a personal authority on sin, was responsible for coining the phrase, original sin. Before him, it was known as ancestral sin. Augustine's pronouncements and debates epitomize the unhealthy preoccupation of early Christian theologians with sin. They could have devoted their pages and their sermons to extolling the sky splashed with stars, or mountains and green forests, seas and dawn choruses. These are occasionally mentioned, but the Christian focus is overwhelmingly on sin, 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 sin. What a nasty little preoccupation to have dominating your life. Sam Harris is magnificently scathing in his Letter to a Christian Nation. Your principal concern appears to be that the creator of the universe will take offense at something people do while naked. This prudery of yours contributes daily to the surplus of human misery. But now, the sadomasochism. God incarnated himself as a man, Jesus, in order that he should be tortured and executed in atonement for the hereditary sin of Adam. Ever since Paul expounded this repellent doctrine, Jesus has been worshipped as the redeemer of all our sins. Not just the past sin of Adam, future sins as well, whether future people decided to commit them or not. As another aside, it has occurred to various people, including Robert Graves in his epic novel King Jesus, that poor Judas Iscariot has received a bad deal from history, given that his betrayal was a necessary part of the cosmic plan. The same could be said of Jesus' alleged murderers. If Jesus wanted to be betrayed and then murdered, in order that he could redeem us all, isn't it rather unfair of those who consider themselves redeemed to take it out on Judas and on Jews down the ages? I have already mentioned the long list of non-canonical Gospels. A manuscript purporting to be the lost Gospel of Judas has recently been translated and has received publicity in consequence. The circumstances of its discovery are disputed, but it seems to have turned up in Egypt sometime in the 1970s or 60s. It is in Coptic script on 62 pages of papyrus, carbon dated to around AD 300, but probably based on an earlier Greek manuscript. Whoever the author was, the Gospel is seen from the point of view of Judas Iscariot, and makes the case that Judas betrayed Jesus only because Jesus asked him to play that role. It was all part of the plan to get Jesus crucified so that he could redeem humankind. Obnoxious as that doctrine is, it seems to compound the unpleasantness that Judas has been vilified ever since. I have described atonement, the central doctrine of Christianity, as vicious, sadomasochistic, and repellent. We should also dismiss it as barking mad, but for its ubiquitous familiarity, which has dulled our objectivity. If God wanted to forgive our sins, why not just forgive them, without having himself tortured and executed in payment, thereby incidentally condemning remote future generations of Jews to pogroms and persecutions as Christ-killers? Did that hereditary sin pass down in the semen too? Paul, as the Jewish scholar Gezer Vermesh makes clear, was steeped in the old Jewish theological principle that without blood there is no atonement. Indeed, in his Epistle to the Hebrews, 9.22, he said as much. Progressive ethicists today find it hard to defend any kind of retributive theory of punishment, 
let alone the scapegoat theory, executing an innocent to pay for the sins of the guilty. In any case, one can't help wondering, who was God trying to impress? Presumably himself, judge and jury as well as execution victim. To cap it all, Adam, the supposed perpetrator of the original sin, never existed in the first place. An awkward fact, excusably unknown to Paul, but presumably known to an omniscient God, and Jesus if you believe he was God, which fundamentally undermines the premise of the whole tortuously nasty theory. Oh, but of course, the story of Adam and Eve was only ever symbolic, wasn't it? Symbolic? So in order to impress himself, Jesus had himself tortured and executed in vicarious punishment for a symbolic sin committed by a non-existent individual. As I said, barking mad, as well as viciously unpleasant. Before leaving the Bible, I need to call attention to one particularly unpalatable aspect of its ethical teaching. Christians seldom realize that much of the moral consideration for others, which is apparently promoted by both the Old and New Testaments, was originally intended to apply only to a narrowly defined in-group. Love thy neighbor didn't mean what we now think it means. It meant only love another Jew. The point is devastatingly made by the American physician and evolutionary anthropologist John Hartung. He has written a remarkable paper on the evolution and biblical history of in-group morality, laying stress too on the flip side, out-group hostility. Love Thy Neighbor John Hartung's black humor is evident from the outset, where he tells of a Southern Baptist initiative to count the number of Alabamans in hell. As reported in the New York Times and Newsday, the final total, 1.86 million, was estimated using a secret waiting formula whereby Methodists are more likely to be saved than Roman Catholics, while virtually everyone not belonging to a church congregation was counted among the lost. The preternatural smugness of such people is reflected today in the various Rapture websites, where the author always takes it completely for granted that he will be among those who disappear into heaven when the end times come. Here is a typical example from the author of Rapture Ready, one of the more odiously sanctimonious specimens of the genre. If the rapture should take place resulting in my absence, it will become necessary for tribulation saints to mirror or financially support this site. Hartung's interpretation of the Bible suggests that it offers no grounds for such smug complacency among Christians. Jesus limited his in-group of the saved strictly to Jews, in which respect he was following the Old Testament tradition, which was all he knew. Hartung clearly shows that thou shalt not kill was never intended to mean what we now think it means. It meant, very specifically, thou shalt not kill Jews, and all those commandments that make reference to thy neighbor are equally exclusive. Neighbor means fellow Jew. Moses Maimonides, the highly respected 12th century rabbi and physician, expounds the full meaning of thou shalt not kill as follows. If one slays a single Israelite, he transgresses a negative commandment, for scripture says thou shalt not murder. If one murders willfully in the presence of witnesses, he is put to death by the sword. Needless to say, one is not put to death if he kills a heathen. Needless to say. Hartung quotes the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court headed by the high priest, in similar vein, as exonerating a man who hypothetically killed an Israelite by mistake while intending to kill an animal or a heathen. This teasing little moral conundrum raises a nice point. What if he were to throw a stone into a group of nine heathens and one Israelite and have the misfortune to kill the Israelite? Hmm, difficult. But the answer is ready then his non-liability can be inferred from the fact that the majority were heathens. Hartung uses many of the same biblical quotations as I have used in this chapter about the conquest of the Promised Land by Moses, Joshua, and the Judges. I was careful to concede that religious people don't think in a biblical way anymore. For me, this demonstrated that our morals, whether we are religious or not, come from another source, and that other source, whatever it is, is available to all of us, regardless of religion or lack of it. But Hartung tells of a horrifying study by the Israeli psychologist 
George Tamarin. Tamarin presented to more than a thousand Israeli schoolchildren aged between eight and fourteen the account of the Battle of Jericho in the book of Joshua. Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city, and the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. But all silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. Then they utterly destroyed all in the city, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep and asses, with the edge of the sword. And they burned the city with fire and all within it. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. Tamarin then asked the children a simple moral question. Do you think Joshua and the Israelites acted rightly or not? They had to choose between A, total approval, B, partial approval, and C, total disapproval. The results were polarized. 66% gave total approval and 26% total disapproval, with rather fewer, 8%, in the middle with partial approval. Here are three typical answers from the total approval, A, group. In my opinion, Joshua and the sons of Israel acted well, and here are the reasons. God promised them this land and gave them permission to conquer. If they would not have acted in this manner or killed anyone, then there would be the danger that the sons of Israel would have assimilated among the Goyim. In my opinion, Joshua was right when he did it, one reason being that God commanded him to exterminate the people so that the tribes of Israel will not be able to assimilate amongst them and learn their bad ways. Joshua did good because the people who inhabited the land were of a different religion, and when Joshua killed them, he wiped their religion from the earth. The justification for the genocidal massacre by Joshua is religious in every case. Even those in category C who gave total disapproval did so in some cases for backhanded religious reasons. One girl, for example, disapproved of Joshua's conquering Jericho because in order to do so, he had to enter it. I think it is bad, since the Arabs are impure, and if one enters an impure land, one will also become impure and share their curse. Two others who totally disapproved did so because Joshua destroyed everything, including animals and property, instead of keeping some as spoil for the Israelites. I think Joshua did not act well, as they could have spared the animals for themselves. I think Joshua did not act well, as he could have left the property of Jericho. If he had not destroyed the property, it would have belonged to the Israelites. Once again, the sage Maimonides, often cited for his scholarly wisdom, is in no doubt where he stands on this issue. It is a positive commandment to destroy the seven nations, as it is said, Thou shalt utterly destroy them. If one does not put to death any of them that falls into one's power, one transgresses a negative commandment, as it is said, Thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth. Unlike Maimonides, the children in Tamarin's experiment were young enough to be innocent. Presumably the savage views they expressed were those of their parents or the cultural group in which they were brought up. It is, I suppose, not unlikely that Palestinian children brought up in the same war-torn country would offer equivalent opinions in the opposite direction. These considerations fill me with despair. They seem to show the immense power of religion and especially the religious upbringing of children to divide people and foster historic enmities and hereditary vendettas. I cannot help remarking that two out of Tamarin's three representative quotations from Group A mentioned the evils of assimilation, while the third one stressed the importance of killing people in order to stamp out their religion. Tamarin ran a fascinating control group in his experiment. A different group of 168 Israeli children were given the same text from the book of Joshua, but with Joshua's own name replaced by General Lin, and Israel replaced by a Chinese kingdom 3,000 years ago. Now the experiment gave opposite results. Only 7% approved of General Lin's behavior, and 75% disapproved. In other words, when their loyalty to Judaism was removed from the calculation, the majority of the children agreed with the moral judgments that most modern humans would share.
Joshua's action was a deed of barbaric genocide. But it all looks different from a religious point of view, and the difference starts early in life. It was religion that made the difference between children condemning genocide and condoning it. In the latter half of Hartung's paper, he moves on to the New Testament. To give a brief summary of his thesis, Jesus was a devotee of the same in-group morality, coupled with out-group hostility, that was taken for granted in the Old Testament. Jesus was a loyal Jew. It was Paul who invented the idea of taking the Jewish God to the Gentiles. Hartung puts it more bluntly than I dare. Jesus would have turned over in his grave if he'd known that Paul would be taking his plan to the pigs. Hartung has some good fun with the book of Revelation, which is certainly one of the weirdest books in the Bible. It is supposed to have been written by St. John, and as Ken's Guide to the Bible neatly put it, if his epistles can be seen as John on pot, then Revelation is John on acid. Hartung draws attention to the two verses in Revelation where the number of those sealed, which some sects, such as the Jehovah's Witnesses, interpret to mean saved, is limited to 144,000. Hartung's point is that they all had to be Jews, 12,000 from each of the twelve tribes. Ken Smith goes further, pointing out that the 144,000 elect did not defile themselves with women, which presumably means that none of them could be women. Well, that's the sort of thing we've come to expect. There's a lot more in Hartung's entertaining paper. I shall simply recommend it once more and summarize it in a quotation. The Bible is a blueprint of in-group morality, complete with instructions for genocide, enslavement of outgroups, and world domination. But the Bible is not evil by virtue of its objectives or even its glorification of murder, cruelty, and rape. Many ancient works do that. The Iliad, the Icelandic sagas, the tales of the ancient Syrians, and the inscriptions of the ancient Mayans, for example. But no one is selling the Iliad as a foundation for morality. Therein lies the problem. The Bible is sold and bought as a guide to how people should live their lives. And it is by far the world's all-time bestseller. Lest it be thought that the exclusiveness of traditional Judaism is unique among religions, look at the following confident verse from a hymn by Isaac Watts, 1674-1748. Lord, I ascribe it to thy grace, and not to chance, as others do, that I was born of Christian race, and not a heathen or a Jew. What puzzles me about this verse is not the exclusiveness per se, but the logic. Since plenty of others were born into religions other than Christianity, how did God decide which future people should receive such favoured birth? Why favour Isaac Watts and those individuals whom he visualised singing his hymn? In any case, before Isaac Watts was conceived, what was the nature of the entity being favoured? These are deep waters, but perhaps not too deep for a mind tuned to theology. Isaac Watts' hymn is reminiscent of three daily prayers that male Orthodox and Conservative, but not Reform, Jews are taught to recite. Blessed are you for not making me a Gentile. Blessed are you for not making me a woman. Blessed are you for not making me a slave. Religion is undoubtedly a divisive force, and this is one of the main accusations levelled against it. But it is frequently and rightly said that wars and feuds between religious groups or sects are seldom actually about theological disagreements. When an Ulster Protestant paramilitary murders a Catholic, he is not muttering to himself, Take that, transubstantiationist, mariolatrous, incense-reeking bastard. He is much more likely to be avenging the death of another Protestant, killed by another Catholic, perhaps in the course of a sustained transgenerational vendetta. Religion is a label of in-group, out-group enmity and vendetta, not necessarily worse than other labels such as skin colour, language or preferred football team, but often available when other labels are not. Yes, yes, of course, the troubles in Northern Ireland are political. There really has been an economic and political oppression of one group by another, and it goes back centuries. There really are genuine grievances and injustices, and these seem to have little to do with religion, except that, and this is important and widely overlooked, 
without religion there would be no labels by which to decide whom to oppress and whom to avenge. And the real problem in Northern Ireland is that the labels are inherited down many generations. Catholics, whose parents, grandparents and great-grandparents went to Catholic schools, send their children to Catholic schools. Protestants, whose parents, grandparents and great-grandparents went to Protestant schools, send their children to Protestant schools. The two sets of people have the same skin color, they speak the same language, they enjoy the same things, but they might as well belong to different species, so deep is the historic divide. And without religion and religiously segregated education, the divide simply would not be there. From Kosovo to Palestine, from Iraq to Sudan, from Ulster to the Indian subcontinent, Look carefully at any region of the world where you find intractable enmity and violence between rival groups. I cannot guarantee that you'll find religions as the dominant labels for in-groups and out-groups, but it's a very good bet. In India, at the time of partition, more than a million people were massacred in religious riots between Hindus and Muslims, and 15 million displaced from their homes. There were no badges other than religious ones with which to label whom to kill. Ultimately, there was nothing to divide them but religion. Salman Rushdie was moved by a more recent bout of religious massacres in India to write an article called Religion, as ever, is the poison in India's blood. Here's his concluding paragraph. What is there to respect in any of this, or in any of the crimes now being committed almost daily around the world in religion's dreaded name? How well... With what fatal results religion erects totems, and how willing we are to kill for them. And when we've done it often enough, the deadening of affect that results makes it easier to do it again. So India's problem turns out to be the world's problem. What happened in India has happened in God's name. The problem's name is God. Nobody could deny that humanity's powerful tendencies towards in-group loyalties and out-group hostilities would exist even in the absence of religion. Fans of rival football teams are an example of the phenomenon writ small. Even football supporters sometimes divide along religious lines, as in the case of Glasgow Rangers and Glasgow Celtic. Languages, as in Belgium, races and tribes, especially in Africa, can be important divisive tokens. But religion amplifies and exacerbates the damage in at least three ways. Labelling of children. Children are described as Catholic children or Protestant children, etc., from an early age, and certainly far too early for them to have made up their own minds on what they think about religion. Chapter 9 returns to this abuse of childhood. Segregated schools. Children are educated, again often from a very early age, with members of a religious in-group and separately from children whose families adhere to other religions. It is not an exaggeration to say that the troubles in Northern Ireland would disappear in a generation if segregated schooling were abolished. Taboos against marrying out. This perpetuates hereditary feuds and vendettas by preventing the mingling of feuding groups. Intermarriage, if it were permitted, would naturally tend to mollify enmities. The village of Glenarm in Northern Ireland is the seat of the Earls of Antrim. On one occasion, within living memory, the then Earl did the unthinkable. He married a Catholic. Immediately, in houses throughout Glenarm, the blinds were drawn in mourning. A horror of marrying out is also widespread among religious Jews. Several of the Israeli children quoted above mentioned the dire perils of assimilation at the forefront of their defense of Joshua's Battle of Jericho. When people of different religions do marry, it is described with foreboding on both sides as a mixed marriage, and there are often prolonged battles over how the children are to be brought up. When I was a child and still carried a guttering torch for the Anglican Church, I remember being dumbfounded to be told of a rule that when a Roman Catholic married an Anglican, the children were always brought up Catholic. I could readily understand why a priest of either denomination would try to insist on this condition. What I couldn't understand, still can't, was the asymmetry. Why didn't the Anglican priest retaliate with the equivalent rule in reverse? Just less ruthless, I suppose. 
my old chaplain and Betchman's our padre were simply too nice. Sociologists have done statistical surveys of religious homogamy, marrying somebody of the same religion, and heterogamy, marrying somebody of a different religion. Norval D. Glenn of the University of Texas at Austin gathered a number of such studies up to 1978 and analyzed them together. He concluded that there is a significant tendency towards religious homogamy in Christians. Protestants marry Protestants and Catholics Catholics, and this goes beyond the ordinary boy-next-door effect but that it is especially marked among Jews. Out of a total sample of 6,021 married respondents to the questionnaire, 140 called themselves Jews, and of these, 85.7% married Jews. This is hugely greater than the randomly expected percentage of homogamous marriages. And of course it will not come as news to anybody. Observant Jews are strongly discouraged from marrying out, and the taboo shows itself in Jewish jokes about mothers warning their boys about blonde shiksas lying in wait to entrap them. Here are typical statements by three American rabbis. I refuse to officiate at interfaith marriages. I officiate when couples state their intention to raise children as Jews. I officiate if couples agree to premarital counselling. Rabbis who will agree to officiate together with a Christian priest are rare and much in demand. Even if religion did no other harm in itself, its wanton and carefully nurtured divisiveness, its deliberate and cultivated pandering to humanity's natural tendency to favour in-groups and shun out-groups, would be enough to make it a significant force for evil in the world. The Moral Zeitgeist This chapter began by showing that we do not, even the religious among us, ground our morality in holy books, no matter what we may fondly imagine. How then do we decide what is right and what is wrong? No matter how we answer that question, there is a consensus about what we do as a matter of fact consider right and wrong, a consensus that prevails surprisingly widely. The consensus has no obvious connection with religion. It extends, however, to most religious people, whether or not they think their morals come from Scripture. With notable exceptions, such as the Afghan Taliban and the American Christian equivalent, most people pay lip service to the same broad liberal consensus of ethical principles. The majority of us don't cause needless suffering. We believe in free speech and protect it even if we disagree with what is being said. We pay our taxes. We don't cheat, don't kill, don't commit incest, don't do things to others that we would not wish done to us. Some of these good principles can be found in holy books, but buried alongside much else that no decent person would wish to follow. And the holy books do not supply any rules for distinguishing the good principles from the bad. One way to express our consensual ethics is as a new Ten Commandments. Various individuals and institutions have attempted this. What is significant is that they tend to produce rather similar results to each other and what they produce is characteristic of the times in which they happen to live. Here is one set of New Ten Commandments from today, which I happen to find on an atheist website. Do not do to others what you would not want them to do to you. In all things strive to cause no harm. Treat your fellow human beings, your fellow living things, and the world in general, with love, honesty, faithfulness, and respect. Do not overlook evil or shrink from administering justice, but always be ready to forgive wrongdoing freely admitted and honestly regretted. Live life with a sense of joy and wonder. Always seek to be learning something new. Test all things, always check your ideas against the facts and be ready to discard even a cherished belief if it does not conform to them. Never seek to censor or cut yourself off from dissent. Always respect the right of others to disagree with you. Form independent opinions on the basis of your own reason and experience. Do not allow yourself to be led blindly by others. Question everything. This little collection is not the work of a great sage or prophet or professional ethicist. 
It is just one ordinary web logger's rather endearing attempt to summarize the principles of the good life today for comparison with the biblical Ten Commandments. It was the first list I found when I typed New Ten Commandments into a search engine, and I deliberately didn't look any further. The whole point is that it is the sort of list that any ordinary decent person today would come up with. Not everybody would home in on exactly the same list of ten. The philosopher John Rawls might include something like the following. Always devise your rules as if you didn't know whether you were going to be at the top or the bottom of the pecking order. An alleged Inuit system for sharing out food is a practical example of the Rawls principle. The individual who cuts up the food gets last pick. In my own amended Ten Commandments, I would choose some of the above, but I would also try to find room for, among others, Enjoy your own sex life, so long as it damages nobody else, and leave others to enjoy theirs in private, whatever their inclinations, which are none of your business. Do not discriminate or oppress on the basis of sex, race, or, as far as possible, species. Do not indoctrinate your children. Teach them how to think for themselves, how to evaluate evidence, and how to disagree with you. Value the future on a time scale longer than your own. But never mind these small differences of priority. The point is that we have almost all moved on, and in a big way since biblical times. Slavery, which was taken for granted in the Bible and throughout most of history, was abolished in civilized countries in the 19th century. All civilized nations now accept what was widely denied up to the 1920s, that a woman's vote, in an election or on a jury, is the equal of a man's. In today's enlightened societies, a category that manifestly does not include, for example, Saudi Arabia, women are no longer regarded as property, as they clearly were in biblical times. Any modern legal system would have prosecuted Abraham for child abuse. And if he had actually carried through his plan to sacrifice Isaac, we would have convicted him of first-degree murder. Yet, according to the Maoris of his time, his conduct was entirely admirable, obeying God's commandment. Religious or not, we have all changed massively in our attitude to what is right and what is wrong. What is the nature of this change, and what drives it? In any society there exists a somewhat mysterious consensus which changes over the decades and for which it is not pretentious to use the German loanword zeitgeist, spirit of the times. I said that female suffrage was now universal in the world's democracies, but this reform is in fact astonishingly recent. Here are some dates at which women were granted the vote. New Zealand, 1893. Australia, 1902. Finland, 1906, Norway, 1913, United States, 1920, Britain, 1928, France, 1945, Belgium, 1946, Switzerland, 1971, Kuwait, 2006. This spread of dates through the 20th century is a gauge of the shifting zeitgeist. Another is our attitude to race. In the early part of the 20th century, almost everybody in Britain, and many other countries too, would be judged racist by today's standards. Most white people believed that black people, in which category they would have lumped the very diverse Africans with unrelated groups from India, Australia, and Melanesia, were inferior to white people in almost all respects except, patronizingly, sense of rhythm. The 1920s equivalent of James Bond was that cheerfully debonair boyhood hero Bulldog Drummond. In one novel, The Black Gang, Drummond refers to Jews, foreigners, and other unwashed folk. In the climax scene of The Female of the Species, Drummond is cleverly disguised as Pedro, black servant of the arch-villain. For his dramatic disclosure to the reader as well as to the villain that Pedro is really Drummond himself, he could have said, you think I'm Pedro. Little do you realize I'm your arch-enemy Drummond blacked up. Instead, he chose these words. Every beard is not false, but every nigger smells. That beard ain't false, dearie, and dis nigger don't smell. So I'm thinking there's something wrong somewhere. 
I read it in the 1950s, three decades after it was written, and it was just still possible for a boy to thrill to the drama and not notice the racism. Today it would be inconceivable. Thomas Henry Huxley, by the standards of his times, was an enlightened and liberal progressive. But his times were not ours, and in 1871 he wrote the following. No rational man, cognizant of the facts, believes that the average Negro is the equal, still less the superior, of the white man. And if this be true, it is simply incredible that, when all his disabilities are removed, and our prognathous relative has a fair field and no favor, as well as no oppressor, he will be able to compete successfully with his bigger-brained and smaller-jawed rival in a contest which is to be carried on by thoughts and not by bites. The highest places in the hierarchy of civilization will assuredly not be within the reach of our dusky cousins. It is a commonplace that good historians don't judge statements from past times by the standards of their own. Abraham Lincoln, like Huxley, was ahead of his time. Yet his views on matters of race also sound backwardly racist in ours. Here he is in a debate in 1858 with Stephen A. Douglas. I will say then that I am not, nor ever have been, in favour of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. That I am not, nor ever have been, in favour of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office nor to intermarry with white people. And I will say, in addition to this, that there is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality. And inasmuch as they cannot so live, while they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior. And I, as much as any other man, am in favour of having the superior position assigned to the white race. Had Huxley and Lincoln been born and educated in our time, they would have been the first to cringe with the rest of us at their own Victorian sentiments and unctuous tone. I quote them only to illustrate how the zeitgeist moves on. If even Huxley, one of the great liberal minds of his age, and even Lincoln, who freed the slaves, could say such things, just think what the average Victorian must have thought. Going back to the 18th century, it is of course well known that Washington, Jefferson, and other men of the Enlightenment held slaves. The zeitgeist moves on, so inexorably that we sometimes take it for granted and forget that the change is a real phenomenon in its own right. There are numerous other examples. When the sailors first landed in Mauritius and saw the gentle dodos, it never occurred to them to do anything other than club them to death. They didn't even want to eat them. They were described as unpalatable. Presumably, hitting defenseless, tame, flightless birds over the head with a club was just something to do. Nowadays, such behavior would be unthinkable, and the extinction of a modern equivalent of the dodo, even by accident, let alone by deliberate human killing, is regarded as a tragedy. Just such a tragedy, by the standards of today's cultural climate, was the more recent extinction of Thylacinus, the Tasmanian wolf. These now iconically lamented creatures had a bounty on their heads until as recently as 1909. In Victorian novels of Africa, elephant, lion, and antelope, note the revealing singular, are game, and what you do to game, without a second thought, is shoot it. Not for food. Not for self-defense, for sport. But now the zeitgeist has changed. Admittedly, rich, sedentary sportsmen may shoot wild African animals from the safety of a Land Rover and take the stuffed heads back home, but they have to pay through the nose to do so and are widely despised for it. Wildlife conservation and the conservation of the environment have become accepted values with the same moral status as was once accorded to keeping the Sabbath and shunning graven images. The swinging sixties are legendary for their liberal modernity, but at the beginning of that decade, a prosecuting barrister, in the trial for obscenity of Lady Chatterley's lover, could still ask the jury, Would you approve of your young sons, young daughters? Because girls can read as well as boys. Can you believe he said that? Reading this book? Is it a book you would have lying around in your own house? 
Is it a book you would even wish your wife or your servants to read? This last rhetorical question is a particularly stunning illustration of the speed with which the zeitgeist changes. The American invasion of Iraq is widely condemned for its civilian casualties, yet these casualty figures are orders of magnitude lower than comparable numbers for the Second World War. There seems to be a steadily shifting standard of what is morally acceptable. Donald Rumsfeld, who sounds so callous and odious today, would have sounded like a bleeding heart liberal if he said the same things during the Second World War. Something has shifted in the intervening decades. It has shifted in all of us, and the shift has no connection with religion. If anything, it happens in spite of religion, not because of it. The shift is in a recognizably consistent direction, which most of us would judge as improvement. Even Adolf Hitler, widely regarded as pushing the envelope of evil into uncharted territory, would not have stood out in the time of Caligula or of Genghis Khan. Hitler no doubt killed more people than Genghis, but he had 20th century technology at his disposal. And did even Hitler gain his greatest pleasure, as Genghis avowedly did, from seeing his victims near and dear bathed in tears? We judge Hitler's degree of evil by the standards of today, and the moral zeitgeist has moved on since Caligula's time, just as the technology has. Hitler seems especially evil only by the more benign standards of our time. Within my lifetime, large numbers of people thoughtlessly bandied derogatory nicknames and national stereotypes. Frog, Wop, Dago, Hun, Yid, Coon, Nip, Wog. I won't claim that such words have disappeared, but they are now widely deplored in polite circles. The word Negro, even though not intended to be insulting, can be used to date a piece of English prose. Prejudices are indeed revealing giveaways of the date of a piece of writing. In his own time, a respected Cambridge theologian, A.C. Bouquet, was able to begin the chapter on Islam, of his comparative religion, with these words. The Semite is not a natural monotheist, as was supposed about the middle of the 19th century. He is an animist. The obsession with race, as opposed to culture, and the revealing use of the singular, the Semite, he is an animist, to reduce an entire plurality of people to one type, are not heinous by any standards, but they are another tiny indicator of the changing zeitgeist. No Cambridge professor of theology or any other subject would today use those words. Such subtle hints of changing mores tell us that Bouquet was writing no later than the middle of the 20th century. It was, in fact, 1941. Go back another four decades, and the changing standards become unmistakable. In a previous book, I quoted H. G. Wells's utopian New Republic, and I shall do so again, because it is such a shocking illustration of the point I'm making. And how will the New Republic treat the inferior races? How will it deal with the black, the yellow man, the Jew? Those swarms of black and brown and dirty white and yellow people who do not come into the new needs of efficiency. Well, the world is a world and not a charitable institution, and I take it they will have to go. And the ethical system of these men of the new republic, the ethical system which will dominate the world state, will be shaped primarily to favor the procreation of what is fine and efficient and beautiful in humanity, beautiful and strong bodies, clear and powerful minds. And the method that nature has followed hitherto in the shaping of the world, whereby weakness was prevented from propagating weakness, is death. The men of the new republic will have an ideal that will make the killing worth the while. That was written in 1902, and Wells was regarded as a progressive in his own time. In 1902, such sentiments, while not widely agreed, would have made for an acceptable dinner-party argument. Modern readers, by contrast, literally gasp with horror when they see the words. We are forced to realize that Hitler, appalling though he was, was not quite as far outside the zeitgeist of his time as he seems from our vantage point today. How swiftly the zeitgeist changes, and it moves in parallel, on a broad front, throughout the educated world. 
Where then have these concerted and steady changes in social consciousness come from? The onus is not on me to answer. For my purposes, it is sufficient that they certainly have not come from religion. If forced to advance a theory, I would approach it along the following lines. We need to explain why the changing moral zeitgeist is so widely synchronized across large numbers of people, and we need to explain its relatively consistent direction. First, how is it synchronized across so many people? It spreads itself from mind to mind through conversations in bars and at dinner parties, through books and book reviews, through newspapers and broadcasting, and nowadays through the internet. Changes in the moral climate are signaled in editorials, on radio talk shows, in political speeches, in the patter of stand-up comedians and the scripts of soap operas, in the votes of parliaments making laws and the decisions of judges interpreting them. One way to put it would be in terms of changing meme frequencies in the meme pool, but I shall not pursue that. Some of us lag behind the advancing wave of the changing moral zeitgeist, and some of us are slightly ahead. But most of us in the 21st century are bunched together and way ahead of our counterparts in the Middle Ages, or in the time of Abraham, or even as recently as the 1920s. The whole wave keeps moving, and even the vanguard of an earlier century, T. H. Huxley is the obvious example, would find itself way behind the laggers of a later century. Of course, the advance is not a smooth incline, but a meandering sawtooth. There are local and temporary setbacks, such as the United States is suffering from its government in the early 2000s. But over the longer time scale, the progressive trend is unmistakable, and it will continue. What impels it in its consistent direction? We mustn't neglect the driving role of individual leaders who, ahead of their time, stand up and persuade the rest of us to move on with them. In America. The ideals of racial equality were fostered by political leaders of the caliber of Martin Luther King, and entertainers, sportsmen, and other public figures and role models such as Paul Robeson, Sidney Poitier, Jesse Owens, and Jackie Robinson. The emancipations of slaves and of women owed much to charismatic leaders. Some of these leaders were religious; some were not. Some who were religious did their good deeds because they were religious. In other cases, their religion was incidental. Although Martin Luther King was a Christian, he derived his philosophy of non-violent civil disobedience directly from Gandhi, who was not. Then too, there is improved education, and in particular, the increased understanding that each of us shares a common humanity with members of other races and with the other sex, both deeply unbiblical ideas that come from biological science, especially evolution. One reason black people and women, and in Nazi Germany, Jews and Gypsies have been treated badly, is that they were not perceived as fully human. The philosopher Peter Singer in Animal Liberation is the most eloquent advocate of the view that we should move to a post-speciesist condition, in which humane treatment is meted out to all species that have the brain power to appreciate it. Perhaps this hints at the direction in which the moral zeitgeist might move in future centuries. It would be a natural extrapolation of earlier reforms, like the abolition of slavery and the emancipation of women. It is beyond my amateur psychology and sociology to go any further in explaining why the moral zeitgeist moves in its broadly concerted way. For my purposes, it is enough that, as a matter of observed fact, it does move, and it is not driven by religion, and certainly not by scripture. It is probably not a single force like gravity. But a complex interplay of disparate forces, like the one that propels Moore's law, describing the exponential increase in computer power. Whatever its cause, the manifest phenomenon of zeitgeist progression is more than enough to undermine the claim that we need God in order to be good, or to decide what is good. What about Hitler and Stalin? Weren't they atheists? The zeitgeist may move and move in a generally progressive direction, but as I have said, it is a sawtooth, not a smooth improvement, and there have been some appalling reversals. Outstanding reversals, deep and terrible ones, are provided by the dictators of the 20th century. It is important to separate the evil intentions of men like Hitler and Stalin from the vast power that they wielded in achieving them.
I have already observed that Hitler's ideas and intentions were not self-evidently more evil than those of Caligula or some of the Ottoman sultans, whose staggering feats of nastiness are described in Noel Barber's Lords of the Golden Horn. Hitler had twentieth-century weapons and twentieth-century communications technology at his disposal. Nevertheless, Hitler and Stalin were, by any standards, spectacularly evil men. Hitler and Stalin were atheists. What have you got to say about that? The question comes up after just about every public lecture that I ever give on the subject of religion, and in most of my radio interviews as well. It is put in a truculent way, indignantly freighted with two assumptions. Not only one were Stalin and Hitler atheists, but two, they did their terrible deeds because they were atheists. Assumption one is true for Stalin and dubious for Hitler, but assumption one is irrelevant anyway because assumption two is false. It is certainly illogical if it is thought to follow from one. Even if we accept that Hitler and Stalin shared atheism in common, they both also had moustaches, as does Saddam Hussein. So what? The interesting question is not whether evil or good individual human beings were religious or were atheists. We are not in the business of counting evil heads and compiling two rival roll calls of iniquity. The fact that Nazi belt buckles were described with Gott mit uns doesn't prove anything, at least not without a lot more discussion. What matters is not whether Hitler and Stalin were atheists, but whether atheism systematically influences people to do bad things. There is not the smallest evidence that it does. There seems no doubt that, as a matter of fact, Stalin was an atheist. He received his education at an orthodox seminary, and his mother never lost her disappointment that he had not entered the priesthood as she intended, a fact that, according to Alan Bullock, caused Stalin much amusement. Perhaps because of his training for the priesthood, the mature Stalin was scathing about the Russian Orthodox Church and about Christianity and religion in general. But there is no evidence that his atheism motivated his brutality. His earlier religious training probably didn't either, unless it was through teaching him to revere absolutist faith, strong authority, and a belief that ends justify means. The legend that Hitler was an atheist has been assiduously cultivated. So much so that a great many people believe it without question, and it is regularly and defiantly trotted out by religious apologists. The truth of the matter is far from clear. Hitler was born into a Catholic family and went to Catholic schools and churches as a child. Obviously, that is not significant in itself. He could easily have given it up, as Stalin gave up his Russian Orthodoxy after leaving the Tiflis Theological Seminary. But Hitler never formally renounced his Catholicism. And there are indications throughout his life that he remained religious. If not Catholic, he seems to have retained a belief in some sort of divine providence. For example, he stated in Mein Kampf that when he heard the news of the declaration of the First World War, I sank down on my knees and thanked heaven out of the fullness of my heart for the favour of having been permitted to live in such a time. But that was 1914, when he was still only 25. Perhaps he changed after that. In 1920, when Hitler was 31, his close associate Rudolf Hess, later to be deputy Führer, wrote in a letter to the Prime Minister of Bavaria, "I know Herr Hitler very well personally, and am quite close to him. He has an unusually honourable character, full of profound kindness, is religious, a good Catholic." Of course, it could be said that since Hess got the honourable character and the Profound kindness, so crashingly wrong. Maybe he got the good Catholic wrong too. Hitler could scarcely be described as a good anything, which reminds me of the most comically audacious argument I've heard in favour of the proposition that Hitler must have been an atheist. Paraphrasing from many sources, Hitler was a bad man. Christianity teaches goodness, therefore Hitler can't have been a Christian. Goering's remark about Hitler: only a Catholic could unite Germany. Might I suppose have meant somebody brought up Catholic rather than a believing Catholic? In a speech of 1933 in Berlin, Hitler said, "We were convinced that the people need and require this faith. We have therefore undertaken the fight against the atheistic movement, and that not merely with a few theoretical declarations. We have stamped it out." That might indicate only that, like many others, Hitler believed in belief. 
but as late as 1941 he told his adjutant, General Gerhard Engel, I shall remain a Catholic forever. Even if he didn't remain a sincerely believing Christian, Hitler would have to have been positively unusual not to have been influenced by the long Christian tradition of blaming Jews as Christ-killers. In a speech in Munich in 1923, Hitler said, The first thing to do is to rescue Germany from the Jew who is ruining our country. We want to prevent our Germany from suffering as another did the death upon the cross. In his Adolf Hitler, the definitive biography, John Toland wrote of Hitler's religious position at the time of the Final Solution. Still a member in good standing of the Church of Rome, despite detestation of its hierarchy, he carried within him its teaching that the Jew was the killer of God. The extermination, therefore, could be done without a twinge of conscience, since he was merely acting as the avenging hand of God, so long as it was done impersonally, without cruelty. Christian hatred of Jews is not just a Catholic tradition. Martin Luther was a virulent anti-Semite. At the Diet of Worms, he said that all Jews should be driven from Germany. And he wrote a whole book on the Jews and their lies, which probably influenced Hitler. Luther described the Jews as a brood of vipers, and the same phrase was used by Hitler in a remarkable speech of 1922, in which he several times repeated that he was a Christian. My feeling as a Christian points me to my Lord and Saviour as a fighter. It points me to the man who once in loneliness, surrounded by a few followers, recognised these Jews for what they were and summoned men to fight against them and who, God's truth, was greatest not as a sufferer but as a fighter. In boundless love as a Christian and as a man. I read through the passage which tells us how the Lord at last rose in his might and seized the scourge to drive out of the temple the brood of vipers and adders. How terrific was his fight for the world against the Jewish poison. Today, after two thousand years, with deepest emotion, I recognize more profoundly than ever before the fact that it was for this that he had to shed his blood upon the cross. As a Christian, I have no duty to allow myself to be cheated, but I have the duty to be a fighter for truth and justice. And if there is anything which could demonstrate that we are acting rightly, it is the distress that daily grows. For as a Christian, I have also a duty to my own people. It is hard to know whether Hitler picked up the phrase brood of vipers from Luther or whether he got it directly from Matthew 3.7 as Luther presumably did. As for the theme of Jewish persecution as part of God's will, Hitler returned to it in Mein Kampf. Hence today I believe that I am acting in accordance with the will of the Almighty Creator. By defending myself against the Jew, I am fighting for the work of the Lord. That was 1925. He said it again in a speech in the Reichstag in 1938, and he said similar things throughout his career. Quotations like those have to be balanced by others from his table talk, in which Hitler expressed virulently anti-Christian views, as recorded by his secretary. The following all date from 1941. The heaviest blow that ever struck humanity was the coming of Christianity. Bolshevism is Christianity's illegitimate child. Both are inventions of the Jew. The deliberate lie in the matter of religion was introduced into the world by Christianity. The reason why the ancient world was so pure, light, and serene was that it knew nothing of the two great scourges, the pox and Christianity. When all is said, we have no reason to wish that the Italians and Spaniards should free themselves from the drug of Christianity. Let's be the only people who are immunized against the disease. Hitler's table talk contains more quotations like those, often equating Christianity with Bolshevism, sometimes drawing an analogy between Karl Marx and St. Paul, and never forgetting that both were Jews, although Hitler, oddly, was always adamant that Jesus himself was not a Jew. It is possible that Hitler had, by 1941, experienced some kind of deconversion or disillusionment with Christianity. Or is the resolution of the contradiction simply that he was an opportunistic liar, whose words cannot be trusted in either direction? It could be argued that, despite his own words and those of his associates, 
Hitler was not really religious, but just cynically exploiting the religiosity of his audience. He may have agreed with Napoleon, who said, "Religion is excellent stuff for keeping common people quiet." And with Seneca the Younger, "Religion is regarded by the common people as true, by the wise as false, and by the rulers as useful." Nobody could deny that Hitler was capable of such insincerity. If this was his real motive for pretending to be religious, it serves to remind us that Hitler didn't carry out his atrocities single-handed. The terrible deeds themselves were carried out by soldiers and their officers, most of whom were surely Christian. Indeed, the Christianity of the German people underlies the very hypothesis we are discussing—a hypothesis to explain the supposed insincerity of Hitler's religious professings. Or perhaps Hitler felt that he had to display some token sympathy for Christianity, otherwise his regime would not have received the support it did from the Church. This support showed itself in various ways, including Pope Pius XII's persistent refusal to take a stand against the Nazis, a subject of considerable embarrassment to the modern Church. Either Hitler's professions of Christianity were sincere. Or he faked his Christianity in order to win successfully cooperation from German Christians and the Catholic Church. In either case, the evils of Hitler's regime can hardly be held up as flowing from atheism. Even when he was railing against Christianity, Hitler never ceased using the language of providence, a mysterious agency which he believed had singled him out for a divine mission to lead Germany. He sometimes called it providence, at other times God. After the Anschluss, when Hitler returned in triumph to Vienna in 1938, his exultant speech mentioned God in this providential guise: "I believe it was God's will to send a boy from here into the Reich, to let him grow up, and to raise him to be the leader of the nation, so that he could lead back his homeland into the Reich." When he narrowly escaped assassination in Munich in November 1939. Hitler credited providence with intervening to save his life by causing him to alter his schedule. Now I am completely content. The fact that I left the Burger Breukeller earlier than usual is a corroboration of providence's intention to let me reach my goal. After this failed assassination, the Archbishop of Munich, Cardinal Michael Fallhaber, ordered that a Te Deum should be said in his cathedral. To thank divine providence in the name of the archdiocese for the Führer's fortunate escape. Some of Hitler's followers, with the support of Goebbels, made no bones about building Nazism into a religion in its own right. The following, by the chief of the United Trade Unions, has the feel of a prayer and even has the cadences of the Christian Lord's Prayer, Our Father, or the Creed. Adolf Hitler, we are united with you alone. We want to renew our vow in this hour. On this earth, we believe only in Adolf Hitler. We believe that National Socialism is the sole saving faith for our people. We believe that there is a Lord God in heaven who created us, who leads us, who directs us, and who blesses us visibly. And we believe that this Lord God sent Adolf Hitler to us so that Germany might become a foundation for all eternity. Stalin was an atheist, and Hitler probably wasn't. But even if he was, the bottom line of the Stalin-Hitler debating point is very simple: individual atheists may do evil things, but they don't do evil things in the name of atheism. Stalin and Hitler did extremely evil things in the name of, respectively, dogmatic and doctrinaire Marxism, and an insane and unscientific eugenics theory tinged with sub-Wagnerian ravings. Religious wars really are fought in the name of religion, and they have been horribly frequent in history. I cannot think of any war that has been fought in the name of atheism. Why should it? A war might be motivated by economic greed, by political ambition, by ethnic or racial prejudice, by deep grievance or revenge, or by patriotic belief in the destiny of a nation. Even more plausible as a motive for war is an unshakable faith that one's own religion is the only true one. Reinforced by a holy book that explicitly condemns all heretics and followers of rival religions to death, and explicitly promises that the soldiers of God will go straight to a martyr's heaven. Sam Harris, as so often, hits the bullseye in the end of faith.
The danger of religious faith is that it allows otherwise normal human beings to reap the fruits of madness and consider them holy. Because each new generation of children is taught that religious propositions need not be justified in the way that all others must, civilization is still besieged by the armies of the preposterous. We are even now killing ourselves over ancient literature. Who would have thought something so tragically absurd could be possible? By contrast, why would anyone go to war for the sake of an absence of belief? Chapter Eight: What's wrong with religion? Why be so hostile? Religion has actually convinced people that there's an invisible man living in the sky who watches everything you do every minute of every day. And the invisible man has a special list of ten things he does not want you to do. And if you do any of these ten things, he has a special place full of fire and smoke and burning and torture and anguish, where he will send you to live and suffer and burn and choke and scream and cry forever and ever till the end of time. But he loves you, George Carlin. I do not, by nature, thrive on confrontation. I don't think the adversarial format is well designed to get at the truth, and I regularly refuse invitations to take part in formal debates. I was once invited to debate with the then Archbishop of York in Edinburgh. I felt honoured by this and accepted. After the debate, the religious physicist Russell Stannard reproduced in his book *Doing Away with God* a letter that he wrote to the Observer. Sir. Under the gleeful headline "God Comes a Poor Second Before the Majesty of Science," your science correspondent reported on Easter Sunday of all days how Richard Dawkins inflicted grievous intellectual harm on the Archbishop of York in a debate on science and religion. We were told of smugly smiling atheists and lions ten, Christians nil. Stannard went on to chide the Observer for failing to report a subsequent encounter between him and me, together with the Bishop of Birmingham and the distinguished cosmologist Sir Herman Bondy, at the Royal Society, which had not been staged as an adversarial debate and which had been a lot more constructive as a result. I can only agree with his implied condemnation of the adversarial debate format. In particular, for reasons explained in A Devil's Chaplain, I never take part in debates with creationists. I do not have the hutzpah to refuse on the grounds offered by one of my most distinguished scientific colleagues whenever a creationist tries to stage a formal debate with him. That would look great on your CV, not so good on mine. Despite my dislike of gladiatorial contests, I seem somehow to have acquired a reputation for pugnacity towards religion. Colleagues who agree that there is no God, who agree that we do not need religion to be moral. And agree that we can explain the roots of religion and of morality in non-religious terms. Nevertheless, come back at me in gentle puzzlement. Why are you so hostile? What is actually wrong with religion? Does it really do so much harm that we should actively fight against it? Why not live and let live, as one does with Taurus and Scorpio, crystal energy and ley lines? Isn't it all just harmless nonsense? I might retort that such hostility as I or other atheists occasionally voice towards religion is limited to words. I am not going to bomb anybody, behead them, stone them, burn them at the stake, crucify them, or fly planes into their skyscrapers just because of a theological disagreement. But my interlocutor usually doesn't leave it at that. He may go on to say something like this: "Doesn't your hostility mark you out as a fundamentalist atheist?" Just as fundamentalist in your own way as the wing nuts of the Bible Belt in theirs. I need to dispose of this accusation of fundamentalism, for it is distressingly common. Fundamentalism and the subversion of science. Fundamentalists know they are right because they have read the truth in a holy book, and they know in advance that nothing will budge them from their belief. The truth of the holy book is an axiom. Not the end product of a process of reasoning. The book is true, and if the evidence seems to contradict it, it is the evidence that must be thrown out, not the book. 
By contrast, what I as a scientist believe, for example evolution, I believe not because of reading a holy book, but because I have studied the evidence. It really is a very different matter. Books about evolution are believed not because they are holy, they are believed because they present overwhelming quantities of mutually buttressed evidence. In principle, any reader can go and check that evidence. When a science book is wrong, somebody eventually discovers the mistake and it is corrected in subsequent books. That conspicuously doesn't happen with holy books. Philosophers, especially amateurs with a little philosophical learning, and even more especially those infected with cultural relativism, may raise a tiresome red herring at this point. A scientist's belief in evidence is itself a matter of fundamentalist faith. I've dealt with this elsewhere and will only briefly repeat myself here. All of us believe in evidence in our own lives, whatever we may profess with our amateur philosophical hats on. If I am accused of murder, and prosecuting counsel sternly asks me whether it is true that I was in Chicago on the night of the crime, I cannot get away with a philosophical evasion, it depends what you mean by true, nor with an anthropological relativist plea, it is only in your western scientific sense of in that I was in Chicago. The Bongolese have a completely different concept of in, according to which you are only truly in a place if you are an anointed elder entitled to take snuff from the dried scrotum of a goat. Maybe scientists are fundamentalist when it comes to defining in some abstract way what is meant by truth, but so is everybody else. I am no more fundamentalist when I say evolution is true than when I say it is true that New Zealand is in the southern hemisphere. We believe in evolution because the evidence supports it, and we would abandon it overnight if new evidence arose to disprove it. No real fundamentalist would ever say anything like that. It is all too easy to confuse fundamentalism with passion. I may well appear passionate when I defend evolution against a fundamentalist creationist, but this is not because of a rival fundamentalism of my own. It is because the evidence for evolution is overwhelmingly strong, and I am passionately distressed that my opponent can't see it, or more usually refuses to look at it because it contradicts his holy book. My passion is increased when I think about how much the poor fundamentalists and those whom they influence are missing. The truths of evolution, along with many other scientific truths, are so engrossingly fascinating and beautiful. How truly tragic to die having missed out on all that. Of course that makes me passionate, how could it not? But my belief in evolution is not fundamentalism, and it is not faith, because I know what it would take to change my mind, and I would gladly do so if the necessary evidence were forthcoming. It does happen. I have previously told the story of a respected elder statesman of the zoology department at Oxford when I was an undergraduate. For years he had passionately believed and taught that the Golgi apparatus, a microscopic feature of the interior of cells, was not real, an artifact, an illusion. Every Monday afternoon it was the custom for the whole department to listen to a research talk by a visiting lecturer. One Monday the visitor was an American cell biologist who presented completely convincing evidence that the Golgi apparatus was real. At the end of the lecture, the old man strode to the front of the hall, shook the American by the hand and said, with passion, My dear fellow, I wish to thank you. I have been wrong these fifteen years. We clapped our hands red. No fundamentalist would ever say that. In practice, not all scientists would but all scientists pay lip service to it as an ideal, unlike, say, politicians, who would probably condemn it as flip-flopping. The memory of the incident I've described still brings a lump to my throat. As a scientist, I am hostile to fundamentalist religion because it actively debauches the scientific enterprise. It teaches us not to change our minds and not to want to know exciting things that are available to be known. It subverts science and saps the intellect. The saddest example I know is that of the American geologist Kurt Wise, who now directs the Center for Origins Research at Bryan College, Dayton, Tennessee. It is no accident that Bryan College is named after William Jennings Bryan, prosecutor of the science teacher John Scopes in the Dayton Monkey Trial of 1925. Wise 
could have fulfilled his boyhood ambition to become a professor of geology at a real university, a university whose motto might have been, Think Critically, rather than the oxymoronic one displayed on the Bryan website, Think Critically and Biblically. Indeed, he obtained a real degree in geology at the University of Chicago, followed by two higher degrees in geology and paleontology at Harvard, no less, where he studied under Stephen Jay Gould, no less. He was a highly qualified and genuinely promising young scientist, well on his way to achieving his dream of teaching science and doing research at a proper university. Then tragedy struck. It came not from outside but from within his own mind, a mind fatally subverted and weakened by fundamentalist religious upbringing that required him to believe that the earth, the subject of his Chicago and Harvard geological education, was less than 10,000 years old. He was too intelligent not to recognize the head-on collision between his religion and his science, and this conflict, in his mind, made him increasingly uneasy. One day he could bear the strain no more, and he clinched the matter with a pair of scissors. He took a Bible and went right through it, literally cutting out every verse that would have to go if the scientific worldview were true. At the end of this ruthlessly honest and labor-intensive exercise, there was so little left of his Bible that, Try as I might, and even with the benefit of intact margins throughout the pages of Scripture, I found it impossible to pick up the Bible without it being rent in two. I had to make a decision between evolution and Scripture. Either the Scripture was true and evolution was wrong, or evolution was true and I must toss out the Bible. It was there that night that I accepted the Word of God and rejected all that would ever counter it, including evolution. With that, in great sorrow, I tossed into the fire all my dreams and hopes in science. I find that terribly sad, but whereas the Golgi apparatus story moved me to tears of admiration and exultation, the Kurt Wise story is just plain pathetic, pathetic and contemptible. The wound to his career and his life's happiness was self-inflicted, so unnecessary, so easy to escape. All he had to do was toss out the Bible, or interpret it symbolically or allegorically, as the theologians do. Instead, he did the fundamentalist thing and tossed out science, evidence and reason, along with all his dreams and hopes. Perhaps uniquely among fundamentalists, Kurt Wise is honest devastatingly, painfully, shockingly honest. Give him the Templeton Prize, he might be the first really sincere recipient. Wise brings to the surface what is secretly going on underneath, in the minds of fundamentalists generally, when they encounter scientific evidence that contradicts their beliefs. Listen to his peroration. Although there are scientific reasons for accepting a young earth, I am a young age creationist because that is my understanding of the scripture. As I shared with my professors years ago when I was in college, if all the evidence in the universe turns against creationism, I would be the first to admit it, but I would still be a creationist because that is what the word of God seems to indicate. Here I must stand. He seems to be quoting Luther as he nailed his theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg. But poor Kurt Wise reminds me more of Winston Smith in 1984, struggling desperately to believe that 2 plus 2 equals 5, if Big Brother says it does. Winston, however, was being tortured. Wise's double think comes not from the imperative of physical torture, but from the imperative, apparently just as undeniable to some people, of religious faith, arguably a form of mental torture. I am hostile to religion because of what it did to Kurt Wise, and if it did that to a Harvard-educated geologist, just think what it can do to others less gifted and less well-armed. Fundamentalist religion is hell-bent on ruining the scientific education of countless thousands of innocent, well-meaning, eager young minds. Non-fundamentalist, sensible religion may not be doing that, but it is making the world safe for fundamentalism, by teaching children from their earliest years that unquestioning faith is a virtue. The Dark Side of Absolutism In the previous chapter, 
when trying to explain the shifting moral zeitgeist, I invoked a widespread consensus of liberal, enlightened, decent people. I made the rosy spectacled assumption that we all broadly agree with this consensus, some more than others, and I had in mind most of the people likely to read this book, whether they are religious or not. But of course not everybody is of the consensus, and not everybody will have any desire to read my book. It has to be admitted that absolutism is far from dead. Indeed, it rules the minds of a great number of people in the world today, most dangerously so in the Muslim world and in the incipient American theocracy. See Kevin Phillips' book of that name. Such absolutism nearly always results from strong religious faith, and it constitutes a major reason for suggesting that religion can be a force for evil in the world. One of the fiercest penalties in the Old Testament is the one exacted for blasphemy. It is still in force in certain countries. Section 295C of the Pakistan Penal Code prescribes the death penalty for this crime. On the 18th of August 2001, Dr. Yunis Sheikh, a medical doctor and lecturer, was sentenced to death for blasphemy. His particular crime was to tell students that the Prophet Muhammad was not a Muslim before he invented the religion at the age of 40. Eleven of his students reported him to the authorities for this offence. The blasphemy law in Pakistan is more usually invoked against Christians, such as Augustine Ashik Kingri Masi, who was sentenced to death in Faisalabad in 2000. Masi, as a Christian, was not allowed to marry his sweetheart because she was a Muslim. And, incredibly, Pakistani and Islamic law does not allow a Muslim woman to marry a non-Muslim man. So he tried to convert to Islam and was then accused of doing so for base motives. It's not clear from the reports whether this in itself was the capital crime or whether it was something he is alleged to have said about the Prophet's own morals. Either way, it certainly was not the kind of offence that would warrant a death sentence in any country whose laws are free of religious bigotry. In 2006, in Afghanistan, Abdul Rahman was sentenced to death for converting to Christianity. Did he kill anyone, hurt anybody, steal anything, damage anything? No, all he did was change his mind. Internally and privately, he changed his mind. He entertained certain thoughts which were not to the liking of the ruling party of his country. And this, remember, is not the Afghanistan of the Taliban, but the liberated Afghanistan of Hamid Karzai, set up by the American-led coalition. Mr. Rahman finally escaped execution, but only on a plea of insanity, and only after intense international pressure. He has now sought asylum in Italy to avoid being murdered by zealots eager to do their Islamic duty. It is still an article of the Constitution of Liberated Afghanistan that the penalty for apostasy is death. Apostasy, remember, doesn't mean actual harm to persons or property. It is pure thought crime, to use George Orwell's 1984 terminology, and the official punishment for it under Islamic law is death. On the 3rd of September 1992, to take one example where it was actually carried out, Sadiq Abdul Karim Malala was publicly beheaded in Saudi Arabia after being lawfully convicted of apostasy and blasphemy. I once had a televised encounter with Sir Iqbal Sakrani, mentioned in Chapter 1 as Britain's leading moderate Muslim. I challenged him on the death penalty as punishment for apostasy. He wriggled and squirmed, but was unable either to deny or decry it. He kept trying to change the subject, saying it was an unimportant detail. This is a man who has been knighted by the British government for promoting good interfaith relations. But let's have no complacency in Christendom. As recently as 1922 in Britain, John William Gott was sentenced to nine months hard labour for blasphemy. He compared Jesus to a clown. Almost unbelievably, the crime of blasphemy is still on the statute book in Britain, and in 2005, a Christian group tried to bring a private prosecution for blasphemy against the BBC for broadcasting Jerry Springer the opera. 
In the United States of recent years, the phrase American Taliban was begging to be coined, and a swift Google search nets more than a dozen websites that have done so. The quotations that they anthologize from American religious leaders and faith-based politicians chillingly recall the narrow bigotry, heartless cruelty, and sheer nastiness of the Afghan Taliban, the Ayatollah Khomeini, and the Wahhabi authorities of Saudi Arabia. The web page called the American Taliban is a particularly rich source of obnoxiously balmy quotations, beginning with a prize one from somebody called Anne Coulter, who. American colleagues have persuaded me is not a spoof invented by the Onion. We should invade their countries, kill their leaders, and convert them to Christianity. Other gems include Congressman Bob Dornan's. Don't use the word gay unless it's an acronym for Got AIDS yet? General William G. Boykins. George Bush was not elected by a majority of the voters in the United States. He was appointed by God. And an older one. The famous environmental policy of Ronald Reagan, Secretary of the Interior. We don't have to protect the environment. The second coming is at hand. The Afghan Taliban and the American Taliban are good examples of what happens when people take their scriptures literally and seriously. They provide a horrifying modern enactment of what life might have been like under the theocracy of the Old Testament. Kimberly Blaker's. The Fundamentals of Extremism: The Christian Right in America is a book-length expose of the menace of the Christian Taliban, not under that name. Faith and homosexuality. In Afghanistan, under the Taliban, the official punishment for homosexuality was execution by the tasteful method of burial alive under a wall pushed over on top of the victim. The crime itself, being a private act performed by consenting adults who are doing nobody else any harm, we again have here the classic hallmark of religious absolutism. My own country has no right to be smug. Private homosexuality was a criminal offence in Britain up until, astonishingly, 1967. In 1954, the British mathematician Alan Turing, a candidate along with John von Neumann for the title of Father of the Computer, Committed suicide after being convicted of the criminal offence of homosexual behaviour in private. Admittedly, Turing was not buried alive under a wall pushed over by a tank. He was offered a choice between two years in prison, you can imagine how the other prisoners would have treated him, and a course of hormone injections which could be said to amount to chemical castration, and would have caused him to grow breasts. His final private choice was an apple. That he had injected with cyanide. As the pivotal intellect in the breaking of the German Enigma codes, Turing arguably made a greater contribution to defeating the Nazis than Eisenhower or Churchill. Thanks to Turing and his ultra colleagues at Bletchley Park, Allied generals in the field were consistently, over long periods of the war, privy to detailed German plans before the German generals had time to implement them. When Turing's role was no longer top secret, he should have been knighted and fated as a savior of his nation. Instead, this gentle, stammering, eccentric genius was destroyed for a crime committed in private, which harmed nobody. Once again, the unmistakable trademark of the faith-based moralizer is to care passionately about what other people do or even think in private. The attitude of the American Taliban towards homosexuality epitomizes their religious absolutism. Listen to the Reverend Jerry Falwell, founder of Liberty University. AIDS is not just God's punishment for homosexuals; it is God's punishment for the society that tolerates homosexuals. The first thing I notice about such people is their wonderful Christian charity. What kind of an electorate could, term after term, vote in a man of such ill-informed bigotry as Senator Jesse Helms, Republican of North Carolina, a man who has sneered? The New York Times and Washington Post are both infested with homosexuals themselves. Just about every person down there is a homosexual or lesbian. The answer, I suppose, is the kind of electorate that sees morality in narrowly religious terms and feels threatened by anybody. Who doesn't share the same absolutist faith?
I have already quoted Pat Robertson, founder of the Christian Coalition. He stood as a serious candidate for the Republican Party nomination for president in 1988, and garnered more than three million volunteers to work in his campaign, plus a comparable quantity of money, a disquieting level of support given that the following quotations are entirely typical of him. Homosexuals want to come into churches and disrupt church services and throw blood all around and try to give people AIDS and spit in the face of ministers. Planned Parenthood is teaching kids to fornicate, teaching people to have adultery, every kind of bestiality, homosexuality, lesbianism, everything that the Bible condemns. Robertson's attitude to women, too, would warm the black hearts of the Afghan Taliban. I know this is painful for the ladies to hear, but if you get married, you have accepted the headship of a man, your husband. Christ is the head of the household, and the husband is the head of the wife, and that's the way it is, period. Gary Potter, president of Catholics for Christian Political Action, had this to say. When the Christian majority takes over this country, there will be no satanic churches, no more free distribution of pornography, no more talk of rights for homosexuals. After the Christian majority takes control, pluralism will be seen as immoral and evil, and the state will not permit anybody the right to practice evil. Evil, as is very clear from the quotation, doesn't mean doing things that have bad consequences for people. It means private thoughts and actions that are not to the Christian majority's private liking. Pastor Fred Phelps of the Westboro Baptist Church is another strong preacher with an obsessive dislike of homosexuals. When Martin Luther King's widow died, Pastor Fred organized a picket of her funeral, proclaiming, God hates fags and fag enablers, ergo God hates Coretta Scott King, and is now tormenting her with fire and brimstone, where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched, and the smoke of her torment ascendeth up for ever and ever. It is easy to write Fred Feltz off as a nut, but he has plenty of support from people and their money. According to his own website, Phelps has organized 22,000 anti-homosexual demonstrations since 1991. That's an average of one every four days in the USA, Canada, Jordan, and Iraq, displaying slogans such as, Thank God for AIDS. A particularly charming feature of his website is the automated tally of the number of days a particular named deceased homosexual has been burning in hell. Attitudes to homosexuality reveal much about the sort of morality that is inspired by religious faith. An equally instructive example is abortion and the sanctity of human life. Faith and the Sanctity of Human Life Human embryos are examples of human life. Therefore, by absolutist religious lights, abortion is simply wrong, full-fledged murder. I'm not sure what to make of my admittedly anecdotal observation that many of those who most ardently oppose the taking of embryonic life also seem to be more than usually enthusiastic about taking adult life. To be fair, this does not, as a rule, apply to Roman Catholics, who are among the most vociferous opponents of abortion. The born-again George W. Bush, however, is typical of today's religious ascendancy. He and they are stalwart defenders of human life, as long as it is embryonic life, or terminally ill life, even to the point of preventing medical research that would certainly save many lives. The obvious ground for opposing the death penalty is respect for human life. Since 1976, when the Supreme Court reversed the ban on the death penalty, Texas has been responsible for more than one-third of all executions in all 50 states of the Union. And Bush presided over more executions in Texas than any other governor in the state's history, averaging one death every nine days. Perhaps he was simply doing his duty and carrying out the laws of the state. But then what are we to make of the famous report by the CNN journalist Tucker Carlson? Carlson, who himself supports the death penalty, was shocked by Bush's humorous imitation of a female prisoner on death row, pleading to the governor for a stay of execution. Please, Bush whimpers, his lips pursed in mock desperation, don't kill me. Perhaps this woman would have met with more sympathy 
if she had pointed out that she had once been an embryo. The contemplation of embryos really does seem to have the most extraordinary